Chapter 27 of The Deluge, Volume 2. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Jeff Evans, Minneapolis, Minnesota. The Deluge, Volume 2 by Henrik Sienkiewicz. Translated by Jeremiah Curtin, 1835 to 1906. Chapter 27. At a time when all living men in the commonwealth were mounting their horses, Carl Gustav stayed continually in Prussia, busied in capturing the towns of that province and in negotiating with the elector. After an easy and unexpected conquest, the quick soldier soon saw that the Swedish lion had swallowed more than his stomach could carry. After the return of Jan Kazimir, he lost hope of retaining the commonwealth. But while making a mental abdication of the whole, he wished at least to retain the greater part of his conquest, and above all, royal Prussia, a province fruitful, dotted with large towns, wealthy, and adjoining his own Pomerania. But as that province was first to defend itself, so did it continue faithfully to its lord and the commonwealth. The return of Jan Kazimir and the war begun by the confederation of Tishovtsi might revive the courage of Prussia, confirm it in loyalty, give it will for endurance. Therefore Karl Gustav determined to crush the uprising and to wipe out Kazimir's forces so as to take from Prussians the hope of resistance. He had to do this for the sake of the elector, who was ever ready to side with the stronger. The king of Sweden knew him thoroughly, and doubted not for a moment that if the fortune of Jan Kazimir should preponderate, the elector would be on his side again. When, therefore, the siege of Marienburg advanced slowly, for the more it was attacked, the more stubbornly did Pan Vieher defend it. Karl Gustav marched to the Commonwealth, so as to reach Jan Kazimir again, even in the remotest corner of the land. And since with him deed followed decision, as swiftly as thunder follows lightning, he raised his army disposed in towns, and before any one in the commonwealth had looked around, before the news of his march had spread, he had passed Warsaw, and had rushed into the greatest blaze of conflagration. Driven by anger, revenge, and bitterness, he moved on like a storm. Behind him ten thousand horses trampled the fields, which were still covered with snow, and taking the infantry from the garrisons, he went on, like a whirlwind, toward the far south of the commonwealth. On the road he burned and pursued. He was not now that recent Karl Gustav, the kindly, affable, and joyous lord, clapping his hands at Polish cavalry and winking at feasts and praising the soldiers. Now, wherever he showed himself, the blood of peasants and nobles flowed in a torrent. On the road he annihilated parties, hanged prisoners, spared no man. But as when, in the thick of the pine woods, a mighty bear rushes forward with heavy body crushing branches and brush on the way, while wolves follow after, and not daring to block his path, pursue, press nearer and nearer behind, so did those parties, pursuing the armies of Karl, join in throngs denser and denser, and follow the Swedes, as a shadow a man, and still more enduringly than a shadow, for they followed in the day and the night, in fair and foul weather. Before him two bridges were ruined, provisions destroyed, so that he had to march as in a desert, without a place for his head or anything with which to give strength to his body when hungry. Karl Gustav noted quickly how terrible his task was. The war spread around him as widely as the sea spreads around a ship lost in the waters. Prussia was on fire. On fire was Great Poland, which had first accepted his serenity and first wished to throw off the Swedish yoke. Little Poland was on fire, and so were Russia, Lithuania, and Umud. In the castles and large towns the Swedes maintained themselves yet as if on islands, but the villages, the forests, the fields, the rivers were already in Polish hands. Not merely a single man or small detachments, but a whole regiment might not leave the main Swedish army for two hours, for if it did, the regiment vanished without tidings, and prisoners who fell into the hands of peasants died in terrible tortures. In vain had Karl Gustav given orders to proclaim in villages and towns that whoso of peasants should bring an armed noble, living or dead, would receive freedom forever and lands as a reward. For peasants, as well as nobles and townsmen, marched off to the woods. 
Men from the mountains, men from deep forests, men from meadows and fields, hid in the woods, formed ambushes on the roads against the Swedes, fell upon the smaller garrisons, and cut scouting parties to pieces. Flails, forks, and scythes, no less than the sabers of nobles, were streaming with Swedish blood. All the more did wrath rise in the heart of Karl that a few months before he had gathered in that country so easily, hence he could hardly understand what had happened, whence these forces, whence that resistance, whence that awful war for life or death, the end of which he saw not and could not divine. Frequent councils were held in the Swedish camp. With the king marched his brother Adolf, prince of Bipont, who had command over the army. Robert Douglas, Henry Horn, relative of that Horn who had been slain by the scythe of a peasant at Chenstehova, Valdemar, Prince of Denmark, and that Miller who had left his military glory at the foot of Jasnagura, Aschenberg, the ablest cavalry leader among the Swedes, Hammerskoy, who commanded the artillery, and the old robber marshal Arwid Wittenberg, famed for rapacity, living on the last of his health, for he was eaten by the Gallic disease, Forgill, and many others, all leaders skilled in the capture of cities, and in the field yielding ingenious to the king only. These men were terrified in their hearts, lest the whole army with the king should perish through toil, lack of food, and the fury of the Poles. Old Wittenberg advised the king directly against the campaign. How will you go, O king, said he, to the Russian regions after an enemy who destroys everything on the way, but is unseen himself? What will you do if horses lack not only hay, but even straw from the roofs of cottages, and men fall from exhaustion? Where are the armies to come to our aid? Where are the castles in which to draw breath and rest our weary limbs? My fame is not equal to yours, but were I Karl Gustav, I would not expose that glory acquired by so many victories to the fickle fortune of war. To which Karl Gustav answered, And neither would I, were I Wittenberg. Then he mentioned Alexander of Macedon, with whom he liked to be compared, and marched forward, pursuing Charnyetsky, not having forces so great nor so well trained, retreated before him, but retreated like a wolf ever ready to turn on his enemy. Sometimes he went in advance of the Swedes, sometimes at their flanks. Sometimes in deep forest he let them go in advance. While they thought themselves to be pursuers, he, in fact, was the hunter. He cut off the unwary. Here and there he hunted down a whole party, destroyed foot regiments marching slowly, attacked provision trains. The Swedes never knew where he was. More than once in the darkness of night they began to fire from muskets and cannons into thickets, thinking that they had an enemy before them. They were mortally wearied. They marched in cold, in hunger, in affliction, and that vir molestissimus, most harmful man, hung about them continually as a hail cloud hangs over a grain field. At last they attacked him at Golam, not far from the junctions of the Vyper and the Vistula. Some Polish squadrons being ready for the battle charged the enemy, spreading disorder and dismay. In front sprang Volodyovsky with his Lauda squadron and bore down Valdemar, Prince of Denmark. But the two Kavetskys, Samuel and Jan, urged from the hill this armored squadron against English mercenaries under Wilkinson and devoured them in a moment as a pike gulps of whiting. And Pan Malavsky engaged so closely with the Prince of Bypoint that men and horses were confounded like dust which two whirlwinds sweeping from opposite quarters bring together and turn into one circling column. In the twinkle of an eye the Swedes were pushed to the Vistula, seeing which Douglas hastened to the rescue with chosen horsemen. But even these reinforcements could not check the onset. The Swedes began to spring from the high bank to the ice, falling dead so thickly that they lay black on the snowfield, like letters on white paper. Valdemar, Prince of Denmark, fell, Wilkinson fell, and the Prince of Bypont, thrown from his horse, broke his leg. But of Poles, both Kavetskys fell, killed also were Malavsky, Rudyavsky, Rogovsky, Timinsky, Hoinsky and Porvanitsky, Volodovsky, alone, though he dived among the Swedish ranks like a seamew in water, came out with having suffered the slightest wound. Now Karl Gustav himself came up with his main force and with artillery. Straightway the form of the battle changed. Charnyetsky's other regiments, undisciplined and untrained, could not take positions in season. Some had not their horses in readiness. Others had been in distant villages and in spite of orders to be always ready, were taking their leisure in cottages. When the enemy pressed suddenly on these men, they
they scattered quickly and began to retreat to the Vyper. Therefore, Charnyetsky gave orders to sound the retreat so as to spare those regiments that had opened the battle. Some of the fleeing went beyond the Vistula, others to Koinskovoli, leaving the field and the glory of the victory to Karl. For especially those who had crossed the Vyper were long pursued by the squadrons of Zbroje and Kalinsky, who remained yet with the Swedes. There was delight beyond measure in the Swedish camp. No great trophies fell to the king, it is true, sacks of oats and a few empty wagons, but it was not at that time a question of plunder for Karl. He comforted himself with this, that victory followed his steps as before, that barely had he shown himself when he inflicted defeat on the very Charnyetsky on whom the highest hopes of Jan Kazimir and the Commonwealth were founded. He could trust that the news would run through the whole country, that every mouth would repeat, Charmyetsky is crushed, that the timid would exaggerate the proportions of the defeat and thus weaken hearts and take courage from those who had grasped their weapons at the call of the Confederation of Tushovtsi. So when they brought in and placed at his feet those bags of oats, and with them the bodies of Wilkinson and Prince Valdemar, he turned to his fretful generals and said, Unwrinkle your foreheads, gentlemen, for this is the greatest victory which I have had for a year, and may end the whole war. Your Royal Grace, answered Wittenberg, who, weaker than usual, saw things in a gloomier light, let us thank God even for this, that we shall have a farther march in peace, though Charnyetsky's troops scatter quickly and rally easily. Marshal, answered the king, I do not think you a worse leader than Charnyetsky. But if I had beaten you in this fashion, I think you would not be able to assemble your troops in two months. Wittenberg only bowed in silence, and Karl spoke on. Yes, we shall have a quiet march, for Charnyetsky alone would really hamper it. If Charnyetsky's troops are not before us, there is no hindrance. The generals rejoiced at these words. Intoxicated with victory, the troops marched past the king with shouts and with songs. Charnyetsky ceased to threaten them, like a cloud. Charnyetsky's troops were scattered. He had ceased to exist. In view of this thought, their past sufferings were forgotten and their future toils were sweet. The king's words, heard by many officers, were borne through the camp and all believed that the victory had uncommon significance, that the dragon of war was slain once more and that only days of revenge and dominion would come. The king gave the army some hours of repose Meanwhile, from Kozienitsky came trains with provisions. The troops were disposed in Golam, in Krovieniki, and in Yerzhinye. The cavalry burned some deserted houses, hanged a few peasants seized with arms in their hands, and a few camp servants mistaken for peasants. Then there was a feast in the Swedish camp, after which the soldiers slept a sound sleep, since for a long time it was their first quiet one. Next day they woke in briskness, and the first words which came to the mouths of all were, There is no Charnyetsky. One repeated this to another as if to give mutual assurance of the good news. The march began joyously. The day was dry, cold, clear. The hair of the horses and their nostrils were covered with frost. The cold wind froze soft places on the Ubelts high road and made marching easy. The troops stretched out in a line almost five miles long, which they had never done previously. Two dragoon regiments, under the command of Dubois, a Frenchman, went through Markushev and Grabov, five miles from the main force. They had marched thus three days before they would have gone to sure death, but now fear and glory of victory went before them. Charnyetsky is gone, repeated the officers and soldiers to one another. In fact, the march was made in quiet. From the forest depths came no shouts. From thickets fell no darts hurled by invisible hands. Toward evening, Karl Gustav arrived at Grabov, joyous and in good humor. He was just preparing for sleep when Aschenberg announced through the officer of the day that he wished greatly to see the king. After a while, he entered the royal quarters, not alone, but with a captain of dragoons. The king, who had a quick eye and a memory so enormous that he remembered nearly every soldier's name, recognized the captain at once. "'What is the news, Fried?' asked he. "'Has Dubois returned?' "'Dubois is killed.' The king was confused. Only now did he notice that the captain looked as if he had been taken from the grave and his clothes were torn. But the dragoons, inquired he, those two regiments? All cut to pieces. I alone was let off alive. The dark face of the king became still darker. With his hands he placed his locks behind his ears. Who did this? 
Charnyetsky. Karl Gustav was silent and looked with amazement at Aschenberg, but he only nodded as if wishing to repeat, Charnyetsky, Charnyetsky, Charnyetsky. All this is incredible, said the king, after a while. Have you seen him with your own eyes? As I see your royal grace, he commanded me to bow to you and to declare that now he will recross the Vistula, but will soon be on our track again. I know not whether he told the truth. Well, said the king, had he many men with him? I could not estimate exactly, but I saw about four thousand, and beyond the forest, cavalry of some kind. We were surrounded near Kreishin, to which Colonel Dubois went purposely from the high road, for he was told that there were some men there. Now I think that Charnyetsky sent an informant to lead us into ambush, since no one save me came out alive. The peasants killed the wounded. I escaped by a miracle. That man must have made a compact with hell, said the king, putting his hand to his forehead. For to rally troops after such a defeat and be on our neck again is not human power. It has happened as Marshal Wittenberg foresaw, put in Aschenberg. You all know how to foresee, burst out the king, but how to advise you do not know. Aschenberg grew pale and was silent. Karl Gustav, when joyous, seemed goodness itself, but when once he frowned, he roused indescribable fear in those nearest him, and birds do not hide so before an eagle as the oldest and most meritorious generals hid before him. But this time he moderated quickly and asked Captain Freed again, Has Charnyetsky good troops? I saw some unrivaled squadrons, such cavalry as the Poles have. They are the same that attacked with such fury in Golam. They must be old regiments. But Charnyetsky himself, was he cheerful, confident? He was as confident as if he had beaten us at Golam. Now his heart must rise the more, for they have forgotten Golembo and boast of Kraishin. Your royal grace, what Charnyetsky told me to repeat, I have repeated. But when I was on the point of departing, someone of the high officers approached me, an old man, and told me that he was the person who had stretched out Gustavus Adolphus in a hand-to-hand conflict, and he poured much abuse on your royal grace. Others supported him, so do they boast. I left amid insults and abuse. Never mind, said Karl Gustav. Charnyetsky is not broken, and has rallied his army. That is the main point. All the more speedily must we march so as to reach the Polish Darius at the earliest. You are free to go, gentlemen. Announce to the army that those regiments perished at the hands of peasants in unfrozen morasses. We advance. The officers went out. Karl Gustav remained alone. For something like an hour he was in gloomy thought. Was the victory at Golam to bring no fruit, no change to the position, but to rouse still greater rage in the entire country? Karl, in presence of the army and of his generals, always showed confidence and faith in himself. But when he was alone, he began to think of that war, how easy it had been at first, and then increased always in difficulty. More than once doubt embraced him. All the events seemed to him in some fashion marvelous. Often he could see no outcome, could not divine the end. At times it seemed to him that he was like a man who, going from the shore of the sea into the water, feels at every step that he is going deeper and deeper and soon will lose the ground under his feet. But he believed in his star, and now he went to the window to look at the chosen star, that one which in the wane or great bear occupies the highest place and shines brightest. The sky was clear, and therefore at that moment the star shone brightly, twinkled blue and red, but from afar, lower down on the dark blue of the sky, a lone cloud was blackening, serpent shape, from which extended as it were arms, as it were branches, as it were the feelers of a monster of the sea, and it seemed to approach the king's star continually. End of chapter 27「Chapter twenty eight of the Deluge, Volume two. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Deluge, Volume two, by Henrik Schenkevich, translated by Jeremiah Curtin, 1835 to 1906. Chapter 28. Next morning, the king marched farther and reached Lublin. There he received information that Sapieha had repulsed Boguslav's invasion and was advancing with a considerable army. 
he left Lublin the same day, merely strengthening the garrison of that place. The next object of his expedition was Zamosch, for if he could occupy that strong fortress, he would acquire a fixed base for further war, and such a notable preponderance that he might look for a successful end with all hope. There were various opinions touching Zamosch. Those Poles still remaining with Karl contended that it was the strongest fortress in the Commonwealth, and brought as proof that it had withstood all the forces of Chmielnitsky. But since Karl saw that the Poles were in no wise skilled in fortification, and considered places strong, which in other lands would scarcely be held in the third rank, since he knew also that in Poland no fortress was properly mounted, that is, there were neither walls kept as they should be, not earthworks, nor suitable arms, he felt well touching Zamosch. He counted also on the spell of his name, on the fame of an invincible leader, and finally on treaties. With treaties, which every magnate in the Commonwealth was authorised to make, or at least permitted himself to make, Karl had so far effected more than with arms. As an adroit man, and one wishing to know with whom he had to deal, he collected carefully all information touching the owner of Zamosch. He inquired about his ways, his inclinations, his wit and fancy. Jan Sapieha, who at that time by his treason still spotted the name, to the great affliction of Sapieha the hetman, gave the fullest explanations to the king concerning Zamoyski. They spent whole hours in council, but Jan Sapieha did not consider that it would be easy for the king to captivate the master of Zamosch. He cannot be tempted with money, said Jan, for he is terribly rich. He cares not for dignities and never wished them, even when they sought him themselves. As to titles, I have heard him at the court reprimand de Neuers, the Queen's secretary, because in addressing him he said, Mon prince. I am not a prince, answered he, but I have had archdukes as prisoners in my Zamosch. The truth is, however, that not he had them, but his grandfather, who among our people is surnamed the Great. If he will open the gates of Zamosch, I will offer him something which no Polish king could offer. It did not become Jan Sapieha to ask what that might be. He merely looked with curiosity at Karl Gustav. But the king understood the look and answered, gathering, as was his wont, his hair behind his ears. I will offer him the province of Lubelsk as an independent principality. A crown will tempt him. No one of you could resist such a temptation, not even the present voevoda of Vilno. Endless is the bounty of your royal grace, replied Sapieha, not without a certain irony in his voice. But Karl answered with a cynicism peculiar to himself, I give it, for it is not mine. Sapieha shook his head. He is an unmarried man and has no sons. A crown is dear to him who can leave it to his posterity. What means do you advise me to take? I think that flattery would effect most. The man is not too quick-witted, and may be easily overreached. 
it is necessary to represent that on him alone depends the pacification of the commonwealth. It is necessary to tell him that he alone may save it from war, from all defeats and future misfortunes, and that especially by opening the gates. If the fish will swallow that little hook, we shall be in Zamosh, otherwise not. Cannon remain as the ultimate argument. Hmm, to that argument there is something in Zamosh with which to give answer. There is no lack of heavy guns there. We have none, and when thaws come, it will be impossible to bring them. I have heard that the infantry in the fortress is good, but there is a lack of cavalry. Cavalry are needed only in the open field, and besides, since Charnyetsky's army, as is shown, is not crushed, he can throw in one or two squadrons for the use of the fortress. You see nothing save difficulties. But I trust ever in the lucky star of your royal grace. Jan Sapieha was right in foreseeing that Charnyetsky would furnish Zamosh with cavalry needful for scouting and seizing informants. In fact, Zamoyski had enough of his own and needed no assistance whatever. But Charnyetsky sent the two squadrons which had suffered most at Gowomb, that is, the Schemberg and Lauda, to the fortress to rest, recruit themselves, and change their horses, which were fearfully cut up. Subiepan received them hospitably, and when he learned what famous soldiers were in them, he exalted these men to the skies, covered them with gifts, and seated them every day at his table. But who shall describe the joy and emotion of Princess Griselda at sight of Pan Yan and Pan Michal, the most valiant colonels of her great husband? Both fell at her feet, shedding warm tears at sight of the beloved lady and she could not restrain her weeping. How many reminiscences of those old Lubni days were connected with them, when her husband, the glory and love of the people, full of the strength of life, ruled with power a wild region, rousing terror amid barbarism with one frown of his brow like Jove. Such were those times not long past, but where are they now? Today the Lord is in his grave, barbarians have taken the land, and she, the widow, sits on the ashes of happiness, of greatness, living only with her sorrow and with prayer. Still in those reminiscences, sweetness was so mingled with bitterness that the thoughts of those three flew gladly to times that were gone. They spoke then of their past lives, of those places which their eyes were never to see, of the past wars, finally of the present times of defeat and God's anger. If our prince were alive, said Pan Yan, there would be another career for the Commonwealth, the Cossacks would be rubbed out, the Transdnieper would be with the Commonwealth, and the Swede would find his conqueror. God has ordained as he willed of purpose to punish us for sins. Would that God might raise up a defender in Pan Charnyetsky, said Princess Griselda. He will, cried Pan Mihao. As our prince was a head above other lords, so Charnyetsky is not at all like other leaders. I know the two hetmans of the kingdom, and Sapieha of Lithuania. They are great soldiers, but there is something uncommon in Charnyetsky. You would say, he is an eagle, not a man. Though kindly, still all fear him. 
Even Pan Zagwoba in his presence forgets his jokes frequently, and how he leads his troops and moves them passes imagination. It cannot be otherwise than that a great warrior will rise in the Commonwealth. My husband, who knew Charnyetsky as a colonel, prophesied greatness for him, said the princess. It was said indeed that he was to seek a wife in our court, put in Pan Mihao. I do not remember that there was talk about that, answered the princess. In truth, she could not remember, for there had never been anything of the kind. But Pan Mihao, cunning at times, invented this, wishing to turn the conversation to her ladies and learn something of Anusha. For to ask directly he considered improper, and in view of the majesty of the princess, too confidential. But the stratagem failed. The princess turned her mind again to her husband and the Cossack wars. Then the little knight thought, Anusha has not been here, perhaps, for God knows how many years. And he asked no more about her. He might have asked the officers, but his thoughts and occupations were elsewhere. Every day, scouts gave notice that the Swedes were nearer. Hence, preparations were made for defence. Pan Yan and Pan Mihal received places on the walls as officers knowing the Swedes and warfare against them. Zagwoba roused courage in the men, and told tales of the enemy to those who had no knowledge of them yet, and among warriors in the fortress there were many such, for so far the Swedes had not come to Zamosht. Zagwoba saw through Pan Zamoyski at once, the latter conceived an immense love for the bulky noble, and turned to him on all questions, especially since he heard from Princess Griselda how Prince Yeremi had venerated Zagwoba and called him Vir Incomparabilis, the incomparable man. Every day then at table, all kept their ears open and Zagwoba discoursed of ancient and modern times, told of the wars with the Cossacks, of the treason of Rajivil, and how he himself had brought Pan Sapieha into prominence among men. I advised him, said he, to carry hemp seed in his pocket, and use a little now and then. He has grown so accustomed to this, that he takes a grain every little while, puts it in his mouth, bites it, breaks it, eats it, spits out the husk. At night when he wakes, he does the same. His wit is so sharp now from hemp seed that his greatest intimates do not recognize him. How is that? asked Zamoyski. There is an oil in hemp seed through which the man who eats it increases in wit. God bless you, said one of the colonels, but oil goes to the stomach, not to the head. Oh, there is a method in things, answered Zagwoba. It is needful in this case to drink as much wine as possible. Oil, being the lighter, is always on top. Wine, which goes to the head of itself, carries with it every noble substance. I have this secret from Lupul, the Hospodar, after whom, as is known to you, gentlemen, the Valachians wished to create me Hospodar, but the Sultan, whose wish is that the Hospodar should not have posterity, placed before me conditions to which I could not agree. You must use a power of hemp seed yourself, said Sobyapan. I do not need it at all, your worthiness, 
but from my whole heart I advise you to take it. Hearing these bold words, some were frightened, lest the starosta might take them to heart. But whether he failed to notice them, or did not wish to do so, it is enough that he merely laughed and asked, But would not sunflower seeds take the place of hemp? They might, answered Zagwaba, but since sunflower oil is heavier, it would be necessary to drink stronger wine than that which we are drinking at present. The starosta understood the hint, was amused, and gave immediate order to bring the best wines. Then all rejoiced in their hearts, and the rejoicing became universal. They drank and gave vivats to the health of the king, the host, and Pan Charnyetsky. Zagwoba fell into good humour and let no one speak. He described at great length the affair at Gowom, in which he had really fought well, for, serving in the louder squadron, he could not do otherwise. But because he had learned from Swedish prisoners taken from the regiments of Dubois of the death of Prince Valdemar, Zagwoba took responsibility for that death on himself. The battle, said he, would have gone altogether differently, were it not that the day before I went to Baranov to the cannon of that place, and Charnyetsky, not knowing where I was, could not advise with me. Maybe the Swedes too had heard of that cannon, for he has splendid mead, and they went at once to Goomb. When I returned, it was too late. The king had attacked, and it was necessary to strike at once. We went straight into the fire, but what is to be done when the general militia choose to show their contempt for the enemy by turning their backs? I don't know how Charnyetsky will manage at present without me. He will manage, have no fear on that point, said Vorodyovsky. I know why. The king of Sweden chooses to pursue me to Zamosh rather than seek Charnyetsky beyond the Vistula. I do not deny that Charnyetsky is a good soldier, but when he begins to twist his beard and look with his wildcat glance, it seems to an officer of the lightest squadron, that he is a dragoon. He pays no attention to a man's office, and this you yourself saw when he gave orders to drag over the square with horses an honourable man, Pan Yirsky, only because he did not reach with his detachment the place to which he was ordered. With a noble, gracious gentleman, it is necessary to act like a father, not like a dragoon. Say to him, Lord brother, be kind, rouse his feelings. He will call to mind the country and glory, will go farther for you than a dragoon who serves for a salary. A noble is a noble, and war is war, remarked Zamoyski. You have brought that out in a very masterly manner, answered Zagwoba. Pan Charnyetsky will turn the plans of Karl into folly, said Vordyovsky. I have been in more than one war, and I can speak on this point. First we will make a fool of him at Zamosht, said Sopiepan, pouting his lips, puffing, and showing great spirit, staring and putting his hands on his hips. Bah, tfu! What do I care? When I invite a man, I open the door to him. Well. Here, Zamoyski began to puff still more mightily, to strike the table with his knees, bend forward, shake his head, look stern, flash his eyes, and speak, as was his habit, 
with a certain coarse carelessness. What do I care? He is lord in Sweden, but Zamoyski is lord for himself in Zamosht. Ekves Polonus sum. I am a Polish nobleman, nothing more. But I am in my own house. I am Zamoyski, and he is king of Sweden. But Maximilian was Austrian, was he not? Is he coming? Let him come. We shall see. Sweden is small for him, but Zamosht is enough for me. I will not yield it. It is a delight, gracious gentlemen, to hear not only such eloquence, but such honest sentiments, cried Zagwoba. Zamoyski is Zamoyski, continued Pan Sobiepan, delighted with the praise. We have not bowed down, and we will not. I will not give up Zamosh, and that is the end of it. To the health of the host, thundered the officers. Vivat, vivat. Pan Zagwoba, cried Zamoyski, I will not let the king of Sweden into Zamosht, and I will not let you out. I thank you for the favour, but, your worthiness, do not do that, for as much as you torment Karl with the first decision, so much will you delight him with the second. Give me your word that you will come to me after the war is over. I give it. Long yet did they feast. Then sleep began to overcome the knights. Therefore they went to rest, especially as sleepless nights were soon to begin for them, since the Swedes were already near, and the advance guards were looked for at any hour. So in truth he will not give up Zamosht, said Zagwoba, returning to his quarters with Pan Yan and Vordyovsky. Have you seen how we have fallen in love with each other? It will be pleasant here in Zamosht for me and you. The host and I have become so attached to each other that no cabinet maker could join inlaid work better. He is a good fellow. Hmm. If he were my knife and I carried him at my belt, I would whet him on a stone pretty often for he is a trifle dull. But he is a good man, and he will not betray like those bull-drivers of Biryi. Have you noticed how the magnates cling to old Zagwoba? I cannot keep them off. I'm scarcely away from Sapieha when there is another at hand. But I will tune this one as a bass viol and play such an aria on him for the Swedes that they will dance to death at Zamosh. I will wind him up like a dancing clock with chimes. Noise coming from the town interrupted further conversation. After a time, an officer whom they knew passed quickly near them. Stop, cried Vordyovsky. What is the matter? There is a fire to be seen from the walls. Shebzheshin is burning. The Swedes are there. Let us go on the walls, said Pan Yan. Go, but I will sleep, since I need my strength for tomorrow, answered Zagwoba. End of chapter 28 Recording by David Granville Young Chapter 29 of The Deluge, Volume 2. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Deluge, Volume 2, by Henrik Schenkiewicz. Translated by Jeremiah Kurtan, 
to 1906. Chapter 29 That night, Vorovsky went on a scouting expedition, and about morning returned with a number of informants. These men asserted that the King of Sweden was at Szebrzeszyn in person, and would soon be at Zamosch. Zamoyski was rejoiced at the news, for he hurried around greatly, and had a genuine desire to try his walls and guns on the Swedes. He considered, and very justly, that even if he had to yield in the end, he would detain the power of Sweden for whole months, and during that time Jan Kazimir would collect troops, bring the entire Tartar force to his aid, and organise in the whole country a powerful and victorious resistance. Since the opportunity is given me, said he, with great spirit at the military council, to render the country and the king notable service, I declare to you, gentlemen, that I will blow myself into the air before a Swedish foot shall stand here. They want to take Zamoyski by force? Let them take him. We shall see who is better. You, gentlemen, will, I trust, aid me most heartily. We are ready to perish with your grace, said the officers in chorus. If they will only besiege us, said Zagwaba, I will lead the first sortie. I will follow, uncle, cried Ro Kowalski. I will spring at the king himself. Now to the walls, commanded Zamoyski. All went out. The walls were ornamented with soldiers as with flowers. Regiments of infantry so splendid that they were unequalled in the whole commonwealth, stood in readiness, one at the side of the other, with musket in hand and eyes turned to the field. Not many foreigners served in these regiments, merely a few Prussians and French. They were mainly peasants from Zamoyski's inherited lands, sturdy, well-grown men who, wearing coloured jackets and trained in foreign fashion, fought as well as the best Cromwellians of England. They were specially powerful when, after firing, it came to rush on the enemy in hand-to-hand -hand conflict, and now, remembering their former triumphs over Khmelnytsky, they were looking for the Swedes with impatience. At the cannons, which stretched out through the embrasures their long necks to the fields as if in curiosity, served mainly Flemings, the first of gunners. Outside the fortress, beyond the moat, were squadrons of light cavalry, safe themselves, for they were under cover of cannon, certain of refuge, and able at any moment to spring out whithersoever it might be needed. Zamoyski, wearing inlaid armour and carrying a gilded baton in his hand, rode around the walls and inquired every moment, Well, what? Not in sight yet? And he muttered oaths when he received negative answers on all sides. After a while he went to another side and again he asked, Well, what? Not in sight yet? It was difficult to see the Swedes, for there was a mist in the air, and only about ten o'clock in the forenoon did it begin to disappear. The heaven shining blue above the horizon became clear, and immediately on the western side of the walls they began to cry, They are coming! They are coming! They are coming! Zamoyski, with three adjutants and Zagwoba, entered quickly an angle of the walls from which there was a distant view, and the four men began to look through field glasses. The mist was lying a little on the ground yet, and the Swedish hosts, marching from Vialoncha, seemed to be wading to the knees in that mist, 
as if they were coming out of wide waters. The nearer regiments had become very distinct, so that the naked eye could distinguish the infantry. They seemed like clouds of dark dust rolling on toward the town. Gradually, more regiments, artillery, and cavalry appeared. The sight was beautiful. From each quadrangle of infantry rose an admirably regular quadrangle of spears. Between them waved banners of various colours, but mostly blue with white crosses and blue with golden lions. They came very near. On the walls there was silence. Therefore the breath of the air brought from the advancing army the squeaking of wheels, the clatter of armour, the tramp of horses, and the dull sound of human voices. When they had come within twice the distance of a shot from a culverin, they began to dispose themselves before the fortress. Some quadrangles of infantry broke ranks, others prepared to pitch tents and dig trenches. They are here, said Zamoyski. They are the dog brothers, answered Zagwoba. They could be counted, man for man, on the fingers. Persons of my long experience, however, do not need to count, but simply to cast an eye on them. There are ten thousand cavalry and eight thousand infantry with artillery. If I am mistaken in one common soldier or one horse, I am ready to redeem the mistake with my whole fortune. Is it possible to estimate in that way? Ten thousand cavalry and eight thousand infantry. I have hope in God that they will go away in much smaller numbers. Only let me lead one sortie. Do you hear? They are playing an aria. In fact, trumpeters and drummers stepped out before the regiments, and military music began. At the sound of it, the more distant regiments approached, and encompassed the town from a distance. At last, from the dense throngs, a few horsemen rode forth. When halfway, they put white kerchiefs on their swords and began to wave them. An embassy, cried Zagwoba. I saw how the scoundrels came to Kiedani with the same boldness, and it is known what came of that. Zamosh is not Kiedani, and I am not the voyevoda of Vilno, answered Zamoyski. Meanwhile, the horsemen were approaching the gate. After a short time, an officer of the day hurried to Zamoyski with a report that Pan Jan Sapieha desired, in the name of the King of Sweden, to see him and speak with him. Zamoyski put his hands on his hips at once, began to step from one foot to the other, to puff, to pout, and said at last, with great animation, Tell Pan Sapieha that Zamoyski does not speak with traitors. If the King of Sweden wishes to speak with me, let him send me a Swede by race, not a Pole, for Poles who serve the Swedes may go as ambassadors to my dogs. I have the same regard for both. As God is dear to me, that is an answer, cried Zagwoba with unfeigned enthusiasm. But devil take them, said the starosta, roused by his own words and by praise. Well, shall I stand on ceremony with them? Permit me, your worthiness, to take him that answer, said Zagwoba, and, without waiting, he hastened away with the officer, went to Jan Sapieha, and, apparently, 
not only repeated the starosta's words, but added something very bad from himself, for Sapieha turned from the town as if a thunderbolt had burst in front of his horse, and rode away with his cap thrust over his ears. From the walls and from the squadrons of the cavalry which were standing before the gate, they began to hoot at the men riding off. To the kennel with traitors, the betrayers, Jew servants, hush, hush! Sapieha stood before the king, pale, with compressed lips. The king, too, was confused, for Zamosch had deceived his hopes. In spite of what had been said, he expected to find a town of such power of resistance as Krakow, Poznan, and other places, so many of which he had captured. Meanwhile, he found a fortress powerful, calling to mind those of Denmark and the Netherlands, which he could not even think of taking without guns of heavy calibre. What is the result? asked the king when he saw Sapieha. Nothing. Zamoyski will not speak with Poles who serve your royal grace. He sent out his jester, who reviled me and your royal grace so shamefully that it is not proper to repeat what he said. It is all one to me with whom he wants to speak, if he will only speak. In default of other arguments, I have iron arguments, but meanwhile I will send Forgel. Half an hour later, Forgel, with a purely Swedish suite, announced himself at the gate. The drawbridge was let down slowly over the moat, and the general entered the fortress amid silence and seriousness. Neither the eyes of the envoy nor those of any man in his suite were bound. Evidently, Zamoyski wished him to see everything, and be able to report to the king touching everything. The master of Zamosch received Forgel with as much splendour as an independent prince would have done, and arranged all, in truth, admirably, for Swedish lords had not one twelfth as much wealth as the Poles had, and Zamoyski among Poles was well nigh the most powerful. The clever Swede began at once to treat him as if the king had sent the embassy to a monarch equal to himself. To begin with, he called him Prancep, and continued to address him thus, though Pan Sobiepan interrupted him promptly in the beginning, not Prancep, Ekves Polonus, a Polish nobleman, but for that very reason, the equal of princes. Your princely grace, said Forgel, not permitting himself to be diverted. The most serene king of Sweden and lord, here he enumerated his titles, has not come here as an enemy in any sense, but, speaking simply, has come on a visit, and through me announces himself having, as I believe, a well-founded hope that your princely grace will desire to open your gates to him and his army. It is not a custom with us, answered Zamoyski, to refuse hospitality to any man, even should he come uninvited. There will always be a place at my table for a guest, but for such a worthy person as the Swedish monarch, the first place. Inform, then, the most serene king of Sweden, that I invite him, and all the more gladly, since the most serene Carolus Gustavus is lord in Sweden, as I am in Zamosht. But, as your worthiness has seen, there is no lack of servants in my house. Therefore, his Swedish serenity need not bring his servants with him. Should he bring them, I might think that he counts me a poor man, 
and wishes to show me contempt. Well done, whispered Zagwoba, standing behind the shoulders of Pan Sobiepan. When Zamoyski had finished his speech, he began to pout his lips, to puff and repeat, Ah, here it is, this is the position. Forgel bit his moustache, was silent a while, and said, It would be the greatest proof of distrust toward the king if your princely grace were not pleased to admit his garrison to the fortress. I am the king's confidant. I know his innermost thoughts, and besides this, I have the order to announce to your worthiness and to give assurance by word in the name of the king that he does not think of occupying the possessions of Zamosch or this fortress permanently. But since war has broken out anew in this unhappy land, since rebellion has raised its head, and Yan Kazimir, unmindful of the miseries which may fall on the commonwealth, and seeking only his own fortune, has returned within the boundaries, and, together with pagans, comes forth against our Christian troops, the invincible king, my lord, has determined to pursue him, even to the wild steppes of the Tartars and the Turks, with the sole purpose of restoring peace to the country, the reign of justice, prosperity and freedom to the inhabitants of this illustrious commonwealth. Zamoyski struck his knee with his hand without saying a word, but Zagwoba whispered, the devil has dressed himself in vestments and is ringing for mass with his tail. Many benefits have accrued to this land already from the protection of the king, continued Forgel. But thinking in his fatherly heart that he has not done enough, he has left his Prussian province again to go once more to the rescue of the commonwealth, which depends on finishing Yan Kazimir. But that this new war should have a speedy and victorious conclusion, it is needful that the king occupy for a time this fortress. It is to be for his troops a point from which pursuit may begin against rebels. But hearing that he who is the lord of Zamosch surpasses all, not only in wealth, antiquity of stock, wit, high-mindedness, but also in love for the country. The king, my master, said at once, He will understand me. He will be able to appreciate my intentions respecting this country. He will not deceive my confidence. He will surpass my hopes. He will be the first to put his hand to the prosperity and peace of this country. This is the truth so on you depends the future fate of this country. You may save it and become the father of it. Therefore, I have no doubt of what you will do. Whoever inherits from his ancestors such fame should not avoid an opportunity to increase that fame and make it immortal. In truth, you will do more good by opening the gates of this fortress than if you had added a whole province to the commonwealth. The king is confident that your uncommon wisdom, together with your heart, will incline you to this. Therefore, he will not command, he prefers to request. He throws aside threats, he offers friendship. Not as a ruler with a subject, but as powerful with powerful does he wish to deal. Here, General Forgel bowed before Zamoyski with as much respect as before an independent monarch. In the hall it grew silent. All eyes were fixed on Zamoyski. He began to twist, according to his custom, in his gilded armchair to pout his lips, 
and exhibit stern resolve. At last he thrust out his elbows, placed his palms on his knees, and, shaking his head like a restive horse, began, This is what I have to say. I am greatly thankful to his Swedish serenity for the lofty opinion which he has of my wit and my love for the Commonwealth. Nothing is dearer to me than the friendship of such a potentate. But I think that we might love each other all the same if his Swedish serenity remained in Stockholm and I in Zamosch. That is what it is. For Stockholm belongs to his Swedish serenity and Zamosch to me. As to love for the Commonwealth, this is what I think. The Commonwealth will not improve by the coming in of the Swedes, but by their departure. That is my argument. I believe that Zamosch might help his Swedish serenity to victory over Jan Kazimir. But your worthiness should know that I have not given oath to his Swedish grace, but to Jan Kazimir. Therefore, I wish victory to Jan Kazimir and I will not give Zamosch to the King of Sweden. That is my position. That policy suits me, said Zagwaba. A joyous murmur rose in the hall, but Zamoyski slapped his knees with his hands, and the sounds were hushed. Forgel was confused, and was silent for a time. Then he began to argue anew, insisted a little, threatened, begged, flattered. Latin flowed from his mouth like a stream till drops of sweat were on his forehead. But all was in vain, for after his best arguments, so strong that they might move walls, he heard always one answer. But still I will not yield Zamosch. That is my position. The audience continued beyond measure. At last it became awkward and difficult for Forgel, since mirth was seizing those present. More and more frequently some word fell, some sneer, now from Zagwoba, now from others, after which smothered laughter was heard in the hall. Forgel saw, finally, that it was necessary to use the last means, Therefore, he unrolled a parchment with seals, which he held in his hand, and to which no one had turned attention hitherto, and rising, said with a solemn, emphatic voice, For opening the gates of the fortress, his royal grace, here again he enumerated the titles, gives your princely grace the province of Lubelsk in perpetual possession. All were astonished when they heard this, and Zamoyski himself was astonished for a moment. Forgel had begun to turn a triumphant look on the people around him, when suddenly and in deep silence Zagwoba, standing behind Zamoyski, said in Polish, Your worthiness, Offer the King of Sweden the Netherlands in exchange. Zamoyski, without thinking long, put his hands on his hips and fired through the whole hall in Latin. And I offer to his Swedish serenity the Netherlands. That moment the hall resounded with one immense burst of laughter. The breasts of all were shaking and the girdles on their bodies were shaking. Some clapped their hands, others tottered as drunken men. Some leaned on their neighbours, but the laughter sounded continuously. Forgel was pale. He frowned terribly, but he waited with fire in his eyes and his head raised haughtily. At last, when the paroxysm of laughter had passed, he asked in a short, broken voice, Is that 
the final answer of your worthiness. Zamoyski twirled his moustache. No, said he, raising his head still more proudly, for I have cannon on the walls. The embassy was at an end. Two hours later, cannons were thundering from the trenches of the Swedes, but Zamoyski's guns answered them with equal power. All Zamosht was covered with smoke, as with an immense cloud. Moment after moment there were flashes in that cloud, and thunder roared unceasingly. But fire from the heavy fortress guns was preponderant. The Swedish balls fell in the moat, or bounded without effect from the strong angles. Toward evening, the enemy were forced to draw back from the nearer trenches, for the fortress was covering them with such a rain of missiles that nothing living could endure it. The Swedish king, carried away by anger, commanded to burn all the villages and hamlets, so that the neighbourhood seemed in the night one sea of fire. But Zamoyski cared not for that. All right, said he, let them burn. We have a roof over our heads, but soon it will be pouring down their backs. And he was so satisfied with himself and rejoiced that he made a great feast that day and remained till late at the cups. A resounding orchestra played at the feast so loudly that, in spite of the thunder of artillery, it could be heard in the remotest trenches of the Swedes. But the Swedes cannonaded continually, so constantly indeed that the firing lasted the whole night. Next day a number of guns were brought to the king, which, as soon as they were placed in the trenches, began to work against the fortress. The king did not expect, it is true, to make a breach in the walls. He merely wished to instil into Zamoyski the conviction that he had determined to storm furiously and mercilessly. He wished to bring terror on them, but that was bringing terror on Poles. Zamoyski paid no attention to it for a moment, and often while on the walls, he said, in time of the heaviest cannonading, Why do they waste powder? Vorodyovsky and the others offered to make a sortie, but Zamoyski would not permit it. He did not wish to waste blood. He knew, besides, that it would be necessary to deliver open battle. For such a careful warrior as the king, and such a trained army, would not let themselves be surprised. Zagwoba, seeing this fixed determination, insisted all the more, and guaranteed that he would lead the sortie. You are too bloodthirsty, answered Zamoyski. It is pleasant for us, and unpleasant for the Swedes. Why should we go to them? You might fall, and I need you as a counsellor for it was by your wit that I confounded Forgale so by mentioning the Netherlands. Zagwaba answered that he could not restrain himself within the walls. He wanted so much to get at the Swedes, but he was forced to obey. In default of other occupation, he spent his time on the walls among the soldiers, dealing out to them precautions and counsel with importance which all heard with no little respect, holding him a greatly experienced warrior, one of the foremost in the Commonwealth, and he was rejoiced in soul, looking at the defence and the spirit of the knighthood. Pan Mihao, he said to Vordyovsky, there is another spirit in the Commonwealth and in the nobles. No one thinks now of treason or surrender, and every one out of good will for the commonwealth and the king is ready to give his life sooner than yield a step to the enemy. You remember how a year ago from every side was heard, this one has betrayed, that one has betrayed, a third has accepted protection, 
and now the Swedes need protection more than we. If the devil does not protect them, he will soon take them. We have our stomachs so full here that drummers might beat on them, but their entrails are twisted into whips from hunger. Zagwaba was right. The Swedish army had no supplies, and for 18,000 men, not to mention horses, there was no place from which to get supplies. Zamoyski, before the arrival of the enemy, had brought in from all his estates for many miles around food for man and horse. In the more remote neighbourhoods of the country swarmed parties of confederates and bands of armed peasants, so that foraging detachments could not go out, since just beyond the camp certain death was in waiting. In addition to this, Pan Charnyetsky had not gone to the west bank of the Vistula, but was circling about the Swedish army like a wild beast around a sheepfold. Again, nightly alarms had begun, and the loss of smaller parties without tidings. Near Krasnik appeared certain Polish troops, which had cut communication with the Vistula. Finally, news came that Pavel Sapieha, the hetman, was marching from the north with a powerful Lithuanian army, that in passing he had destroyed the garrison at Lublin, had taken Lublin, and was coming with cavalry to Zamosch. Old Wittenberg, the most experienced of the Swedish leaders, saw the whole ghastliness of the position, and laid it plainly before the king. I know, said he, that the genius of your royal grace can do wonders, but judging things in human fashion, hunger will overcome us, and when the enemy fall upon our emaciated army, not a living foot of us will escape. If I had this fortress, answered the king, I could finish the war in two months. For such a fortress, a year's siege is short. The king, in his soul, recognised that the old warrior was right. But he did not acknowledge that he saw no means himself, that his genius was strained. He counted yet on some unexpected event. Hence he gave orders to fire night and day. I will bend the spirit in them, said he. They will be more inclined to treaties. After some days of cannonading so furious that the light could not be seen behind the smoke, the king sent Forgel again to the fortress. The king, my master, said Forgel, appearing before Zamoyski, considers that the damage which Zamosch must have suffered from our cannonading will soften the lofty mind of your princely grace and incline it to negotiations. To which Zamoyski said, Of course there is damage. Why should there not be? You killed on the market square a pig, which was struck in the belly by the fragment of a bomb. If you cannonade another week, perhaps you'll kill another pig. Forgel took that answer to the king. In the evening, a new council was held in the king's quarters. Next day, the Swedes began to pack their tents in wagons and draw their cannon out of the trenches, and in the night the whole army moved onward. Zamosht thundered after them from all its artillery, and when they had vanished from the eye, two squadrons, the Schemberg and the Lauda, passed out through the southern gate and followed in their track. The Swedes marched southward. Wittenberg advised, it is true, a return to Warsaw, and with all his power he tried to convince the king that that was the only road of salvation. But the Swedish Alexander had determined absolutely to pursue the Polish Dariusz to the remotest boundaries of the kingdom. End of chapter 29
Recording by David Granville Young. Chapter 30 of The Deluge, Volume 2. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Deluge, Volume 2, by Henrik Sienkiewicz. Translated by Jeremiah Curtin, 1835-1906. Chapter 30 The spring of that year approached with wonderful roads, for while in the north of the Commonwealth snow was already thawing, the stiffened rivers were set free, and the whole country was filled with March water, in the south the icy breath of winter was still descending from the mountains to the fields, woods, and forests. In the forests lay snowdrifts. In the open country, frozen roads sounded under the hoofs of horses. The days were dry, the sunsets red, the nights starry and frosty. The people living on the rich clay, on the black soil, and in the woods of little Poland, comforted themselves with the continuance of the cold, stating that the field mice and the Swedes would perish from it. But inasmuch as the spring came late, it came as swiftly as an armoured squadron advancing to the attack of an enemy. The sun shot down living fire from heaven, and at once the crust of winter burst. From the Hungarian steppes flew a strong warm wind, and began to blow on the fields and wild places. Straightway in the midst of shining ponds, Arable ground became dark, a green fleece shot up on the low riverlands, and the forests began to shed tears from bursting buds on their branches. In the heavens, continually fair, were seen, daily, rows of cranes, wild ducks, teal, and geese. Storks flew to their places of the past year, and the roofs were swarming with swallows. The twitter of birds was heard in the villages, their noise in the woods and ponds, and in the evening the whole country was ringing with the croaking and singing of frogs, which swam with delight in the waters. Then came great rains, which were as if they had been warmed. They fell in the daytime, they fell in the night, without interruption. The fields were turned into lakes, the rivers overflowed, the fords became impassable. Then followed the stickiness and the impossible of muddy roads. Amid all this water, mud and swamp, the Swedish legions dragged onward continually toward the south. But how little was that throng, advancing as it were to destruction, like that brilliant army which in its time marched under Wittenberg to Great Poland. Hunger had stamped itself on the faces of the old soldiers. They went on more like spectres than men, in suffering, in toil, in sleeplessness, knowing that at the end of the road not food was awaiting, but hunger, not sleep, but a battle, and if rest, then the rest of the dead. Arrayed in iron, these skeletons of horsemen sat on skeletons of horses. The infantry hardly drew their legs along, barely could they hold spears and muskets with trembling hands. Day followed day, they went onward continually. Wagons were broken, cannons were fastened in sloughs, they went on so slowly that sometimes they were able to advance hardly five miles in one day. Diseases fell on the soldiers like ravens on corpses. The teeth of some were chattering from fever. Others lay down on the ground simply from weakness, choosing rather to die than advance. 
but the Swedish Alexander hastened toward the Polish Darius unceasingly. At the same time, he was pursued himself. As in the night time jackals follow a sick buffalo, waiting to see if he will soon fall, and he knows that he will fall, and he hears the howl of the hungry pack, so after the Swedes went parties, nobles and peasants, approaching ever nearer, attacking ever more insolently and snatching away. At last came Charnyetsky, the most terrible of all the pursuers, and followed closely. The rearguards of the Swedes, as often as they looked behind, saw horsemen, at one time far off on the edge of the horizon, at another a furlong away, at another twice the distance of a musket shot, at another time when attacking on their very shoulders. The enemy wanted battle. With despair did the Swedes pray to the Lord of Hosts for battle. But Charnyetsky did not receive battle. He bided his time. Meanwhile, he preferred to punish the Swedes, or let go from his hand against them single parties as one would falcons against water birds. And so they marched, one after the other. There were times, however, when Charnyetsky passed the Swedes, pushed on, and blocked the road before them, pretending to prepare for a general battle. Then the trumpet sounded joyously from one end of the Swedish camp to the other, and, oh miracle, new strength, a new spirit seemed to vivify on a sudden the wearied ranks of the Scandinavians. Sick, wet, weak, like Lazaruses, they stood in rank promptly for battle, with flaming faces, with fire in their eyes. Spears and muskets moved with as much accuracy as if iron hands held them. The shouts of battle were heard as loudly as if they came from the healthiest bosoms, and they marched forward to strike breast against breast. Then Charnyetsky struck once, twice, but when the artillery began to thunder, he withdrew his troops, leaving to the Swedes as profit, vain labour, and the greater disappointment and disgust. When, however, the artillery could not come up, and spears and sabres had to decide in the open field, he struck like a thunderbolt, knowing that in a hand-to-hand -hand conflict the Swedish cavalry could not stand, even against volunteers. And again, Wittenberg implored the king to retreat and thus avoid ruin to himself and the army. But Karl Gustav, in answer, compressed his lips, Fire flashed from his eyes, and he pointed to the south, where in the Russian regions he hoped to find Jan Kazimir, and also fields open to conquest, rest, provisions, pastures for horses, and rich plunder. Meanwhile, to complete the misfortune, those Polish regiments which had served him hitherto, and which in one way or another were now alone able to meet Charnetsky, began to leave the Swedes. Pan Zbrojek resigned first. He had held to Karl hitherto not from desire of gain, but from blind attachment to the squadron and soldierly faithfulness to Karl. He resigned in this fashion, that he engaged in conflict with a regiment of Miller's dragoons, cut down half the men, and departed. After him resigned Pan Kalinsky, who rode over the Swedish infantry. Jan Sapieha grew gloomier each day. He was meditating something in his soul, plotting something. He had not gone hitherto himself, but his men were deserting him daily. Karl Gustav was marching then through Narol, Cheshanov and Oleshitsa to reach the Sun. He was upheld by the hope that Jan Kazimir would bar his road and give him battle. A victory might yet repair the fate of Sweden and bring a change of fortune. In fact, 
Rumours were current that Jan Kazimir had set out from Lvov with the quarter soldiers and the Tartars. But Karl's reckonings deceived him. Jan Kazimir preferred to await the junction of the armies and the arrival of the Lithuanians under Sapieha. Delay was his best ally, for he was growing daily in strength, while Karl was becoming weaker. That is not the march of troops, nor of an army, but a funeral procession, said old warriors in Jan Kazimir's suite. Many Swedish officers shared this opinion. Karl Gustav, however, repeated still that he was going to Lvov, but he was deceiving himself and his army. It was not for him to go to Lvov, but to think of his own safety. Besides, it was not certain that he would find Jan Kazimir in Lvov. In every event, the Polish Darius might withdraw far into Podolia, and draw after him the enemy into distant steppes where the Swedes must perish without rescue. Douglas went to Przemysl to try if that fortress would yield, and returned not merely with nothing, but plucked. The catastrophe was coming slowly, but inevitably. All tidings brought to the Swedish camp were simply the announcement of it, each day fresh tidings and ever more terrible. Sapieha is marching, he is already in Tomashov, was repeated one day. Lyubomirsky is marching with troops and mountaineers, was announced the day following. And again, the king is leading the quarter soldiers and the horde 100,000 strong. He has joined Sapieha. Among these tidings were tidings of disaster and death. Untrue and exaggerated, but they always spread fear. The courage of the army fell. Formerly, whenever Karl appeared in person before his regiments, they greeted him with shouts in which rang the hope of victory. Now the regiments stood before him dull and dumb. And at the fires the soldiers, famished and wearied to death, whispered more of Charnyetsky than of their own king. They saw him everywhere. And a strange thing. When for a couple of days no party had perished, when a few nights passed without alarms or cries of Allah and strike, kill, their disquiet became still greater. Charnyetsky has fled. God knows what he is preparing, repeated the soldiers. Karl halted a few days in Yaroslav, pondering what to do. During that time, the Swedes placed on flat-bottomed boats sick soldiers, of whom there were many in camp, and sent them by the river to Sandomierz, the nearest fortified town still in Swedish hands. After this work had been finished, and just when the news of Jan Kazimir's march from Lvov had come in, the King of Sweden determined to discover where Jan Kazimir was, and with that object, Colonel Kanneberg, with 1,000 cavalry, passed the San and moved to the east. It may be that you have in your hands the fate of the war and us all, said the king to him at parting. And in truth, much depended on that party, for in the worst case, Kanneberg was to furnish the camp with provisions. And if he could learn certainly where Jan Kazimir was, the Swedish king was to move at once with all his forces against the Polish Darius, whose army he was to scatter and whose person he was to seize if he could. The first soldiers and the best horses were assigned, therefore, to Kanneberg. Choice was made the more carefully, as the colonel could not take artillery or infantry. Hence he must have with him men who with sabres could stand against Polish cavalry in the field. March 20, the party set out. A number of officers and soldiers took farewell of them, saying, God conduct you! God give victory! God give a fortunate return! They marched in a long line, 
being one thousand in number, and went two abreast over the newly built bridge which had one square still unfinished, but was in some fashion covered with planks so that they might pass. Good hope shone in their faces, for they were exceptionally well fed. Food had been taken from others and given to them. Gorailko was poured into their flasks. When they were riding away, they shouted joyfully and said to their comrades, We will bring you Charnyetsky himself on a rope. Fools! They knew not that they were going as go bullocks to slaughter at the shambles. Everything combined for their ruin. Barely had they crossed the river when the Swedish sappers removed the temporary covering of the bridge so as to lay stronger planks over which cannon might pass. The thousand turned toward Vilki Ochi, singing in low voices to themselves. Their helmets glittered in the sun on the turn once and a second time. Then they began to sink in the dense pine wood. They rode forward two miles and a half. Emptiness, silence around them. The forest depth seemed vacant altogether. They halted to give breath to the horses. After that, they moved slowly forward. At last they reached Vielki Oce, in which they found not a living soul. That emptiness astonished Kanneberg. Evidently, they have been waiting for us here said he to Major Sveno. But Charnyetsky must be in some other place, since he has not prepared ambushes. Does your worthiness order a return? asked Sveno. We will go on even to Lvov itself, which is not very far. I must find an informant and give the king sure information touching Yan Kazimir. But if we meet superior forces? Even if we meet several thousand of those brawlers whom the Poles call general militia, we will not let ourselves be torn apart by such soldiers. But we may meet regular troops. We have no artillery, and against them cannons are the main thing. Then we will draw back in season and inform the king of the enemy, and those who try to cut off our retreat we will disperse. I am afraid of the night, replied Sveno. We will take every precaution. We have food for men and horses for two days. We need not hurry. When they entered the pine wood beyond Vielki Oce, they acted with vastly more caution. Fifty horsemen rode in advance, musket in hand, each man with his gunstock on his thigh. They looked carefully on every side, examined the thickets, the undergrowth. Frequently they halted, listened. Sometimes they went from the road to one side to examine the depths of the forest, but neither on the roads nor at the sides was there a man. But one hour later, after they had passed a rather sudden turn, Two troopers riding in advance saw a man on horseback about four hundred yards ahead. The day was clear and the sun shone brightly, hence the man could be seen as something on the hand. He was a soldier, not large, dressed very decently in foreign fashion. He seemed especially small because he sat on a large cream-coloured steed, evidently of high breed. The horseman was riding at leisure, as if not seeing that troops were rolling on after him. The spring floods had dug deep ditches in the road in which muddy water was sweeping along. The horseman spurred his steed in front of the ditches and the beast sprang across with the nimbleness of a deer and again went on at a trot, throwing his head and snorting vivaciously from time to time. The two troopers reined in their horses and began to look around for the sergeant. He clattered up in a moment, looked and said, That is some hound from the Polish kennel. Shall I shout at him? Shout not. There may be more of them. Go to the colonel. 
Meanwhile, the rest of the advance guard rode up, and all halted. The small horseman halted too, and turned the face of his steed to the Swedes, as if wishing to block the road to them. For a certain time, they looked at him, and he at them. There is another, a second, a third, a fourth, a whole party, were the sudden cries in the Swedish ranks. In fact, horsemen began to pour out from both sides of the road, at first singly, then by twos, by threes. All took their places in line with him who had appeared first. But the second Swedish guard with Sveno, and then the whole detachment with Kanneberg, came up. Kanneberg and Sveno rode to the front at once. I know those men, cried Sveno when he had barely seen them. Their squadron was the first to strike on Prince Valdemar at Goomb. Those are Charnetsky's men. He must be here himself. These words produced an impression. Deep silence followed in the ranks. Only the horses shook their bridle bits. I sniff some ambush, continued Sveno. There are too few of them to meet us, but there must be others hidden in the woods. He turned here to Canneberg. Your worthiness, let us return. You give good counsel, answered the colonel, frowning. It was not worth while to set out if we must return at sight of a few ragged fellows. Why did we not return at sight of one? Forward! The first Swedish rank moved at that moment with the greatest regularity, after it the second, the third, the fourth. The distance between the two detachments was becoming less. Cock your muskets, commanded Canneberg. The Swedish muskets moved like one. Their iron necks were stretched toward the Polish horsemen. But before the muskets thundered, the Polish horsemen turned their horses and began to flee in a disorderly group. Forward, cried Canneberg. The division moved forward on a gallop, so that the ground trembled under the heavy hoofs of the horses. The forest was filled with the shouts of pursuers and pursued. After half an hour of chasing, either because the Swedish horses were better, or those of the Poles were wearied by some journey, the distance between the two bodies was decreasing. But at once something wonderful happened. The Polish band, at first disorderly, did not scatter more and more as the flight continued, but on the contrary, they fled in ever better order, in ranks growing more even, as if the very speed of the horses brought the riders into line. Sveno saw this, urged on his horse, reached Canneberg and called out, Your worthiness, that is an uncommon party. Those are regular soldiers, fleeing designedly and leading us to an ambush. Will there be devils in the ambush or men? asked Canneberg. The road rose somewhat and became ever wider, the forest thinner, and at the end of the road was to be seen an unoccupied field, or rather a great open space, surrounded on all sides by a dense, deep grey pine wood. The Polish horsemen increased their pace in turn, and it transpired that hitherto they had gone slowly of purpose, for now in a short time they pushed forward so rapidly that the Swedish leader knew that he could never overtake them. But when he had come to the middle of the open plain, and saw that the enemy were almost touching the other end of it, he began to restrain his men and slacken speed. But oh, marvel! The Poles, instead of sinking in the opposite forest, wheeled around at the very edge of the half-circle, and returned on a gallop toward the Swedes, putting themselves at once in such splendid battle order that they roused wonder even in their opponents. It is true, cried Canneberg. Those are regular soldiers, 
They turned as if on parade. What do they want for the hundredth time? They are attacking us, cried Sveno. In fact, the squadron was moving forward at a trot. The little knight on the cream-coloured steed shouted something to his men, pushed forward, again reined in his horse, gave signs with his sabre. Evidently he was the leader. They are attacking, really, said Canneberg with astonishment. And now the horses, with ears dropped back, were coming at the greatest speed, stretched out so that their bellies almost touched the ground. Their riders bent forward to their shoulders and were hidden behind the horse manes. The Swedes standing in the first rank saw only hundreds of distended horse nostrils and burning eyes. A whirlwind does not move as that squadron tore on. God with us! Sweden! Fire! commanded Canneberg, raising his sword. All the muskets thundered, but at that very moment the Polish squadron fell into the smoke with such impetus that it hurled to the right and the left the first Swedish ranks and drove itself into the density of men and horses as a wedge is driven into a cleft log. A terrible whirl was made. Breastplate struck breastplate, sabre struck rapier, and the rattle, the whining of horses, the groan of dying men roused every echo so that the whole pine wood began to give back the sounds of the battle as the steep cliffs of mountains give back the thunder. The Swedes were confused for a time, especially since a considerable number of them fell from the first blow. But soon recovering, they went powerfully against the enemy. Their flanks came together, and since the Polish squadron was pushing ahead anyhow, for it wished to pass through with a thrust, it was soon surrounded. The Swedish centre yielded before the squadron, but the flanks pressed on it with the greater power, unable to break it, for it defended itself with rage and with all that incomparable adroitness which made the Polish cavalry so terrible in hand-to-hand -hand conflict. Sabres toiled then against rapiers. Bodies fell thickly, but the victory was just turning to the Swedish side when suddenly, from under the dark wall of the pinewood, rolled out another squadron, and moved forward at once with a shout. The whole right wing of the Swedes, under the lead of Sveno, faced the new enemy in which the trained Swedish soldiers recognised hussars. They were led by a man on a valiant dapple grey. He wore a burka and a wildcat skin cap with a heron feather. He was perfectly visible to the eye, for he was riding at one side some yards from the soldiers. Charnetsky, Charnetsky was the cry in the Swedish ranks. Sveno looked in despair at the sky, then pressed his horse with his knees and rushed forward with his men. But Charnetsky led his hussars a few yards farther, and when they were moving with the swiftest rush, he turned back alone. With that, a third squadron issued from the forest. He galloped to that and led it forward. A fourth came out. He led that on, pointing to each with his baton where it must strike. You would have said that he was a man leading harvesters to his field and distributing work among them. At last, when the fifth squadron had come forth from the forest, he put himself at the head of that and with it rushed to the fight. But the hussars had already forced the right wing to the rear, and after a while had broken it completely. The three other squadrons, racing around the Swedes in Tartar fashion and raising an uproar, had thrown them into disorder. Then they fell to cutting them with steel, to thrusting them with lances, scattering, trampling, and finally pursuing them amid shrieks and slaughter. Canneberg saw that he had fallen into an ambush, and had led his detachment, as it were, under the knife. For him there was no thought of victory now, but he wished to save as many men as possible. 
Hence he ordered to sound the retreat. The Swedes, therefore, turned with all speed to that same road by which they had come to Vielki Oce. But Czarniecki's men so followed them that the breaths of the Polish horses warmed the shoulders of the Swedes. In these conditions, and in view of the terror which had seized the Swedish cavalry, that return could not take place in order, and soon Kannaberg's brilliant division was turned into a crowd fleeing in disorder and slaughtered almost without resistance. The longer the pursuit lasted, the more irregular it became, for the Poles did not pursue in order. Each of them drove his horse according to the breath in the beast's nostrils, and attacked and slew whom he wished. Both sides were mingled and confused in one mass. Some Polish soldiers passed the last Swedish ranks, and it happened that when a Pole stood in his stirrups to strike with more power the man fleeing in front of him, he fell himself thrust with a rapier from behind. The road to Vielki Oci was strewn with Swedish corpses, but the end of the chase was not there. Both sides rushed with the same force along the road through the next forest. There, however, the Swedish horses, wearied first, began to go more slowly, and the slaughter became still more bloody. Some of the Swedes sprang from their beasts and vanished in the forest, but only a few did so, for the Swedes knew from experience that peasants were watching in the forest, and they preferred to die from sabres rather than from terrible tortures, of which the infuriated people were not sparing. Some asked quarter, but for the most part in vain, for each Pole chose to slay an enemy and chase on, rather than take him prisoner, guard him, and leave further pursuit. They cut then without mercy, so that no one might return with news of the defeat. Vovodyovsky was in the van of pursuit with the Lauda squadron. He was that horseman who had appeared first to the Swedes as a decoy. He had struck first, and now, sitting on a horse which was as if impelled by a whirlwind, he enjoyed himself with his whole soul, wishing to be sated with blood and avenge the defeat of Goomb. Every little while he overtook a horseman, and when he had overtaken him, he quenched him as quickly as he would a candle. Sometimes he came on the shoulders of two, three, or four. But soon, only in a moment, that same number of horses ran riderless before him. More than one hapless Swede caught his own rapier by the point, and turning the hilt to the knight for quarter, implored with voice and with eyes. Vovodyovsky did not stop, but thrusting his sabre into the man where the neck joins the breast, he gave him a light, small push, and the man dropped his hands, gave forth one and a second word with pale lips, then sank in the darkness of death. Vovodyovsky, not looking around, rushed on and pushed new victims to the earth. The valiant Sveno took note of this terrible harvester, and, summoning a few of the best horsemen, he determined with the sacrifice of his own life to restrain even a little of the pursuit in order to save others. They turned, therefore, their horses, and, pointing their rapiers, waited with the points toward the pursuers. Vovodyovsky, seeing this, hesitated not a moment, spurred on his horse, and fell into the midst of them. And before any one could have winked, two helmets had fallen. More than ten rapiers were directed at once to the single breast of Vovodyovsky, but at that instant rushed in Pan Jan and Pan Stanislav, Yuzva Butrim, Zagwoba and Roch Kowalski, of whom Zagwoba related that even when going to the attack, he had his eyes closed in sleep, 
and woke only when his breast struck the breast of an enemy. Vovodyovsky put himself under the saddle so quickly that the rapiers passed through empty air. He learned this method from the Tartars of Belgorod, but being small and at the same time adroit beyond human belief, he brought it to such perfection that he vanished from the eye when he wished, either behind the shoulder or under the belly of the horse. So he vanished this time, and before the astonished Swedes could understand what had become of him, he was erect on the saddle again, terrible as a wildcat which springs down from lofty branches among frightened dogs. Meanwhile, his comrades gave him aid, and bore around death and confusion. One of the Swedes held a pistol to the very breast of Zagwoba. Roch Kowalski, having that enemy on his left side, was unable to strike him with a sabre, but he balled his fist, struck the Swede's head in passing, and that man dropped under the horse as if a thunderbolt had met him, and Zagwoba, giving forth a shout of delight, slashed in the temple Sveno himself, who dropped his hands and fell with his forehead to the horse's shoulder. At sight of this, the other Swedes scattered. Vovodyovsky, Yuzva Futlas, Pan Yan and Pan Stanislav followed and cut them down before they had gone a hundred yards. And the pursuit lasted longer. The Swedish horses had less and less breath in their bodies and ran more and more slowly. At last, from a thousand of the best horsemen which had gone out under Canneberg, there remained barely a hundred and some tens. The rest had fallen in a long belt over the forest road, and this last group was decreasing, for Polish hands ceased not to toil over them. At last they came out of the forest. The towers of Yaroslav were outlined clearly in the azure sky. Now hope entered the hearts of the fleeing, for they knew that in Yaroslav was the king with all his forces, and at any moment he might come to their aid. They had forgotten that immediately after their passage the top had been taken from the last square of the bridge so as to put stronger planks for the passage of cannon. Whether Charnyetsky knew of this through his spies, or wished to show himself of purpose to the Swedish king and cut down before his eyes the last of those unfortunate men, it is enough that not only did he not restrain the pursuit, but he sprang forward himself with the Schembeck squadron, slashed, cut with his own hand, pursuing the crowd in such fashion as if he wished with that same speed to strike Yaroslav. At last they ran to within a furlong of the bridge. Shouts from the field came to the Swedish camp. A multitude of soldiers and officers ran out from the town to see what was taking place beyond the river. They had barely looked when they saw and recognised the horsemen who had gone out of camp in the morning. Canneberg's detachment! Canneberg's detachment! cried thousands of voices. Almost cut to pieces, scarcely a hundred men are running. At that moment, the king himself galloped up, with him Wittenberg, Forgel, Miller, and other generals. The king grew pale. Canneberg, said he. By Christ and his wounds, the bridge is not finished, cried Wittenberg. The enemy will cut them down to the last man. The king looked at the river, which had risen with spring waters, roaring with its yellow waves. To give aid by swimming was not to be thought of. The few men still left were coming nearer. Now there was a new cry. The king's train and the guard are coming they too will perish. In fact, it had happened that a part of the king's provision chests with a hundred men of the infantry guard had come out at that moment by another road from adjoining forests. When they saw what had happened, 
the men of the escort, in the conviction that the bridge was ready, hastened with all speed toward the town. But they were seen from the field by the poles. Immediately about three hundred horsemen rushed toward them at full speed. In front of all, with sabre above his head and fire in his eyes, flew the tenant of Vonsosch, Zhenjian. Not many proofs had he given hitherto of his bravery, but at sight of the wagons in which there might be rich plunder, daring so rose in his heart that he went some tens of yards in advance of the others. The infantry at the wagons, seeing that they could not escape, formed themselves into a quadrangle, and a hundred muskets were directed at once at the breast of Zhenjian. A roar shook the air, a line of smoke flew along the wall of the quadrangle, but before the smoke had cleared away, the rider had urged on his horse so that the forefeet of the beast were above the heads of the men, and the Lord Tenant fell into the midst of them like a thunderbolt. An avalanche of horsemen rushed after him, and as when wolves overcome a horse, and he, lying yet on his back, defends himself desperately with his hoofs, and they cover him completely and tear from him lumps of living flesh, so those wagons and the infantry were covered completely with a whirling mass of horses and riders. But terrible shouts rose from that whirl and reached the ears of the Swede standing on the other bank. Meanwhile, still nearer the bank, the Poles were finishing the remnant of Canneberg's cavalry. The whole Swedish army had come out like one man to the lofty bank of the sun. Infantry, cavalry, artillery were mingled together, and all looked as if in an ancient circus in Rome at the spectacle. But they looked with set lips, with despair in their hearts, with terror and a feeling of helplessness. At moments from the breasts of those unwilling spectators was rested a terrible cry. At moments a general weeping was heard. Then again silence, and only the panting of the excited soldiers was audible. For that thousand men whom Canneberg had led out were the front and the pride of the whole Swedish army. They were veterans, covered with glory in God knows how many lands and God knows how many battles. But now they are running like a lost flock of sheep over the broad fields in front of the Swedish army, dying like sheep under the knife of the butcher. For that was no longer a battle, but a hunt. The terrible Polish horsemen circled about, like a storm, over the field of struggle, crying in various voices and running ahead of the Swedes. Sometimes a number less than ten, sometimes a group of more than ten, fell on one man. Sometimes one met one. Sometimes the hunted Swede bowed down on the saddle, as if to lighten the blow for the enemy. Sometimes he withstood the brunt, but oftener he perished, for with edged weapons the Swedish soldiers were not equal to Polish nobles trained in all kinds of fencing. But among the Poles the little knight was the most terrible of all, sitting on his cream-coloured steed which was as nimble and as swift as a falcon. The whole army noted him, for whomsoever he pursued he killed. Whoever met him perished, it was unknown how and when, with such small and insignificant movements of his sword did he hurl the sturdiest horseman to the earth. At last he saw Canneberg himself, whom more than ten men were chasing. The little knight shouted at them, stopped the pursuit by command, and attacked the Swede himself. The Swedes on the other bank held the breath in their breasts. The king had pushed to the edge of the river, and looked with throbbing heart, moved at once with alarm and hope. For Canneberg, as a great lord and a relative of the king, 
was trained from childhood in every species of sword exercise by Italian masters. In fighting with edge weapons, he had not his equal in the Swedish army. All eyes, therefore, were fixed on him now. Barely did they dare to breathe. But he, seeing that the pursuit of the crowd had ceased, and wishing after the loss of his troops to save his own glory in the eyes of the king, said to his gloomy soul, Woe to me, if, having first lost my men, I do not seal with my own blood the shame, or if I do not purchase my life by having overturned this terrible man. In another event, though the hand of God might bear me to that bank, I should not dare to look in the eyes of any Swede. When he had said this, he turned his horse and rushed toward the Yellow Knight. Since those Poles who had cut him off from the river had withdrawn, Canneberg had the hope that if he should finish his opponent, he might spring into the water and then what would be would be. If he could not swim the stormy stream, its current would bear him far with the horse, and his brothers would provide him some rescue. He sprang, therefore, like a thunderbolt at the little knight, and the little knight at him. The Swede wished, during the rush, to thrust the rapier up to the hilt under the arm of his opponent, but he learned in an instant that, though a master himself, he must meet a master as well, for his sword merely slipped along the edge of the Polish sabre, only quivered somehow wonderfully in his hand, as if his arm had suddenly grown numb. Barely was he able to defend himself from the blow which the knight then gave him. Luckily, at that moment, their horses bore them away in opposite directions. Both wheeled in a circle and returned simultaneously. But they rode now more slowly against each other, wishing to have more time for the meeting, and even to cross weapons repeatedly. Canneberg withdrew into himself so that he became like a bird which presents to view only a powerful beak from the midst of upraised feathers. He knew one infallible thrust in which a certain Florentine had trained him. Infallible because deceitful and almost impossible to be warded off, consisting in this, that the point of the sword was directed apparently at the breast, but by avoiding obstacles at the side, it passed through the throat till the hilt reached the back of the neck. This thrust he determined to make now. And, sure of himself, he approached, restraining his horse more and more. But Vorodyovsky rode toward him with short springs. For a moment, he thought to disappear suddenly under the horse like a Tartar. But since he had to meet with only one man, and that before the eyes of both armies, though he understood that some unexpected thrust was waiting for him, he was ashamed to defend himself in Tartar, and not in knightly fashion. He wishes to take me as a heron does a falcon with a thrust, thought Pan Michal to himself. But I will use that windmill which I invented in Wubnie. And this idea seemed to him best for the moment. Therefore it surrounded him like a glittering shield of light, and he struck his steed with his spurs and rushed on Canneberg. Canneberg drew himself in still more, and almost grew to the horse. In the twinkle of an eye, the rapier caught the sabre, and quickly he stuck out his head like a snake and made a ghastly thrust. But in that instant, a terrible whirling began to sound. The rapier turned in the hands of the Swede, the point struck empty space, but the curved end of the sabre fell with the speed of lightning. On the face of Canneberg, cut through a part of his nose, his mouth and beard, struck his shoulder blade, shattered that, and stopped only at the sword belt which crossed his shoulder. 
the rapier dropped from the hands of the unfortunate man, and night embraced his head. But before he fell from his horse, Vodiovsky dropped his own weapon and seized him by the shoulder. The Swedes from the other bank roared with one outburst, but Zagwoba sprang to the little knight. Pan Michal, I knew it would be so, but I was ready to avenge you. He was a master, answered Vodiovsky. You take the horse, for he is a good one. Ha! If it were not for the river, we could rush over and frolic with those fellows. I would be the first... The whistle of balls interrupted further words of Zagwoba. Therefore, he did not finish the expression of his thoughts, but cried, Let us go, Pan Mihao. Those traitors are ready to fire. Their bullets have no force, for the range is too great. Meanwhile, other Polish horsemen came up, congratulating Vowodyovsky and looking at him with admiration. But he only moved his moustaches, for he was a cause of gladness to himself as well as to them. But on the other bank, among the Swedes, it was seething as in a beehive. Artillerists on that side drew out their cannons in haste, and in the nearer Polish ranks, trumpets were sounded for withdrawal. At this sound, each man sprang to his squadron, and in a moment, all were in order. They withdrew then to the forest and halted again, as if offering a place to the enemy and inviting them across the river. At last, in front of the ranks of men and horses, rode out on his dapple grey the man wearing a burka and a cap with a heron's feather, and bearing a gilded baton in his hand. He was perfectly visible, for the reddish rays of the setting sun fell on him, and besides, he rode before the regiments as if reviewing them. All the Swedes knew him at once, and began to shout, Charnyetsky! Charnyetsky! He said something to the colonels. It was seen how he stopped longer with the knight who had slain Canneberg, and placed his hand on his shoulder. Then he raised his baton, and the squadrons began to turn slowly, one after another, to the pine woods. Just then, the sun went down. In Yaroslav, the bells sounded in the church. Then all the regiments began to sing in one voice as they were riding away. The angel of the Lord announced to the Most Holy Virgin Mary. And with that song, they vanished from the eyes of the Swedes. End of chapter 30 Recording by David Granville Young Chapter 31 of The Deluge, Volume 2 This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Deluge, Volume 2, by Henrik Sienkiewicz, translated by Jeremiah Curtin, 1835-1906. to 1906. Chapter 31 That evening, the Swedes lay down to sleep without putting food into their mouths, and without hope that they would have anything to strengthen themselves with on the morrow. They were not able to sleep from the torment of hunger. Before the second cock crow, the suffering soldiers began to slip out of the camp singly and in crowds to plunder villages adjoining Yaroslav. They went like night thieves to Radimno, to Kanchuga, to Tichin, where they hoped to find food of some kind. Their confidence was increased by the fact that Charnyetsky was on the other side of the river, but even had he been able to cross, they preferred death to hunger. There was evidently a great relaxation in the camp, for despite the strictest orders of the king, about 1,500 men went out in this way. 
they fell to ravaging the neighbourhood, burning, plundering, killing. But scarcely a man of them was to return. Charnyetsky was on the other side of the San, it is true, but on the left bank were various parties of nobles and peasants. Of these the strongest, that of Straukovsky, formed of daring nobles of the mountains, had come that very night to Pruchnik, as if led by the evil fate of the Swedes. When he saw the fire and heard the shots, Straukovsky went straight to the uproar and fell upon the plunderers. They defended themselves fiercely behind fences, but Straukovsky broke them up, cut them to pieces, spared no man. In other villages, other parties did work of the same kind. Fugitives were followed to the very camp, and the pursuers spread alarm and confusion, shouting in Tartar, in Wallachian, in Hungarian, and in Polish, so that the Swedes thought that some powerful auxiliary of the Poles was attacking them, maybe the Khan with the whole horde. Confusion began, and, a thing without example hitherto, panic, which the officers put down with the greatest effort. The king, who remained on horseback till daylight, saw what was taking place. He understood what might come of that, and called a council of war at once in the morning. That gloomy council did not last long, for there were not two rows to choose from. Courage had fallen in the army, the soldiers had nothing to eat, the enemy had grown in power. The Swedish Alexander, who had promised the whole world to pursue the Polish Dariush, even to the steps of the Tartars, was forced to think no longer of pursuit, but of his own safety. We can return by the San to Saint-Domierge, thence by the Vistula to Warsaw and to Prussia, said Wittenberg. In that way we shall escape destruction. Douglas seized his own head. So many victories, so many toils, such a great country conquered and we must return. To which Wittenberg said, Has your worthiness any advice? I have not, answered Douglas. The king, who had said nothing hitherto, rose as a sign that the session was ended, and said, I command the retreat. Not a word further was heard from his mouth that day. Drums began to rattle, and trumpets to sound. News that the retreat was ordered ran in a moment from one end of the camp to the other. It was received with shouts of delight. Fortresses and castles were still in the hands of the Swedes, and in them rest, food and safety were waiting. The generals and soldiers betook themselves so zealously to preparing for retreat that that zeal, as Douglas remarked, bordered on disgrace. The king sent Douglas with the vanguard to repair the difficult crossings and clear the forests. Soon after him moved the whole army in order of battle. The front was covered by artillery, the rear by wagons, at the flanks marched infantry. Military supplies and tents sailed down the river on boats. All these precautions were not superfluous. Barely had the march begun when the rearguard of the Swedes saw Polish cavalry behind, and thenceforth they lost it almost never from sight. Charnyetsky assembled his own squadrons, collected all the parties of that region, sent to Jan Kazimir for reinforcements, and pursued. The first stopping place, Pshevorsk, was at the same time the first place of alarm. The Polish divisions pushed up so closely that several thousand infantry with artillery had to turn against them. For a time, the king himself thought that Charnyetsky was really attacking, but according to his wont, he only sent detachment after detachment. These attacked with an uproar and retreated immediately. All the night passed in these encounters. 
A troublesome and sleepless night for the Swedes. The whole march, all the following nights and days, were to be like this one. Meanwhile, Jan Kazimir sent two squadrons of very well-trained cavalry, and with them a letter stating that the hetmans would soon march with cavalry, and that he himself, with the rest of the infantry and with the horde, would hasten after them. In fact, he was detained only by negotiations with the Khan, with Rakotsi, and with the court of Vienna. Charnyetsky was rejoiced beyond measure by this news, and when the day after the Swedes advanced in the wedge between the Vistula and the Sun, he said to Colonel Polonovsky, The net is spread. The fish are going in. And we will do like that fisherman, said Zagwaba, who played on the flute to the fish so that they might dance, and when they would not, he pulled them on shore. Then they began to jump around, and he fell to striking them with a stick, crying, Oh, such daughters, you ought to have danced when I begged you to do so. They will dance, answered Charnyetsky. Only let the marshal, Pan Lubomirsky, come with his army, which numbers five thousand. He may come any time, remarked Volodyovsky. Some nobles from the foothills arrived today, said Zagwaba. They say that he is marching in haste. But whether he will join us instead of fighting on his own account is another thing. How is that? asked Charnyetsky, glancing quickly at Zagwaba. He is a man of uncommon ambition and envious of glory. I have known him many years. I was his confidant and made his acquaintance when he was still a lad at the court of Pan Krakowski. He was learning fencing at that time from Frenchmen and Italians. He fell into terrible anger one day when I told him that they were fools, not one of whom could stand before me. We had a duel, and I laid out seven of them, one following the other. After that, Lubomirsky learned from me not only fencing, but the military art. By nature his wit is a little dull, but whatever he knows, he knows from me. Are you then such a master of the sword? asked Polonovsky. As a specimen of my teaching, take Pan Vorodyovsky. He is my second pupil. From that man I have real comfort. True, it was you who killed Sveno. Sveno? If some one of you gentlemen had done that deed, he would have had something to talk about all his life, and besides would invite his neighbours often to dinner to repeat the story at wine. But I do not mind it. For if I wished to take in all I have done, I could pave the road from this place to Saint-Domierge with such senos. Could I not? Tell me, any of you who know me. Uncle could do it, said Roch Kowalski. Charnyetsky did not hear the continuation of this dialogue, for he had fallen to thinking deeply over Zagwaba's words. He too knew of Lubomirsky's ambition, and doubted not that the marshal would either impose his own will on him, or would act on his own account, even though that should bring harm to the commonwealth. Therefore his stern face became gloomy, and he began to twist his beard. Oh, whispered Zagwaba to Pan Yan, Charnyetsky is chewing something bitter, for his face is like the face of an eagle. He will snap up somebody soon. Then Charnyetsky said, Some one of you gentlemen should go with a letter from me to Lubomirsky. I am known to him, and I will go, said Pan Yan. That is well, answered Charnyetsky. The more noted the messenger, the better. Zagwaba turned to Vordyovsky and whispered, He is speaking now through the nose. That is a sign of great change. In fact, Charnyetsky had a silver pallet, for a musket ball had carried away his own years before at Busha. Therefore, whenever he was roused, angry and unquiet, he always began to speak with a sharp and clinking voice. Suddenly he turned to Zagwoba. And perhaps you would go with Pan Skrzetowski? Willingly, answered Zagwoba. 
If I cannot do anything, no man can. Besides, to a man of such great birth it will be more proper to send two. Charnetsky compressed his lips, twisted his beard, and repeated as if to himself, Great birth, great birth. No one can deprive Lubomirsky of that, remarked Zagwoba. Charnetsky frowned. The Commonwealth alone is great, and in comparison with it no family is great, all of them are small, and I would the earth swallowed those who make mention of their greatness. All were silent, for he had spoken with much vehemence, and only after some time did Zagwoba say, in comparison with the whole commonwealth, certainly. I did not grow up out of salt, nor out of the soil, but out of that which pains me, said Charnetsky. And the Cossacks who shot this lip through pained me, and now the Swedes pain me, and either I shall cut away this saw with the sabre, or die of it myself, so help me God. And we will help you with our blood, said Polonovsky. Charnetsky ruminated some time yet over the bitterness which rose in his heart, over the thought that the marshal's ambition might hinder him in saving the country. At last he grew calm and said, Now it is necessary to write a letter. I ask you, gentlemen, to come with me. Pan Yan and Zagwoba followed him, and half an hour later they were on horseback and riding back toward Redimno, for there was news that the marshal had halted there with his army. Yan, said Zagwoba, feeling of the bag in which he carried Charnetsky's letter, do me a favour, let me be the only one to talk to the marshal. But, father, have you really known him and taught him fencing? Hey, that came out of itself, so that the breath should not grow hot in my mouth and my tongue become soft, which might easily happen from too long silence. I neither knew him nor taught him, just as if I had nothing better to do than be a bear-keeper and teach the marshal how to walk on hind legs. But that is all one. I have learned him through and through from what people tell of him, and I shall be able to bend him as a cook bends pastry. Only one thing I beg of you. Do not say that we have a letter from Charnetsky, and make no mention of it till I give the letter myself. How is that? Should I not do the work for which I was sent? In my life such a thing has not happened, and it will not happen. Even if Charnetsky should forgive me, I would not do that for ready treasure. Then I will draw my sabre and hamstring your horse so that you cannot follow me. Have you ever seen anything miscarry that I invented with my own head? Tell me, have you ever come into evil plight yourself with Zagwoba's stratagems? Did Pan Mihao come out badly, or your Helena, or any of you when I freed you all from Ajivio's hands? I tell you that more harm than good may come of that letter, for Charnetsky wrote it in such agitation that he broke three pens. Finally, you can speak of it when my plans fail. I promise to give it then, but not before. If I can only deliver the letter, it is all one when. I ask for no more. Now on, for there is a terrible road before us. They urged the horses and went at a gallop. But they did not need to ride long, for the marshal's vanguard had not only passed Radimno but Yaroslav, and Lubomirsky himself was at Yaroslav and occupied the former quarters of the King of Sweden. They found him at dinner with the most important officers. But when the envoys were announced, Lubomirsky gave orders to receive them at once, for he knew the names, since they were mentioned at that time in the whole Commonwealth. All eyes were turned on the envoys as they entered. The officers looked with especial admiration and curiosity at Pan Yan. When the marshal had greeted them courteously, he asked at once, have I that famous knight before me, who brought the letters from besieged Zbaraj to the king? I crept through, said Pan Yan. God grant me as many such officers as possible. I envy Pan Charnitsky nothing so much, as to the rest, 
I know that even my small services will not perish from the memory of men. And I am Zagwaba, said the old knight, pushing himself forward. Here he passed his eye around the assembly, and the marshal, as he wished to attract everyone to himself, exclaimed, Who does not know of the man who slew Burwai, the leader of the barbarians, of the man who raised Rajivil's army in rebellion? And I led Sapieha's army, who, if the truth is told, chose me, not him, for leader, added Zagwaba. And why did you wish, being able to have such a high office, to leave it and serve under Pan Charnyetsky? Here Zagwaba's eye gleamed at Skshetuski, and he said, Serene great mighty marshal, from your worthiness I as well as the whole country take example how to resign ambition and self-interest for the good of the commonwealth. Lubomirsky blushed from satisfaction, and Zagwaba, putting his hands on his hips, continued, Pan Charnyetsky has sent us to bow to your worthiness in his name, and that of the whole army, and at the same time to inform you of the considerable victory which God has permitted us to gain over Canneberg. I have heard of it already, said the marshal, dryly enough, in whom envy had now begun to move but gladly do I hear it again from an eyewitness. Zagwaba began at once to relate, but with certain changes, for the forces of Canneberg grew in his mouth to two thousand men. He did not forget either to mention Sveno or himself, and how before the eyes of the king the remnant of the cavalry were cut to pieces near the river how the wagons and three hundred men of the guards fell into the hands of the fortunate conquerors. In a word, the victory increased in his narrative to the dimensions of an unspeakable misfortune for the Swedes. All listened with attention, and so did the marshal, but he grew gloomier and gloomier. His face was chilled as if by ice, and at last he said, I do not deny that Charnyetsky is a celebrated warrior, but still he cannot devour all the Swedes himself. Something will remain for others to gulp. Serene great mighty lord, answered Zagwaba, it is not Pan Charnyetsky who gained the victory. But who? But Lubomirsky. A moment of universal astonishment followed. The marshal opened his mouth, began to wink, and looked at Zagwaba with such an astonished gaze, as if he wished to ask, Is there not a stave lacking in your barrel? Zagwaba did not let himself be beaten from the track, but pouting his lips with great importance, he borrowed this gesture from Zamoyski, said, I heard Charnyetsky say before the whole army, it is not our sabers that slay them, tis the name of Lubomirsky that cuts them down. Since they have heard that he is right here marching on, their courage has so gone out of them that they see in every one of our soldiers the army of the marshal, and they put their heads under the knife like sheep. If all the rays of the sun had fallen at once on the face of the marshal, that face could not have been more radiant. How is that? asked he. Did Charnyetsky himself say that? He did, and many other things, but I do not know that it is proper for me to repeat them, for he told them only to intimates. Tell! Every word of Pan Charnyetsky deserves to be repeated a hundred times. He is an uncommon man, and I said so long ago. Zagwaba looked at the marshal, half closing his one eye, and muttered, you have swallowed the hook. I'll land you this minute. What do you say? asked the marshal. I say that the army cheered your worthiness in such fashion that they could not have cheered the king better. And in Pshevorsk, where we fought all night with the Swedes, wherever a squadron sprang out, the men cried, Lubomirsky, Lubomirsky! And that had a better effect than Allah and Slay, Kill! There is a witness here too, Pan Skrzetuski, no common soldier, 
and a man who has never told a lie in his life. The marshal looked involuntarily at Pan Yan, who blushed to his ears and muttered something through his nose. Meanwhile, the officers of the marshal began to praise the envoys aloud. See, Pan Charnitsky has acted courteously, sending such polished cavaliers. Both are famous knights, and honey simply flows from the mouth of one of them. I have always understood that Pan Charnitsky was a well-wisher of mine, but now there is nothing that I would not do for him, cried the marshal, whose eyes were veiled with a mist from delight. At this, Zagwaba broke into enthusiasm. Serene great mighty lord, who would not render homage to you? Who would not honour you, the model of all civic virtues, who recall Aristides in justice, the Scipios in bravery? I have read many books in my time, have seen much, have meditated much, and my soul has been rent from pain, for what have I seen in this commonwealth? the Opalinskys, the Radzeyovskys, the Radzivils, who by their personal pride, setting their own ambition above all things, were ready at every moment to desert the country for their own private gain. I thought further, this commonwealth is lost through the viciousness of its own sons. But who has comforted me? Who has consoled me in my suffering? Pan Charnetsky, for he said, the Commonwealth has not perished since Lubomirsky has risen up in it. These others, said he, think of themselves alone. He is only looking, only seeking how to make an offering of his own interests on the common altar. These are pushing themselves forward. He is pushing himself back, for he wants to illustrate by his example. Now, said he, he is marching with a powerful conquering army, and I have heard, said he, that he wishes to give me the command over it in order to teach others how they should sacrifice their ambition, though even just for the country. Go then, said he, to Pan Lubomirsky. Declare to him that I do not want the sacrifice. I do not desire it, since he is a better leader than I am. Since, moreover, not only as leader, but God grant our Kazimir a long life. As king are we ready to choose him, and we will choose him. Here Zagwaba was somewhat frightened, lest he had passed the measure, and really, after the exclamation, we will choose him, followed silence. But before the magnate, heaven opened. He grew somewhat pale at first, then red, then pale again, and labouring heavily with his breast said, after the silence of a moment, the Commonwealth is and will ever remain in control of its own will, for on that ancient foundation do our liberties rest. But I am only a servant of its servants, and God is my witness that I do not raise my eyes to those heights at which a citizen should not gaze. As to command over the army, Pan Charnitsky must accept it, I demand it especially for this, to give an example to those who, having continually the greatness of their family in mind, are unwilling to recognize any authority whenever it is necessary to forget the greatness of their family for the good of the country. Therefore, though perhaps I am not such a bad leader, still I, Lubomirsky, enter willingly under the command of Charnetsky praying to God only to send us victory over the enemy. Roman, father of the country, exclaimed Zagwaba, seizing the marshal's hand and pressing it to his lips. But at the same moment, the old rogue turned his eye on Pan Yan and began to wink time after time. Thundering shouts were heard from the officers. The throng in the quarters increased with each moment. Wine, cried the marshal. And when they brought in goblets, he raised at once a toast to the king, then to Charnetsky, whom he called his leader, and finally to the envoys. Zagwaba did not remain behind with the toasts, and he so caught the hearts of all that the marshal himself conducted them to the threshold, and the knights to the gates of Yaroslav. At last, Pan Yan and Zagwaba were alone. 
Then Zagwaba stopped the road in front of Panyan, reined in his horse, and putting his hands on his hips, said, Well, Yan, what do you think? God knows, answered Pan Yan, that if I had not seen it with my own eyes and heard it with my own ears, I would not believe, even if an angel had told me. Ha! Do you know, I will swear to you that Charnyetsky himself at the most asked and begged Lubomirsky to go in company with him. And do you know what he would have done? Lubomirsky would have gone alone, for if Charnyetsky has adjured in the letter by the love of country, or if he mentioned private interests, and I am sure that he has, the marshal would have been offended at once and would have said, Does he want to be my preceptor? and teach me how to serve the country? I know those men. Happily, old Zagwaba took the matter in hand, and hardly had he opened his mouth when Luba Mirsky not only wanted to go with Charnyetsky, but to go under his command. Charnyetsky is killing himself with anxiety, but I will comfort him. Well, Yan, does Zagwaba know how to manage the magnates? I tell you that I am not able to let the breath go from my lips from astonishment. I know them. Show one of them a crown and a corner of the ermine robe, and you may rub him against the grain like a hound pup, and besides, he will bend up to you and present his back himself. No cat will so lick his chops, even if you hold before him a dinner of pure cheese. The eyes of the most honest of them will be bursting out from desire. And if a scoundrel happens, such as the voivode of Vilno, he is ready to betray the country. Oh, the vanity of man! Lord Jesus, if thou hadst given me as many thousands of ducats as thou hadst created candidates for this crown, I should be a candidate myself. For if any of them imagines that I hold myself inferior to him, then may his stomach burst from his own pride. Zagwaba is as good as Lubomirsky. In fortune alone is the difference. This is true, Jan. Do you think that I really kissed him on the hand? I kissed my own thumb and shoved his hand up to my nose. Certain it is that since he is alive no one has so fooled him. I have spread him like butter on toast for Charnyetsky. God grant our king as long a life as possible, but in case of election I would rather give a vote to myself than to Lubomirsky. Roch Kowalski would give me another, and Pan Michal would strike down my opponents. As God lives, I would make you Grand Hetman of the Kingdom straightway, and Pan Michal, after Sapieha, Grand Hetman of Lithuania, but Zhenjian treasurer. He would punish the Jews with taxes. But enough. The main thing is that I have caught Lubomirsky on a hook and put the line in Charnyetsky's hand. For whomsoever the flower, it will be ground on the Swedes. And whose is the merit? What do you think? Should the chroniclers inscribe it to someone else? But I have no luck. It will be well even if Charnyetsky does not break out on the old man for not having given the letter. Such is human gratitude. This is not my first, not my first. Others are sitting in starostaships and are grown around with fat like badgers. But do you, old man, shake your poor stomach on a horse as before? Here Zagwaba waved his hand. Human gratitude may go to the hangman. And whether in this or that position you must die, still it is pleasant to serve the country. The best reward is good company. As soon as a man is on horseback then, with such comrades as you and Michal, he is ready to ride to the end of the world. Such is our Polish nature. If a German, a Frenchman, an Englishman, or a dark Spaniard is on horseback, he is ready at once to gallop into your eyes. But a Pole, having inborn patience, will endure much, and will permit even a Swedish fellow to pluck him. But when the limit is passed and the Pole whacks him in the snout, such a Swede will cover himself three times with his legs. For there is metal yet in the Poles, and while the metal lasts, the Commonwealth will last. Beat that into yourself, Jan. And so spoke Zagwaba for a long time, for he was very glad. And whenever he was very glad, he was talkative beyond usual measure, 
and full of wise sentences. End of chapter 31 Recording by David Granville Young Chapter 32 of The Deluge, Volume 2 This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Deluge, Volume 2, by Henrik Sienkiewicz, translated by Jeremiah Curtin, 1835-1906. to Chapter 32 Charnyetsky, in truth, did not even dare to think that the Marshal of the Kingdom would put himself under his command. He wished merely joint action, and he feared that even that would not be attained because of the great ambition of Lubomirsky, for the proud magnate had mentioned more than once to his officers that he wished to attack the Swedes independently, for thus he could effect something. But if he and Charnyetsky won a victory together, the whole glory would flow to Charnyetsky. Such was the case, in fact. Charnyetsky understood the marshal's reasons and was troubled. He was reading now, for the tenth time, the copy of the letter which he had sent from Shevorsk, wishing to see if he had written anything to offend so irritable a man as Lubomirsky. He regretted certain phrases. Finally, he began to regret, on the whole, that he had sent the letter. Therefore, he was sitting gloomy in his quarters, and every little while he approached the window and looked out on the road to see if the envoys were not returning. The officers saw him through the window and divined what was passing in his mind, for evident trouble was on his forehead. But look, said Polonovsky to Pan Mihao, there will be nothing pleasant, for the castellan's face has become spotted, and that is a bad sign. Charnyetsky's face bore numerous traces of smallpox, and in moments of great emotion or disquiet, it was covered with white and dark spots. As he had sharp features, a very high forehead, and cloudy Jupiter brows, a bent nose, and a glance cutting straight through, when, in addition, those spots appeared, he became terrible. The Cossacks in their time called him the Spotted Dog, but in truth he was more like a spotted eagle, and when he led men to the attack, and his burka spread out like great wings, the likeness struck both his own men and the enemy. He roused fear in these and those. During the Cossack Wars, leaders of powerful bands lost their heads when forced to act against Charnyetsky. Khmelnytsky himself feared him, but especially the counsels which he gave the king. They brought upon the Cossacks the terrible defeat of Berestechko, but his fame increased chiefly after Berestechko when, together with the Tartars, he passed over the steppes like a flame, crushed the uprisen crowds, took towns and trenches by storm, rushing with the speed of a whirlwind from one end of the Ukraine to the other. With this same raging endurance was he plucking the Swedes now. Charnyetsky does not knock out my men, he steals them away, said Karl Gustav. But Charnyetsky was tired of stealing away. He thought that the time had come to strike, but he lacked artillery and infantry altogether, without which nothing decisive could be done, nothing important effected. Hence his eagerness for a junction with Lubomirsky, who had a small number of cannon, it is true, but brought with him infantry composed of mountaineers. These, though not overmuch trained as yet, had still been under fire more than once, and might, for want of better, be used against the incomparable infantry legions of Karl Gustav. Charnyetsky, therefore, was as if in a fever. Not being able to endure in the house, he went outside, and, seeing Vorovsky and Polonovsky, he asked, Are the envoys not in sight? 
It is clear that they are glad to see them, answered Vordyovsky. They are glad to see them, but not glad to read my letter, or the marshal would have sent his answer. Pan Kastelen, said Polonovsky, whom Charnetsky trusted greatly. Why be careworn? If the marshal comes, well. If not, we will attack as of old. As it is, blood is flowing from the Swedish pot, and we know that when a pot once begins to leak, everything will run out of it. There is a leak in the Commonwealth too, said Charnetsky. If the Swedes escape this time, they will be reinforced. Succor will come to them from Prussia. Our chance will be lost. Then he struck his side with his hand in sign of impatience. Just then was heard the tread of horses and the bass voice of Zagwoba singing, Kashka to the bakehouse went her way, and Stach said to her, Take me in, let me in, my love. For the snow is falling and the wind is blowing, where shall I, poor fellow, put my head till morning? It is a good sign they are returning joyously, cried Polonovsky. That moment the envoys, seeing Charnetsky, sprang from their saddles, gave their horses to an attendant, and went quickly to the entrance. Zagwoba threw his cap suddenly into the air, and imitating the voice of the marshal so excellently that whoever was not looking on might be deceived, cried, Vivat Pan Charnetsky, our leader! The castellan frowned and asked quickly, Is there a letter for me? There is not, answered Zagwoba. There is something better. The marshal with his army passes voluntarily under command of your worthiness. Charnitsky pierced him with a look, then turned to Pan Yan, as if wishing to say, Speak you, for this one has been drinking. Zagwoba was, in fact, a little drunk, but Skshetuski confirmed his words, hence astonishment was reflected on the face of the castellan. Come with me, said he to the two. I beg you also, said he to Polonovsky and Pan Mihal. All entered his room. They had not sat down yet when Charnetsky asked, What did he say to my letter? He said nothing, answered Zagwoba, and why he did not will appear at the end of my story, but now, in Sipiam, I will begin. Here he told all as it had happened, how he had brought the marshal to such a favourable decision. Charnetsky looked at him with growing astonishment. Polonovsky seized his own head. Pan Mihal's moustaches were quivering. I have not known you hitherto, as God is dear to me, cried Charnetsky at last. I cannot believe my own ears. They have long since called me Ulysses, said Zagwoba modestly. Where is my letter? Here it is. I must forgive you for not delivering it. He is a finished rogue. A vice-chancellor might learn from him how to make treaties. As God lives, if I were king, I would send you to Tsarogrod. If he were there, a hundred thousand Turks would be here now, cried Pan Mihal. To which Zagwoba said, Not one, but two hundred thousand, as true as I live. And did the marshal hesitate at nothing? asked Charnetsky. He? He swallowed all that I put to his lips, just as a fat gander gulps pellets. His eyes were covered with mist. I thought that from delight he would burst, as a Swedish bomb bursts. With flattery that man might be taken to hell. If it can only be ground out on the Swedes, if it can only be ground out, and I have hope that it will be, said Charnetsky, delighted. You are a man adroit as a fox. But do not make too much sport of the marshal, for another would not have done what he has today. Much depends on him. We shall march to Sandomierz itself over the estates of the Lubomirskis, and the marshal can raise with one word the whole region, command peasants to injure crossings, burn bridges, hide provisions in the forests. You have rendered a service which I shall not forget till death, but I must thank the marshal, 
for as I believe he has not done this from mere vanity. Then he clapped his hands and cried, A horse for me at once! Let us forge the iron while it is hot! Then he turned to the colonels, Come, all of you gentlemen, with me, so that the suite may be the most imposing. And must I go too? asked Zagwaba. You have built the bridge between me and the marshal. It is proper that you be the first to pass over. Besides, I think that they will see you gladly. Come, come, lord brother, or I shall say that you wished to leave a half-finished work. Hard to refuse. I must draw my belt tighter, however, lest I shake into nothing. Not much strength is left me, unless I fortify it with something. But with what? Much has been told me of the castellan's mead, which I have not tasted as yet, and I should like to know if it is better than the marshal's. We will drink a stirrup cup now, but after our return we shall not limit the cups in advance. You will find a couple of decanters of it in your own quarters. Then the castellan commanded to bring goblets. They drank enough for brightness and good humour, mounted and rode away. The marshal received Charnetsky with open arms, entertained him with food and drink, did not let him go till morning. But in the morning the two armies were joined and marched farther under command of Charnetsky. Near Shenyava the Poles attacked the Swedes again with such effect that they cut the rearguard to pieces and brought disorder into the main army. Only at daybreak did the artillery disperse them. At Lezhaisk, Charnetsky attacked with still greater vigour. Considerable detachments of the Swedes were mired in soft places caused by rains and inundations, and those fell into the hands of the Poles. The roads became of the worst for the Swedes. Exhausted, hungry and tortured by desire of sleep, the regiments barely marched. More and more soldiers stopped on the way. Some were found so terribly reduced that they no longer wished to eat or drink. They only begged for death. Others lay down and died on hillocks. Some lost presence of mind and looked with the greatest indifference on the approaching pursuers. Foreigners, who accounted frequently in the ranks of the Swedes, began to disappear from the camp and go over to Charnitsky. Only the unbroken spirit of Carl Gustav held the remnant of its dying strength in the whole army. For not only did an enemy follow the army, various parties under unknown leaders and bands of peasants crossed its road continually. Those bodies, unformed and not very numerous, could not, it is true, strike it with offensive warfare, but they wearied it mortally and wishing to instil into the Swedes the conviction that Tartars had already come with assistance. All the Polish troops gave forth the Tartar shout, therefore Allah, Allah was heard night and day without a moment's cessation. The Swedish soldiers could not draw breath, could not put aside their armour for an instant. More than once a few men alarmed the whole camp, Horses fell by tens and were eaten immediately, for the transport of provisions had become impossible. From time to time, the Polish horsemen found Swedish corpses terribly disfigured. Here, they recognised at once the hands of peasants. The greater part of the villages in the triangle between the San and the Vistula belonged to the marshal and his relatives. Therefore, all the peasants in those parts rose up as one man, for the marshal, unsparing of his own fortune, had announced that whoever took up arms would be freed from subjection. Scarcely had this news gone the round of the region when the peasants put their scythes on staffs and began to bring Swedish heads into camp. They brought them in every day till Lubomirsky was forced to prohibit that custom as unchristian. Then they brought in gloves and boots. The Swedes, driven to desperation, flayed those who fell into their hands, and the war became more and more dreadful. Some of the Polish troops adhered yet to the Swedes, but they adhered only through fear. On the road to Lezhaisk, many of them deserted. 
Those who remained made such tumults in the camp daily that Carl Gustav gave orders to shoot a number of officers. This was the signal for a general withdrawal, which was effected sabre in hand. Few, if any, Poles remained, but Czarniecki, gaining new strength, attacked with still greater vigour. The marshal gave most effectual assistance. During this period, which by the way was short, the nobler sides of Lubomirsky's nature gained, perhaps, the upper hand over his pride and self-love. Therefore he omitted no toil, he spared neither his health nor his person, he led squadrons frequently, gave the enemy no rest, and as he was a good soldier, he rendered good services. These, added to his later ones, would have secured him a glorious memory in the nation, were it not for that shameless rebellion which toward the end of his career he raised in order to hinder the reform of the Commonwealth. But at this time he did everything to win glory, and he covered himself with it as with a robe. Pan Vitovsky, the castellan of saint Domierge, an old and experienced soldier, vied with him. Vitovsky wished to equal Czarniecki himself, but he could not, for God had denied him greatness. All three crushed the Swedes more and more, and with such effect that the infantry and cavalry regiments, to whom it came to form the rearguard on the retreat, marched with so much fear that a panic arose among them from the slightest cause. Then Karl Gustav decided to march always with the rearguard, so as to give courage by his presence. But in the very beginning, he almost paid for this position with his life. It happened that, having with him a detachment of the life guards, the largest of all the regiments, for the soldiers in it were selected from the whole Scandinavian people, the king stopped for refreshment at the village of Rudnik. When he had dined with the parish priest, he decided to sleep a little, since he had not closed his eyes the night preceding. The lifeguards surrounded the house to watch over the safety of the king. Meanwhile, the priest's horse-boy stole away from the village and, coming up to a mare in the field, sprang upon her colt and raced off to Czarniecki. Czarniecki was ten miles distant at this time, but his vanguard, composed of the regiment of Prince Dmitri Vishnyovetsky, was marching under Shandarovsky, the lieutenant, about two miles behind the Swedes. Shandarovsky was just talking to Roch Kowalski, who had ridden up that moment with orders from Czarniecki, when suddenly both saw the lad flying toward them at all horse speed. What devil is that racing up so? asked Shandarovsky, and besides on a colt. Some village lad, said Kowalski. Meanwhile, the boy had ridden to the front of the rank and only stopped when the colt, frightened at horses and men, stood on his hind legs and dug his hoofs into the earth. The youth sprang off and, holding the colt by the mane, bowed to the knights. Well, what have you to say? asked the lieutenant, approaching him. The Swedes are with us at the priest's house. They say that the king himself is among them, said the youth with sparkling eyes. Many of them? Not more than two hundred horses. Shandarovsky's eyes now flashed in their turn, but he was afraid of an ambush. Therefore he looked threateningly at the boy and asked, Who sent you? Who was to send me? I jumped myself on the colt. I came near falling and lost my cap. It is well that the Swedish carrion did not see me. Truth was beating out of the sunburned face of the youth. He had evidently a great animosity against the Swedes. He was panting, his cheeks were burning. He stood before the officers, holding the mane of the colt with one hand, his hair disordered, the shirt open on his bosom. Where is the rest of the Swedish army? asked the lieutenant. At daybreak, so many passed that we could not count them. Those went farther. Only cavalry remained. But there is one sleeping at the priest's, and they say that he is the king. Boy, 
answered Shandorovsky. If you are lying, your head will fall. But if you speak the truth, ask what you please. As true as I live, I want nothing unless the great mighty Lord Officer would command to give me a sabre. Give him some blade, cried Shandorovsky to his attendants, completely convinced now. The other officers fell to inquiring of the boy where the house was, where the village, what the Swedes were doing. The dogs! They are watching. If you go straight, they will see you. But I will take you behind the alder grove. Orders were given at once, and the squadron moved on, first at a trot, and then at a gallop. The youth rode before the first rank bareback on his colt without a bridle. He urged the colt with his heels, and every little while looked with sparkling eyes on the naked sabre. When the village was in sight, he turned out of the willows, and led by a somewhat muddy road to the alder grove, in which it was still muddier, Therefore, they slackened the speed of the horses. Watch, said the boy. They are about ten rods on the right from the end of the alder grove. They advanced now very slowly, for the road was difficult and heavy. The cavalry horses sank frequently to their knees. At last, the alder grove began to grow thinner, and they came to the edge of the open space. Not more than three hundred yards distant, they saw a broad square rising somewhat, and in it the priest's house surrounded by poplars, among which were to be seen the tops of straw beehives. On the square were two hundred horsemen in rimmed helmets and breastplates. The great horsemen sat on enormous lean horses and were in readiness, some with rapiers at their shoulders, others with muskets on their thighs, but they were looking in another direction toward the main road, from which alone they expected the enemy. A splendid blue standard with a golden lion was waving above their heads. Farther on around the house stood guards by twos. One was turned toward the alder grove, but because the sun shone brightly and struck his eyes, and in the alders, which were already covered with thick leaves, it was almost dark, he could not see the Polish horsemen. In Shandorovsky, a fiery horseman, the blood began to boil like water in a pot, but he restrained himself and waited till the ranks should be in order. Meanwhile, Roch Kowalski put his heavy hand on the shoulder of the youth. Listen, horsefly, said he, have you seen the king? I saw him, great mighty lord, whispered the lad. How did he look? How can he be known? He is terribly black in the face and wears red ribbons at his side. Did you see his horse? The horse is black with a white face. Look out and show him to me. I will, but shall we go quickly? Shut your mouth. Here they were silent, and Roch began to pray to the Most Holy Lady to permit him to meet Karl and to direct his hand at the meeting. The silence continued still a moment. Then the horse under Shandorovsky himself snorted. At that, the horseman on guard looked, quivered as if something had been thrown at his saddle, and fired his pistol. Allah! Allah! Kill! Slay! Uhau! Slay! was heard in the alder grove, and the squadron, coming out of the shadow like lightning, rushed at the Swedes. They struck into the smoke before all could turn front to them, and a terrible hewing began. Only sabres and rapiers were used, for no man had time to fire. In the twinkle of an eye, the Poles pushed the Swedes to the fence, which fell with a rattle under the pressure of the horse's rumps, and the poles began to slash them so madly that they were crowded and confused. Twice they tried to close, and twice torn asunder they formed two separate bodies, which in a twinkle divided into smaller groups. At last they were scattered as peas thrown by a peasant through the air with a shovel. All at once were heard despairing voices, the king, the king, save the king. 
but Carl Gustav, at the first moment of the encounter, with pistols in hand and a sword in his teeth, rushed out. The trooper who held the horse at the door gave him the beast that moment. The king sprang on and, turning the corner, rushed between the poplars and the beehives to escape by the rear from the circle of battle. Reaching the fence, he spurred his horse, sprang over and fell into the group of his men who were defending themselves against the right wing of the Poles, who had just surrounded the house and were fighting with the Swedes behind the garden. To the road, cried Karl Gustav, and overturning with the hilt of his sword the Polish horseman who was raising his sabre above him, with one spring he came out of the whirl of the fight. The Swedes broke the Polish rank and sprang after him with all their force, as a herd of deer hunted by dogs rush whither they are led by their leader. The Polish horsemen turned their horses after them, and the chase began. Both came out on the high road from Rudnik to Boyanówka. They were seen from the front yard where the main battle was raging, and just then it was that the voices were heard crying, The King! The King! Save the King! But the Swedes in the front yard were so pressed by Shandorovsky that they could not think even of saving themselves. The king raced on then with a party of not more than twelve men, while after him were chasing nearly thirty, and at the head of them all, Roch Kowalski. The lad who was to point out the king was involved somewhere in the general battle, but Roch himself recognised Karl Gustav by the knot of red ribbons. Then he thought that his opportunity had come. He bent in the saddle, pressed his horse with the spurs, and rushed on like a whirlwind. The pursued, straining the last strength from their horses, stretched along over the broad road, but the swifter and lighter Polish horses began soon to gain on them. Roch came up very quickly with the hindmost Swede. He rose in his stirrups for a better blow and cut terribly, with one awful stroke, he took off the arm and the shoulder and rushed on like the wind, fastening his eyes again on the king. The next horseman was black before his eyes. He hurled him down. He split the head and the helmet of the third and tore farther, having the king and the king only in his eye. Now the horses of the Swedes began to pant and fall. A crowd of Polish horsemen overtook them and cut down the riders in a twinkle. Roch had already passed horses and men so as not to lose time. The distance between him and Karl Gustav began to decrease. There were only two men between him and the king. Now an arrow sent from a bow by some one of the Poles sang near the ear of Pan Roch and sank in the loins of the rider rushing before him. The man trembled to the right and the left. At last he bent backward, bellowed with an unearthly voice, and fell from the saddle. Between Roch and the king there was now only one man, but that one, wishing evidently to save the king, instead of helping, turned his horse. Kowalski came up, and a cannonball does not sweep a man from the saddle as he hurled him to the ground. Then, giving a fearful shout, he rushed forward like a furious stag. The king might perhaps have met him, and would have perished inevitably, but others were flying on behind Roch, and arrows began to whistle. Any moment one of them might wound his horse. The king, therefore, pressed his heels more closely, bent his head to the mane, and shot through the space in front of him like a sparrow pursued by a hawk. But Roch began not only to prick his own horse with the spurs, but to beat him with the side of the sabre, and so they sped on one after the other. Trees, stones, willows flashed before their eyes. The wind whistled in their ears. The king's hat fell from his head. At last he threw down his purse, thinking that the pitiless rider might be tempted by it and leave the pursuit. But Kowalski did not look at the purse, and rolled his horse on with more and more power till the beast was groaning from effort. Roch had evidently forgotten himself altogether, for racing onward he began to shout in a voice in which, besides threats, there was also a prayer, Stop, for God's mercy! 
Then the king's horse stumbled so violently that if the king had not held the bridle with all his power, the beast would have fallen. Roch bellowed like an aurochs. The distance dividing him from Carl Gustav had decreased notably. After a while, the steed stumbled a second time, and again, before the king brought him to his feet, Roch had approached a number of yards. Then he straightened himself in the saddle as if for a blow. He was terrible. His eyes were bursting out. His teeth were gleaming from under his reddish moustaches. One more stumble of the horse, another moment, and the fate of the Commonwealth, of all Sweden, of the entire war, would have been decided. But the king's horse began to run again, and the king, turning, showed the barrels of two pistols, and twice did he fire. One of the bullets shattered the knee of Kowalski's horse. He reared, then fell on his forefeet, and dug the earth with his nose. The king might have rushed that moment on his pursuer and thrust him through with his rapier, but at the distance of 200 yards, other Polish horsemen were flying forward. So he bent down again in his saddle and shot on like an arrow propelled from the bow of a Tartar. Kowalski freed himself from his horse. He looked for a while unconsciously at the fleeing man, then staggered like one drunk, sat on the road, and began to roar like a bear. But the king was each instant farther, farther, farther. He began to diminish, to melt, and then vanished in the dark belt of pine scrub. Meanwhile, with shouting and roaring, came on Kowalski's companions. There were fifteen of them whose horses held out. One brought the king's purse, another his hat, on which black ostrich feathers were fastened with diamonds. These two began to cry out, These are yours, comrade. They belong to you of right. Others asked, Do you know whom you are chasing? That was Karl himself. As God is true, in his life he has never fled before any man as before you. You have covered yourself with immense glory. And how many men did you put down before you came up with the king? You lacked only little of freeing the commonwealth in one flash with your sabre. Take the purse. Take the hat. The horse was good, but you can buy ten such with these treasures. Roch gazed at his comrades with dazed eyes. At last he sprang up and shouted, I am Kowalski, and this is Pani Kowalski. Go to all the devils. His mind is disturbed, cried they. Give me a horse, I'll catch him yet, shouted Roch. But they took him by the arms, and though he struggled, they brought him back to Rudnik, pacifying and comforting him along the road. You gave him Peter, cried they. See what has come to this victor, this conqueror of so many towns and villages. Ha ha, he has found out Polish cavaliers. He will grow tired of the Commonwealth, he has come to close quarters. Vivat Roch Kowalski. Vivat, vivat, the most manful cavalier, the pride of the whole army. And they fell to drinking out of their canteens. They gave Roch one, and he emptied the bottle at a draught. During the pursuit of the king along the Boyanovka road, the Swedes defended themselves in front of the priest's house with bravery worthy of their renowned regiment. Though attacked suddenly and scattered very quickly, they rallied as quickly around their blue standard, for the reason that they were surrounded by a dense crowd. Not one of them asked for quarter, but standing horse to horse, shoulder to shoulder, they thrust so fiercely with their rapiers that for a time victory seemed to incline to their side. It was necessary either to break them again, which became impossible since a line of Polish horsemen surrounded them completely, or to cut them to pieces. Shandorovsky recognized the second plan as the better. Therefore, encircling the Swedes with a still closer ring, he sprang on them like a wounded falcon on a flock of long-billed cranes. A savage slaughter and press began. Sabres rattled against rapiers. Rapiers were broken on the hilts of sabres. 
Sometimes a horse rose like a dolphin above the sea waves and in a moment fell in the world of men and horses. Shouts ceased. There were heard only the cry of horses, the sharp clash of steel, gasping from the panting breasts of the knights. Uncommon fury had mastered the hearts of Poles and Swedes. They fought with fragments of sabres and rapiers. They closed with one another like hawks, caught one another by the hair, by moustaches, gnawed with their teeth. Those who had fallen from their horses and were yet able to stand, stabbed with their knives, horses in the belly and men in the legs. In the smoke, in the steam from horses, in the terrible frenzy of battle, Men were turned into giants and gave the blows of giants. Arms became clubs, sabres lightning. Steel helmets were broken at a blow, like earthen pots. Heads were cleft. Arms holding sabres were swept away. They hewed without rest, they hewed without mercy, without pity. From under the world of men and horses, blood began to flow along the yard in streams. The great blue standard was waving yet above the Swedish circle, but the circle diminished with each moment. As when harvesters attack grain from two sides, and the sickles begin to glitter, the standing grain disappears, and the men see one another more nearly each moment, thus did the Polish ring become ever narrower, and those fighting on one side could see the bent sabres fighting on the opposite side. Pan Shandorovsky was wild as a hurricane and ate into the Swedes as a famished wolf buries his jaws in the flesh of a freshly killed horse. But one horseman surpassed him in fury, and that was the youth who had first let them know that the Swedes were in Rudnik, and now had sprung in with the whole squadron on the enemy. The priest's colt, three years old, which till that time had walked quietly over the land, shut in by the horses, could not break out of the throng. You would have said he had gone mad like his master, with ears thrown back, with eyes bursting out of his head, with erect mane he pushed forward, bit and kicked. But the lad struck with his sabre as with a flail. He struck at random, to the right, to the left, straight ahead. His yellow forelock was covered with blood, the points of rapiers had been thrust into his shoulders and legs, his face was cut, but these wounds only roused him. He fought with madness, like a man who has despaired of life and wishes only to avenge his own death. But now the Swedish body had decreased like a pile of snow on which men are throwing hot water from every side. At last, around the king's standard, less than twenty men remained. The Polish swarm had covered them completely, and they were dying gloomily with set teeth. No hand was stretched forth, no man asked for mercy. Now in the crowd were heard voices, Seize the standard, the standard! When he heard this, the lad pricked his colt and rushed on like a flame. When every Swede had two or three Polish horsemen against him, the lad slashed the standard bearer in the mouth. He opened his arms and fell on the horse's mane. The blue standard fell with him. The nearest Swede, shouting terribly, grasped after the staff at once. But the boy caught the standard itself and, pulling, tore it off in a twinkle, wound it in a bundle and, holding it with both hands to his breast, began to shout to the sky, I have it! I won't give it! I have it! I won't give it! The last remaining Swedes rushed at him with rage. One thrust the flag through and cut his shoulder. Then a number of men stretched their bloody hands to the lad and cried, Give the standard! Give the standard! Shandorovsky sprang to his aid and commanded, Let him alone! He took it before my eyes! Let him give it to Charnitsky himself! Charnitsky is coming! cried a number of voices. In fact, from a distance trumpets were heard, and on the road from the side of the field appeared a whole squadron galloping to the priest's house. It was the louder squadron, and at the head of it rode Charnyetsky himself. When the men had ridden up, seeing that all was over, they halted 
and Shandorovsky's soldiers began to hurry toward them. Shandorovsky himself hastened with a report to the Castellan, but he was so exhausted that at first he could not catch breath, for he trembled as in a fever, and the voice broke in his throat every moment. The king himself was here. I don't know whether he has escaped. He has, he has, answered those who had seen the pursuit. The standard is taken. There are many killed. Charnetsky, without saying a word, hurried to the scene of the struggle, where a cruel and woeful sight presented itself. More than two hundred bodies of Swedes and Poles were lying like a pavement, one at the side of the other, and often one above the other. Sometimes one held another by the hair, some had died biting or tearing one another with their nails, and some again were closed as in a brotherly embrace, or they lay one with his head on the breast of his enemy. Many faces were so trampled that there remained nothing human in them. Those not crushed by hoofs had their eyes open full of terror, the fierceness of battle and rage. Blood spattered on the softened earth under the feet of Charnetsky's horse, which was soon red above the fetlocks. The odour of blood and the sweat of horses irritated the nostrils and stopped breath in the breast. The castellan looked on those corpses of men as the agriculturist looks on bound sheaves of wheat which are to fill out his stacks. Satisfaction was reflected on his face. He rode around the priest's house in silence, looked at the bodies lying on the other side, beyond the garden, then returned slowly to the chief scene. I see genuine work here, and I am satisfied with you, gentlemen. They hurled up their caps with bloody hands. Vivat Charnetsky! God grant another speedy meeting. Vivat! Vivat! And the castellan said, You will go to the rear for rest. But who took the standard? Give the lad this way, cried Shandorovsky. Where is he? The soldiers sprang for him and found him sitting at the wall of the stable near the colt, which had fallen from wounds and was just breathing out his last breath. At the first glance, it did not seem that the lad would last long, but he held the standard with both hands to his breast. They bore him away at once and brought him before Charnetsky. The youth stood there barefoot with disordered hair, with naked breast, his shirt and his jacket in shreds, smeared with Swedish blood and his own, tottering, bewildered, but with unquenched fire in his eyes. Charnetsky was astounded at sight of him. How is this? asked he. Did he take the royal standard? With his own hand and his own blood, answered Shandorovsky. He was the first also to let us know of the Swedes, and afterward, in the thickest of the world, he did so much that he surpassed me and us all. It is truth, genuine truth, as if someone had written it, cried others. What is thy name? asked Charnetsky of the lad. Mihauko, whose art thou? The priests. Thou hast been the priests, but thou wilt be thy own, said Charnetsky. Mihauko heard not the last words, for from his wounds and the loss of blood he tottered and fell, striking the castellan's stirrup with his head. Take him and give him every care. I am the guarantee that at the first diet he will be the equal of you all in rank, as today he is the equal in spirit. He deserves it, he deserves it, cried the nobles. Then they took Mihauko on a stretcher and bore him to the priest's house. Charnetsky listened to the further report, which not Shandorovsky gave, but those who had seen the pursuit of the king by Rok Kowalski. He was wonderfully delighted with that narrative, so that he caught his head and struck his thighs with his hands, for he understood that after such an adventure, the spirit must fall considerably in Karl Gustav. Zagwoba was not less delighted, and putting his hands on his hips, said proudly to the knights, 
Ha! He is a robber, isn't he? If he had reached Karl, the devil himself could not have saved the king. He is my blood, as God is dear to me, my blood. In course of time, Zagwoba believed that he was Roch Kowalski's uncle. Czarniecki gave orders to find the young knight, but they could not find him, for Roch, from shame and mortification, had crept into a barn and, burying himself in the straw, had fallen asleep so soundly that he came up with the squadron only two days later. But he still suffered greatly and dared not show himself before the eyes of his uncle. His uncle, however, sought him out and began to comfort him. Be not troubled, Rock, said he. As it is, you have covered yourself with great glory. I have myself heard the Castellan praise you. To the eye of fool, said he, so that he looks as though he could not count three, and I see that he is a fiery cavalier who has raised the reputation of the whole army. The Lord Jesus has not blessed me, said Roch, for I got drunk the day before and forgot my prayers. Don't try to penetrate the judgments of God, lest you add blasphemy to other deeds. Whatever you can take on your shoulders, take but take nothing on your mind. If you do, you will fail. But I was so near that the sweat from his horse was flying to me. I should have cut him to the saddle. Uncle thinks that I have no reason whatever. Every creature, said Zagwoba, has its reason. You are a sprightly lad, Roch, and you will give me comfort yet more than once. God grant your sons to have the same reason in their fist that you have. I do not want that. I am Kowalski, and this is Pani Kowalski. End of chapter 32 Recording by David Granville Young Chapter 33 of The Deluge, Volume 2 this is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Deluge, Volume 2, by Henrik Sienkiewicz. Translated by Jeremiah Kurtar, 1835-1906. Chapter 33. After the affair at Rudnik, the king advanced farther toward the point of the wedge between the San and the Vistula, and did not cease as before to march with the rearguard. For he was not only a famous leader, but a knight of unrivalled daring. Charnyetsky, Vitovsky, and Lubomirsky followed, and urged him on as a wild beast is urged to a trap. Detached parties made an uproar night and day around the Swedes, the retreating troops had less and less provisions. They were more and more wearied and drooping in courage, looking forward to certain destruction. At last, the Swedes enclosed themselves in the very corner where the two rivers meet and rested. On one side, the Vistula defended them. On the other, the San. Both overflowed, as usual in springtime. The third side of the triangle the king fortified with strong entrenchments in which cannons were mounted. That was a position not to be taken, but it was possible to die there from hunger. But even in that regard the Swedes gained better courage, for they hoped that the commandants would send them provisions by water from Krakow and other river fortresses. For instance, Right there at hand was Saint-Domierge, in which Colonel Schinkler had collected considerable supplies. He sent these in at once, therefore the Swedes ate, drank, slept, and when they woke they sang Lutheran psalms, praising God that he had saved them from such dire distress. But Charnyetsky was preparing new blows for them. Sandomierz in Swedish hands could always come to the aid of the main army. Charnitsky planned, therefore, to take the town with the castle at a blow and cut off the Swedes. We will prepare a cruel spectacle for them, said he at a council of war. 
They will look on from the opposite bank when we strike the town, and they will not be able to give aid across the Vistula. And when we have saint domierge we will not let provisions come from Virets in Krakow. Lubomirsky, Witowski and others tried to dissuade Czarniecki from that undertaking. It would be well, said they, to take such a considerable town, and we might injure the Swedes greatly. But how are we to take it? We have no infantry. Siege guns we have not. It would be hard for cavalry to attack walls. But do our peasants, asked Czarniecki, fight badly as infantry? If I had two thousand such as Mihalko, I would take not only San Domierge, but Warsaw. And without listening to further counsel, he crossed the Vistula. Barely had his summons gone through the neighbourhood when a couple of thousand men hurried to him, one with a scythe, another with a musket, the third with a carabine, and they marched against saint -Domierge. They fell upon the place rather suddenly, and in the streets a fierce conflict set in. The Swedes defended themselves furiously from the windows and the roofs, but they could not withstand the onrush. They were crushed like worms in the houses and pushed entirely out of the town. Schinkler took refuge with the remnant of his forces in the castle, but the Poles followed him with the same impetuosity. A storm against the gates and the walls began. Schinkler saw that he could not hold out even in the castle, so he collected what he could of men, articles and supplies of provisions, and, putting them on boats, crossed to the king, who looked from the other bank on the defeat of his men without being able to succour them. The castle fell into the hands of the Poles, but the cunning Swede, when departing, put under the walls in the cellars kegs of powder with lighted matches. When he appeared before the king, he told him of this at once, so as to rejoice his heart. The castle, said he, will fly into the air with all the men. Charnitsky may perish. If that is true, I want myself to see how the pious Poles will fly to heaven, said the king, and he remained on the spot with all the generals. In spite of the commands of Charnitsky, who foresaw deceit, the volunteers and the peasants ran around through the whole castle to seek hidden Swedes and treasure. The trumpets sounded an alarm for every man to take refuge in the town, but the searchers in the castle did not hear the trumpets or would not heed them. All at once the ground trembled under their feet. An awful thunder and a roar tore the air. A gigantic pillar of fire rose to the sky, hurling upward earth, walls, roofs, the whole castle, and more than five hundred bodies of those who had not been able to withdraw. Karl Gustav held his sides from delight, and his favour-seeking courtiers began at once to repeat his words, The Poles are going to heaven, to heaven! But that joy was premature, for none the less did saint Domierge remain in Polish hands, and could no longer furnish food for the main army enclosed between the rivers. Czarniecki disposed his camp opposite the Swedes, on the other side of the Vistula, and guarded the passage. Sapieha, Grand Hetman of Lithuania and Voivoda of Vilno, came from the other side and took his position on the San. The Swedes were invested completely. They were caught, as it were, in a vice. The trap is closed, said the soldiers to one another in the Polish camps. For every man, even the least acquainted with military art, understood that inevitable destruction was hanging over the invaders unless reinforcements should come in time and rescue them from trouble. The Swedes too understood this. Every morning officers and soldiers, coming to the shore of the Vistula, looked with despair in their eyes and their hearts at the legions of Czarniecki's terrible cavalry standing black on the other side. Then they went to the San. There again the troops of Sapieha were watching day and night, ready to receive them with sabre and musket. To cross either the San or the Vistula while both armies stood near was not to be thought of. 
The Swedes might return to Yaroslav by the same road over which they came, but they knew that in that case not one of them would ever see Sweden. For the Swedes, grievous days and still more grievous nights now began, for these days and nights were uproarious and quarrelsome. Again, provisions were at an end. Meanwhile, Charnyetsky, leaving command of the army to Lubomirsky and taking the louder squadron as guard, crossed the Vistula above the mouth of the San to visit Sapieha and take counsel with him touching the future of the war. This time, the mediation of Zagwaba was not needed to make the two leaders agree, for both loved the country more than each one himself. Both were ready to sacrifice to it private interests, self-love and ambition. The Lithuanian hetman did not envy Charnetsky, nor did Charnetsky envy the hetman, but each did homage to the other, so the meeting between them was of such character that tears stood in the eyes of the oldest soldiers. The Commonwealth is growing, the dear country is rejoicing when such sons of heroes take one another by the shoulders, said Zagwaba to Pan Michal and Pan Yan. Charnyetsky is a terrible soldier and a true soul, but put Sapieha to a wound and it will heal. Would there were more such men, the skin would fly off the Swedes could they see this love of the greatest patriots. How did they conquer us if not through the rancour and envy of magnates? Have they overcome us with force? This is how I understand. The soul jumps in a man's body at sight of such a meeting. I will guarantee too that it will not be dry, for Sapieha loves a feast wonderfully, and with such a friend he will willingly let himself out. God is merciful, the evil will pass, said Pan Yan. Be careful that you do not blaspheme, said Zagwaba. Every evil must pass, for should it last forever, it would prove that the devil governs the world, and not the Lord Jesus, who has mercy inexhaustible. Their further conversation was interrupted by the sight of Babinich, whose lofty form they saw from a distance over the wave of other heads. Pan Mihao and Zagwaba began to beckon to him, but he was so much occupied in looking at Charnyetsky that he did not notice them at first. See, said Zagwaba, how thin the man has grown. It must be that he has not done much against Boguslav, said Vorodyovsky, otherwise he would be more joyful. It is sure that he has not, for Boguslav is before Marienburg with Steinbock, acting against the fortress. There is hope in God that he will do nothing. Even if he should take Marienburg, said Zagwaba, we will capture Karl Gustav right away. We shall see if they will not give the fortress for the king. See, Babinich is coming to us, interrupted Pan Yan. He had indeed seen them, and was pushing the crowd to both sides. He motioned with his cap, smiling at them from a distance. They greeted one another as good friends and acquaintances. What is to be heard? What have you done with the prince? asked Zagwaba. Evil, evil, but there is no time to tell of it. We shall sit down to table at once. You will remain here for the night. Come to me after the feast to pass the night among my Tartars. I have a comfortable cabin. We will talk at the cups till morning. The moment a man says a wise thing, it is not I who will oppose, said Zagwaba. But tell us why you have grown so thin. That hell-dweller overthrew me and my horse like an earthen pot, so that from that time I am spitting fresh blood and cannot recover. There is hope in the mercy of our Lord Christ that I shall let the blood out of him yet. But let us go now, for Sapieha and Charnyetsky are beginning to make declarations and to be ceremonious about precedence, a sign that the tables are ready. We wait for you here with great pleasure, for you have shed Swedish pig blood in plenty. Let others speak of what I have done, said Zagwaba. It does not become me. Meanwhile, whole throngs moved on, and all went to the square between the tents on which were placed tables. Sapieha, in honour of Charnyetsky, entertained like a king. The table at which Charnyetsky was seated was covert with Swedish flags. 
Mead and wine flowed from vats, so that toward the end both leaders became somewhat joyous. There was no lack of gladsomeness, of jests, of toasts, of noise, though the weather was marvellous and the sun warm beyond wonder. Finally, the cool of the evening separated the feasters. Then Kmichitz took his guests to the Tartars. They sat down in his tent on trunks packed closely with every kind of booty and began to speak of Kmichitz's expedition. Boguswab is now before Marienburg, said Pan Andrei, though some say that he is at the electors with whom he is to march to the relief of the king. So much the better, then we shall meet. You young fellows do not know how to manage him. Let us see what the old man will do. He has met with various persons, but not yet with Zagwaba. I say that we shall meet, though Prince Janusz in his will advised him to keep far from Zagwaba. The elector is a cunning man, said Pan Yan, and if he sees that it is going ill with Karl, he will drop all his promises and his oath. But I tell you that he will not, said Zagwaba. No one is so venomous against us as the Prussian. When your servant who had to work under your feet and brush your clothes becomes your master by change of fortune, he will be sterner to you the kinder you were to him. But why is that? asked Pan Mihao. His previous condition of service will remain in his mind, and he will avenge himself on you for it, though you have been to him kindness itself. What of that? asked Pan Mihao. It often happens that a dog bites his master in the hand. Better let Babinich tell about his expedition. We are listening, said Pan Yan. Kmichitz, after he had been silent a while, drew breath and began to tell of the last campaign of Sapieha against Boguslav and the defeat of the latter at Yanov. Finally, how Prince Boguslav had broken the Tartars, overturned him with his horse, and escaped alive. But, interrupted Vordyovsky, you said that you would follow him with your Tartars, even to the Baltic. And you told me also in your time, replied Kmichitz, how Pan Yan here present, when Bohun carried off his beloved maiden, forgot her and revenge because the country was in need. A man becomes like those with whom he keeps company, I have joined you, gentlemen, and I wish to follow your example. May the mother of God reward you as she has Pan Yan, said Zagwaba. Still, I would rather your maiden were in the wilderness than in Boguswab's hands. That is nothing, exclaimed Pan Mihao. You will find her. I have to find not only her person, but her regard and love. One will come after the other, said Pan Mihao. Even if you had to take her person by force, as at that time, you remember? I shall not do such a deed again. Here, Pan Andrei sighed deeply, and after a while he said, Not only have I not found her, but Boguslav has taken another from me. A pure Turk, as God is dear to me, cried Zagwaba. And Pan Yan inquired, what other? Oh, it is a long story, a long story, said Kmichitz. There was a maiden in Zamosh, wonderfully fair, who pleased Pan Zamoyski. He, fearing Princess Vishnyovetsky, his sister, did not dare to be overbold before her. He planned, therefore, to send the maiden away with me, as if to sapie her, to find an inheritance in Lithuania, but in reality to take her from me about two miles from Zamosh and put her in some wilderness where no one could stand in his way. But I sounded his intention. You want, thought I to myself, to make a pander of me. Wait. I flogged his men and the lady in all maidenly honour I brought to Sapieha. Well, I say to you that the girl is as beautiful as a goldfinch, but honest. I am now another man, and my comrades, the Lord like their souls, are long ago dust in the earth. What sort of maiden was she? asked Zagwaba. 
from a respectable house, a lady-in-waiting on Princess Griselda. She was once engaged to a Lithuanian, Podbipienta, whom you gentlemen knew. Anusha Borja Pohata, shouted Vordiovsky, springing from his place. Zagwoba jumped up too from a pile of felt. Pan Mihal, restrain yourself. But Vordiovsky sprang like a cat towards Kmichitz. Is it you, traitor, who let Boguslav carry her off? Be not unjust to me, said Kmichitz. I took her safely to the hetman, having as much care for her as for my own sister. Boguslav seized her not from me, but from another officer with whom Pan Sapieha sent her to his own family. His name was Gwovbich or something. I do not remember well. Where is he now? He is no longer living. He was slain. So at least Sapieha's officers said. I was attacking Boguslav separately with the Tartars. Therefore, I know nothing accurately save what I have told you. But noticing your changed face, I see that a similar thing has met us. The same man has wronged us, and since that is the case, let us join against him to avenge the wrong and take vengeance in company. He is a great lord and a great knight, and still I think it will be narrow for him and the whole commonwealth if he has two such enemies. Here is my hand, said Vordiovsky. Henceforth we are friends for life and death. Whoever meets him first will pay him for both. God grant me to meet him first, for that I will let his blood out is as sure as there is Amen in our father. Here, Pan Mihal began to move his moustaches terribly and to feel of his sabre. Zagwoba was frightened, for he knew that with Pan Mihal there was no joking. I should not care to be Prince Boguslav now, said he even if someone should add Livonia to my title. It is enough to have such a wild cat as Kmichitz against one. But what will he do with Pan Mihal? And that is not all. I will conclude an alliance with you. My head, your sabres. I do not know, as there is a potentate in Christendom who could stand against such an alliance. Besides, the Lord God will sooner or later take away his luck, for it cannot be that for a traitor and a heretic there is no punishment. As it is, Kmichitz has given it to him terribly. I do not deny that more than one confusion has met him from me, said Pan Andrei, and giving orders to fill the goblets, he told how he had freed Soroka from captivity. But he did not tell how he had cast himself first at the feet of Rajivil, for at the very thought of that his blood boiled. Pan Mihal was rejoiced while hearing the narrative, and said at the end, May God aid you, Yendrek. With such a daring man one could go to hell. The only trouble is that we shall not always campaign together, for service is service. They may send me to one end of the Commonwealth and you to the other. It is not known which will meet him first. Kmichitz was silent a moment. In justice, I should reach him. If only I do not come out again with confusion, for I am ashamed to acknowledge that I cannot meet that hell-dweller hand to hand. Then I will teach you all my secrets, said Pan Mihal. Or I, said Zagwoba. Pardon me, your grace, I prefer to learn from Mihal, said Kmichitz. Though he is such a knight, still I and Pani Kowalski are not afraid of him. If only I had a good sleep, put in Roch. Be quiet, Roch, answered Zagwoba. May God not punish you through his hand for boasting. Oh, Tfu, nothing will happen to me from him. Poor Kowalski was an unlucky prophet, but it was steaming terribly from his forelock, and he was ready to challenge the whole world to single combat. Others, too, drank heavily to one another and to the destruction of Boguslav and the Swedes. I have heard, said Kmichitz, that as soon as we rub out the Swedes here and take the king, we shall march straight to Warsaw. Then surely there will be an end of the war. After that will come the elector's turn. Oh, that's it, that's it, said Zagwoba. I heard Sapieha say that once, and he, as a great man, calculates better than others, he said, 
There will be a truce with the Swedes. With the Northerners there is one already, but with the Elector we should not make any conditions. Pan Czarnitsky, he says, will go with Lubomirsky to Brandenburg, and I with the Treasurer of Lithuania to Electoral Prussia. And if after that we do not join Prussia to the Commonwealth, it is because in our Chancellery we have no such head as Pan Zagwoba, who in autograph letters threatened the Elector. Did Sapieha say that? asked Zagwoba, flushing from pleasure. All heard him, and I was terribly glad, for that same rod will flog Boguslav, and if not earlier, we will surely reach him at that time. If we can finish with these Swedes first, said Zagwoba, devil take them, let them give up live land and a million, I will let them off alive. The Cossack caught the Tartar, and the Tartar is holding him by the head, said Pan Jan, laughing. Karl is still in Poland. Krakow, Warsaw, Poznan, and all the most noted towns are in his hands, and Father wants him to ransom himself. Hey, we shall have to work much at him yet before we can think of the Elector. And there is Steinbock's army, and the garrisons, and Wirtz, put in Pan Stanislav. But why do we sit here with folded hands, asked Roch Kowalski on a sudden, with staring eyes. Cannot we beat the Swedes? You are foolish, Roch, said Zagwoba. Uncle always says one thing, but as I am alive, I saw a boat at the shore. We might go and carry off even the sentry. It is so dark that you might strike a man on the snout, and he wouldn't know who did it. Before they could see, we should return and exhibit the courage of cavaliers to both commanders. If you do not wish to go, I will go myself. The dead calf moved his tail, wonder of wonders, said Zagwoba angrily. But Kmichitz's nostrils began to quiver at once. Not a bad idea, not a bad idea, said he. Good for camp followers, but not for him who regards dignity. Have respect for yourselves. You are colonels, but you wish to amuse yourselves with wandering thieves. True, it is not very becoming, added Vordiovsky. We would better go to sleep. All agreed with that idea, therefore they kneeled down to their prayers and repeated them aloud. After that, they stretched themselves on the felt cloth and were soon sleeping the sleep of the just. But an hour later, all sprang to their feet, for beyond the river the roaring of guns was heard, while shouts and tumult rose in Sapieha's whole camp. Jesus, Mary, exclaimed Zagwoba, the Swedes are coming. What are you talking about? asked Vordiovsky, seizing his sabre. Roch, come here, cried Zagwoba, for in cases of surprise, he was glad to have his sister's son near him. But Roch was not in the tent. They ran out on the square. Crowds were already before the tents, and all were making their way toward the river, for on the other side was to be seen flashing of fire, and an increasing roar was heard. What has happened? What has happened? was asked of the numerous guards disposed along the bank. But the guards had seen nothing. One of the soldiers said that he had heard, as it were, the plash of a wave, but as fog was hanging over the water, he could see nothing. He did not wish, therefore, to raise the camp for a mere sound. When Zagwoba heard this, he caught himself by the head in desperation. Roch has gone to the Swedes. He said that he wished to carry off a sentry. For God's sake, that may be, cried Kmichitz. They will shoot the lad as God is in heaven, continued Zagwoba in despair. Worthy gentlemen, is there no help? Lord God, that boy was of the purest gold. There is not another such in the two armies. What shot that idea into his stupid head? Oh, mother of God, save him in trouble. Maybe he will return. The fog is dense. They will not see him. I will wait for him here even till morning. Mother of God, mother of God. Meanwhile, shots on the opposite bank lessened. Lights went out gradually and after an hour, dull silence set in. Zagwoba walked along the bank of the river like a hen with ducklings and tore out the remnant of hair in his forelock. But he waited in vain, he despaired in vain. The morning whitened the river, 
the sun rose, but Roch came not. End of chapter 33. Recording by David Granville Young. Chapter 34 of The Deluge, Volume 2. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Deluge, Volume 2, by Henrik Sienkiewicz, translated by Jeremiah Kurta, 1835-1906. Chapter 34 Zagwoba, in unbroken despair, betook himself to Charnitsky with a request that he would send to the Swedes to see what had happened to Kowalski. Is he alive yet? Is he groaning in captivity? Or has he paid with his life for his daring? Charnitsky agreed to this willingly, for he loved Zagwoba. Then, comforting him in his suffering, he said, I think your sister's son must be alive, otherwise the water would have brought him ashore. God grant that he is, answered Zagwaba. Still it would be hard for the water to raise him, for not only had he a heavy hand, but his wit was like lead, as is shown by his action. You speak justly, answered Charnetsky. If he is alive, I ought to give orders to drag him with a horse over the square for disregard of discipline. He might alarm the Swedish army, but he has alarmed both armies. Besides, he was not free to touch the Swedes without command and my order. Is this a general militia, or what the devil that every man has a right to act on his own account? He has offended, I agree. I will punish him myself, if only the Lord will bring him back. But I forgive him in remembrance of the Rutnik affair. I have many prisoners to exchange, and more distinguished officers than Kowalski. Do you go to the Swedes and negotiate about exchange? I will give two or three for him if need be, for I do not wish to make your heart bleed. Come to me for a letter to the king, and go quickly. Zagwaba sprang with rejoicing to Kmichitz's tent and told his comrades what had happened. Pan Andrei and Vordyovsky exclaimed at once that they too would go with him, for both were curious to see the Swedes. Besides, Kmichitz might be very useful, since he spoke German almost as fluently as Polish. Preparations did not delay them long. Charnitsky, without waiting for the return of Zagwoba, sent the letter by a messenger. Then they provided a piece of white cloth fixed to a pole, took a trumpeter, sat in a boat, and moved on. At first they went in silence. Nothing save the plash of oars was to be heard. At last Zagwoba was somewhat alarmed and said, Let the trumpeter announce us immediately, for those scoundrels are ready to fire in spite of the white flag. What do you say? answered Vordyovsky. Even barbarians respect envoys, and this is a civilized people. Let the trumpeter sound, I say. The first soldier who happens along will fire, make a hole in the boat, and we shall get into the water. The water is cold, and I have no wish to get wet through their courtesy. There, a sentry is visible, said Kmichitz. The trumpeter sounded. The boat shot forward quickly. On the other shore, a hurried movement began, and soon a mounted officer rode up, wearing a yellow leather cap. When he had approached the edge of the water, he shaded his eyes with his hand and began to look against the light. A few yards from the shore, Kmichitz removed his cap in greeting. The officer bowed to him with equal politeness. A letter from Pan Charnitsky to the most serene king of Sweden, cried Pan Andrei, showing the letter. The guard standing on the shore presented arms. Pan Zagwoba was completely reassured. Presently, he fixed his countenance in dignity befitting his position as an envoy and said in Latin, The past night a certain cavalier was seized on this shore. I have come to ask for him. 
I cannot speak Latin, answered the officer. Ignoramus, muttered Zagwaba. The officer turned then to Pan Andrei. The king is in the farther end of the camp. Be pleased, gentlemen, to stay here. I will go and announce you. And he turned his horse. The envoys looked around. The camp was very spacious, for it embraced the whole triangle formed by the San and the Vistula. At the summit of the triangle lay Pniev, at the base Tarnobzheg on one side and Rozvadov on the other. Apparently it was impossible to take in the whole extent at a glance. Still, as far as the eye could reach were to be seen trenches, embankments, earthworks and fascines at which were cannons and men. In the very centre of the place, in Gorzitsa, were the quarters of the king. There also the main forces of the army. If hunger does not drive them out of this place, we can do nothing with them, said Kmichitz. The whole region is fortified. There is pasture for horses. But there are not fish for so many mouths, said Zagwaba. Lutherans do not like fasting food. Not long since they had all Poland, now they have this wedge. Let them sit here in safety or go back to Yaroslav. Very skilful men made these trenches, added Vordiovsky, looking with the eye of a specialist on the work. We have more swordsmen, but fewer learned officers, and in military art we are behind others. Why is that? asked Zagwaba. Why? It does not beseem me as a soldier who has served all his life in the cavalry to say this, but everywhere infantry and cannon are the main thing. Hence those campaigns and military manoeuvres, marches and countermarches. A man in a foreign army must devour a multitude of books and turn over a multitude of Roman authors before he becomes a distinguished officer. But there is nothing of that with us. Cavalry rushes into the smoke in a body and shaves with its sabres, and if it does not shave off in a minute, then they shave it off. You speak soundly, Pan Mihal, but what nation has won so many famous victories? Yes, because others in old times warred in the same way, and not having the same impetus they were bound to lose. But now they have become wiser, and see what they are doing. Wait for the end. Place for me now the wisest Swedish or German engineer, and against him I will put Roch, who has never turned over books, and let us see. If you could put him, interrupted Kmichitz. True, true, I am terribly sorry for him. Pan Andrei, jabber a little in that dog's language of those breeches fellows, and ask what has happened to Rock. You do not know regular soldiers. Here no man will open his lips to you without an order. They are stingy of speech. I know that they are surly scoundrels. While if to our nobles, and especially to the general militia, an envoy comes, immediately talk, talk, they will drink goralka with him, and will enter into political discussion with him, and see how these fellows stand there like posts, and bulge out their eyes at us. I wish they would smother to the last man. In fact, more and more foot soldiers gathered around the envoys, looking at them curiously. The envoys were dressed so carefully in elegant and even rich garments that they made an imposing appearance. Zagwaba arrested most attention, for he bore himself with almost senatorial dignity. Vorovsky was less considered by reason of his stature. Meanwhile, the officer who received them first on the bank returned with another of higher rank and with soldiers leading horses. The superior officer bowed to the envoys and said in Polish, His Royal Grace asks you, gentlemen, to his quarters, and since they are not very near, we have brought horses. Are you a Pole? asked Zagwaba. No, I am a Czech, Sadowski, in the Swedish service. Kmichitz approached him at once. Do you know me? Sadovsky looked at him quickly. Of course, at Chenstohova you blew up the largest siege gun, and Miller gave you to Kuklinovsky, 
I greet you, greet you heartily as a famous knight. And what is going on with Kuklinovsky? asked Kmichits. But do you not know? I know that I paid him with that with which he wanted to treat me, but I left him alive. He died. I thought he would freeze to death, said Pan Andrei, waving his hand. Worthy Colonel, put in Zagoba, have you not a certain Rok Kowalski? Sadovsky laughed. Of course. Praise be to God and the Most Holy Lady. The lad is alive and I shall get him. Praise be to God. I do not know whether the king will be willing to yield him up, said Sadovsky. But why not? Because he has pleased him greatly. He recognized him at once as the same man who had pushed after him with such vigor at Rudnik. We held our sides listening to the narrative of the prisoner. The king asked, Why did you pick me out? And he answered, I made a vow. Then the king asked again, But will you do so again? Of course, answered the prisoner. The king began to laugh. Put away your vow, said he, and I will give you your life and freedom. Impossible. Why? For my uncle would proclaim me a fool. And are you so sure that you could manage me in a hand-to-hand -hand fight? Oh, I could manage five men like you, said he. Then the king asked again, And do you dare to raise your hand against majesty? Yes, said he, for you have a vile faith. They interpreted every word to the king, and he was more and more pleased and continued to repeat, This man has pleased me. Then wishing to see whether in truth he had such strength, he gave orders to choose twelve of the strongest men in camp and bring them to wrestle in turn with the prisoner. But he is a muscular fellow. When I came away, he had stretched out ten, one after another, and not a man of them could rise again. We shall arrive just at the end of the amusement. I recognize Roch, my blood, said Zagwaba. We will give for him even three famous officers. You will find the king in good humor, said Sadovsky, which is a rare thing nowadays. Oh, I believe that, answered the little knight. Meanwhile, Sadovsky turned to Kmichits and asked how he had not only freed himself from Kuklinovsky, but put an end to him. Kmichits told him in detail. Sadovsky, while listening, seized his own head with amazement. At last he pressed Kmichits's hand again and said, Believe me, I am sincerely glad, for though I serve the Swedes, every true soldier's heart rejoices when a real cavalier puts down a ruffian. I must acknowledge to you that when a daring man is found among you, one must look with a lantern through the universe to find his equal. You are a courteous officer, said Zagwoba. And a famous soldier, we know that, added Vordiovsky. I learned courtesy and the soldier's art from you, answered Sadovsky, touching his cap. Thus they conversed, vying with one another in courtesy, till they reached Gorzitsa, where the king's quarters were. The whole village was occupied by soldiers of various arms. Our envoys looked with curiosity at the groups scattered among the fences. Some, wishing to sleep away their hunger, were dozing around cottages, for the day was very clear and warm. Some were playing dice on drums, drinking beer. Some were hanging their clothes on the fences. Others were sitting in front of the cottages, singing Scandinavian longs, rubbing with brick dust their breastplates and helmets, from which bright gleams went forth. In places they were cleaning horses or leading them out. In a word, Camp life was moving and seething under the bright sky. There were men, it is true, who bore signs of terrible toil and hunger, but the sun covered their leanness with gold. Besides, days of rest were beginning for those incomparable warriors. Therefore, they took courage at once and assumed a military bearing. Vorodyovsky admired them in spirit, especially the infantry regiments, famous through the whole world for endurance and bravery. Sadovsky gave explanations as they passed, saying, This is the Smaland Regiment of the Royal Guard. 
This is the infantry of Delicalia, the very best. In God's name, what little monsters are these? cried Zagwaba on a sudden, pointing to a group of small men with olive complexions and black hair hanging on both sides of their heads. Those are Laplanders who belong to the remotest Hyperboreans. Are they good in battle? It seems to me that I might take three in each hand and strike with their heads till I was tired. You could surely do so. They are useless in battle. The Swedes bring them for camp servants and partly as a curiosity. But they are the most skillful of wizards. Each of them has at least one devil in his service and some have five. How do they get such friendship with evil spirits? asked Kmichitz, making the sign of the cross. Because they wander in night, which with them lasts half a year or more, and you know that it is easier to hold converse with the devil at night. But have they souls? It is unknown, but I think that they are more in the nature of animals. Kmichitz turned his horse, caught one of the Laplanders by the shoulders, raised him up like a cat and examined him curiously. Then he put him on his feet and said, If the king would give me one such, I would give orders to have him dried and hung up in the church in Orsha, where, among other curiosities, are ostrich eggs. In Wubnia, at the parish church, there were jaws of a whale or even of a giant, said Vordiovsky. Let us go on, for something evil will fall on us here, said Zagwaba. Let us go, repeated Sadovsky. To tell the truth, I ought to have had bags put on your heads, as is the custom, but we have nothing here to hide, and that you have looked on the trenches is all the better for us. They spurred on their horses, and after a while were before the castle at Gorzitsa. In front of the gate they sprang from their saddles and advanced on foot, for the king was before the house. They saw a large number of generals and very celebrated officers. Old Wittenberg was there, Douglas, Lohenhaupt, Miller, Ericsson, and many others. All were sitting on the balcony, a little behind the king, whose chair was pushed forward, and they looked on the amusement which Karl Gustav was giving himself with the prisoner. Roch had just stretched out the twelfth cavalier, and was in a coat torn by the wrestlers, panting and sweating greatly. When he saw his uncle in company with Kmichitz and Vordiovsky, he thought at once that they too were prisoners. He stared at them, opened his mouth, and advanced a couple of steps, but Zagwaba gave him a sign with his hand to stand quietly, and the envoy stood himself with his comrades before the face of the king. Sadovsky presented the envoys. They bowed low, as custom and etiquette demanded. Then Zagwaba delivered Charnetsky's letter. The king took the letter and began to read. Meanwhile, the Polish envoys looked at him with curiosity, for they had never seen him before. He was a man in the flower of his age, as dark in complexion as though born an Italian or a Spaniard. His long hair, black as a raven's wing, fell behind his ears to his shoulders. In brightness and colour his eyes brought to mind Yeremi Vishnyovetsky. His brows were greatly elevated, as if he were in continual astonishment. In the place where the brows approached, his forehead was raised in a large protuberance, which made him resemble a lion. A deep wrinkle above his nose, which did not leave him even when he was laughing, gave his face a threatening and wrathful expression. His lower lip protruded like that of Jan Kazimir, but his face was heavier and his chin larger. He wore moustaches in the form of cords, brushed out somewhat at the ends. In general, his face indicated an uncommon man, one of those who, when they walk over the earth, press blood out of it. There was in him grandeur, the pride of a monarch, the strength of a lion, and the quickness of genius. But though a kindly smile never left his mouth, there was lacking that kindness of heart which illuminates a face from within with a mild light, as a lamp placed in the middle of an alabaster urn lights it. 
he sat in the armchair with crossed legs, the powerful calves of which were indicated clearly from under the black stockings, and blinking as was his wont, he read with a smile the letter from Charnyetsky. Raising his lids, he looked at Pan Mihao and said, I knew you at once, you slew Kanneberg. All eyes were turned immediately on Vordyovsky, who, moving his moustaches, bowed and answered, At the service of your royal grace. What is your office? asked the king. Colonel of the Louder Squadron. Where did you serve before? With the voivode of Vilno. And did you leave him with the others? You betrayed him and me. I was bound to my own king, not to your royal grace. The king said nothing. All foreheads were frowning, eyes began to bore into Pan Mihal, but he stood calmly, merely moving his moustaches time after time. All at once the king said, It is pleasant for me to know such a famous cavalier. Canneberg passed among us as incomparable in hand-to-hand -hand conflict. You must be the first saver in the kingdom? In universo, in the universe, said Zagwaba. Not the last, answered Vordyovsky. I greet you, gentlemen, heartily. For Pan Chanyetsky I have a real esteem as for a great soldier, though he broke his word to me, for he ought to be sitting quietly till now in Cheviege. Your Royal Grace, said Kmichits, Pan Chanyetsky was not the first to break his word, but General Miller, who seized Wolf's regiment of Royal Infantry. Miller advanced a step, looked in the face of Kmichits, and began to whisper something to the king, who, blinking all the time, listened attentively. Looking at Pan Andrei, he said at last, I see that Pan Charnitsky has sent me chosen cavaliers. I know from of old that there is no lack of daring men among you, but there is a lack of faith in keeping promises and oaths. Holy are the words of your royal grace, answered Zagwaba. How do you understand that? If it were not for this vice of our people, your royal grace would not be here. The king was silent a while. The generals again frowned at the boldness of the envoys. Yan Kajime himself freed you from the oath, said Karl, for he left you and took refuge abroad. From the oath we can be freed only by the vicar of Christ, who resides in Rome, and he has not freed us. A truce to that, said the king. I have acquired the kingdom by this. Here he struck his sword, and by this I will hold it. I do not need your suffrages nor your oaths. You want war, you will have it. I think that Pan Chanyetsky remembers Gowombiet. He forgot it on the road from Yaroslav, answered Zagwaba. The king, instead of being angry, smiled. I'll remind him of it. God rules the world. Tell him to visit me. I shall be glad to receive him, but he must hurry, for as soon as my horses are in condition, I shall march farther. Then we shall receive your royal grace, said Zagwaba, bowing and placing his hand slightly on his sabre. I see, said the king, that Pan Charnyetsky has sent in the embassy not only the best sabres, but the best mouth. In a moment you parry every thrust. It is lucky that the war is not of words, for I should find an opponent worthy of my power. But I will come to the question. Pan Charnyetsky asks me to liberate this prisoner, offering two officers of distinction in return. I do not set such a low price on my soldiers as you think, and I have no wish to redeem them too cheaply. That would be against my own and their ambition. But since I can refuse Pan Charnyetsky nothing, I will make him a present of this cavalier. Gracious Lord, answered Zagwaba, Pan Chanitsky did not wish to show contempt for Swedish officers, but compassion for me, for this is my sister's son, and I, at the service of your royal grace, am Pan Chanitsky's adviser. 
In truth, said the king, I ought not to let the prisoner go, for he has made a vow against me, unless he will give up his vow in view of this favour. Here he turned to Roch, who was standing in front of the porch, and beckoned. But come nearer, you strong fellow. Roch approached a couple of steps and stood erect. Sadovsky, said the king, ask him if he will let me go in case I free him. Sadovsky repeated the king's question. Impossible, cried Roch. The king understood without an interpreter and began to clap his hands and blink. Well, well, how can I set such a man free? He has twisted the necks of twelve horsemen and promises me as the thirteenth. Good, good, the cavalier has pleased me. Is he Pan Chanitsky's adviser too? If he is, I will let him go all the more quickly. Keep your mouth shut, muttered Zagwaba to Roch. A truce to amusement, said the king suddenly. Take him and have still one more proof of my clemency. I can forgive as the lord of this kingdom, since such is my will and favour but I will not enter into terms with rebels. Here the king frowned, and the smile left his face. Whoso raises his hand against me is a rebel, for I am his lawful king. Only from kindness to you have I not punished hitherto as was proper. I have been waiting for you to come to your minds, but the hour will strike when kindness will be exhausted and the day of punishment will rise. Through your self-will and instability, the country is flaming with fire. Through your disloyalty, blood is flowing. But I tell you, the last days are passing. You do not wish to hear admonitions. You do not wish to obey laws. You will obey the sword and the gallows. Lightnings flashed in Karl's eyes. Zagwaba looked on him a while with amazement unable to understand whence that storm had come after fair weather. Finally, he too began to grow angry. Therefore, he bowed and said only, We thank your royal grace. Then he went off, and after him, Kmichits, Vordyovsky, and Roch Kowalski. Gracious, gracious, said Zagwaba, and before you can look around, he bellows in your ear like a bear beautiful end to an embassy. Others give honour with a cup at parting, but he with the gallows. Let him hang dogs, not nobles. Oh, my God, how grievously we have sinned against our king, who was a father, is a father, and will be a father, for there is a Jagiellon heart in him. And such a king traitors deserted, and went to make friendship with scarecrows from beyond the sea. We are served rightly, for we were not worthy of anything better. Gibbets, gibbets, he is fenced in, and we have squeezed him like curds in a bag, so that whey is coming out, and still he threatens with sword and gibbet. Wait a while. The Cossack caught a Tartar, and the Tartar has him by the head. It will be closer for you yet. Roch, I wanted to give you a slap on the face or fifty blows on a carpet, but I forgive you now, since you acted so like a cavalier and promised to hunt him still farther. Let me kiss you, for I am delighted with you. Uncle is still glad, said Roch. The gibbet and the sword, and he told that to my eyes, said Zagwaba again, after a while. You have protection. The wolf protects in the same fashion as sheep for his own eating. And when does he say that? Now, when there is goose skin on his own back. Let him take his Laplanders for counsellors, and with them seek Satan's aid. But the most holy lady will help us, as she did Pan Bobola in San Domiege, when powder threw him and his horse across the Vistula, and he was not hurt. He looked around to see where he was, and arrived in time to dine with the priest. With such help, we will pull them all by the necks like lobsters out of a wicker trap. End of chapter 34 Recording by David Granville Young
Chapter 35 of The Deluge, Volume 2. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Deluge, Volume 2, by Henrik Sienkiewicz, translated by Jeremiah Curtin, 1835-1906. Chapter 35 Almost twenty days passed. The king remained continually at the junction of the rivers, and sent couriers to fortresses and commands in every direction toward Krakow and Warsaw, with orders for all to hasten to him with assistance. They sent him also provisions by the Vistula in as great quantities as possible, but insufficient. After ten days, the Swedes began to eat horse flesh. Despair seized the king and the generals at thought of what would happen when the cavalry should lose their horses, and when there would be no beasts to draw cannon. From every side, too, there came unpleasant news. The whole country was blazing with war, as if someone had poured pitch over it and set fire. Inferior commands and garrisons could not hasten to give aid, for they were not able to leave the towns and villages. Lithuania, held hitherto by the iron hand of Pontus de Lagardie, rose as one man. Great Poland, which had yielded first of all, was the first to throw off the yoke and shone before the whole commonwealth as an example of endurance, resolve and enthusiasm. Parties of nobles and peasants rushed not only on the garrisons in villages, but even attacked towns. In vain did the Swedes take terrible vengeance on the country. In vain did they cut off the hands of prisoners. In vain did they send up villages in smoke, cut settlements to pieces, raise gibbets, bring instruments of torture from Germany to torture insurgents. Whoso had to suffer, suffered. Whoso had to die, died. But if he was a noble, he died with a sabre, if a peasant, with a scythe in his hand. And Swedish blood was flowing throughout all great Poland. The peasants were living in the forests, even women rushed to arms. Punishments merely roused vengeance and increased rage. Kulesha, Zhegotsky, and the voyevoda of Podlaski moved through the country like flames, and besides their parties, all the pine woods were filled with other parties. The fields lay untilled. Fierce hunger increased in the land, but it twisted most the entrails of the Swedes, for they were confined in towns behind closed gates, and could not go to the open country. At last, breath was failing in their bosoms. In Mazovia the condition was the same. There the Berkshire people, dwelling in forest gloom, came out of their wildernesses, blocked the roads, seized provisions and couriers. In Podlaski a numerous small nobility marched in thousands either to Sapieha or to Lithuania. Lubelski was in the hands of the Confederates. From the distant Russias came Tartars, and with them the Cossacks constrained to obedience. Therefore all were certain that if not in a week, in a month, if not in a month, in two, that river fork in which Carl Gustav had halted with the main army of the Swedes would be turned into one great tomb to the glory of the nation, a great lesson for those who would attack the Commonwealth. The end of the war was foreseen already, there were some who said that one way of salvation alone remained to Karl, to ransom himself and give Swedish Livland to the Commonwealth. But suddenly the fortune of Karl and the Swedes was bettered. Marienburg, besieged hitherto in vain, surrendered March 20 to Steinbock. His powerful and valiant army had then no occupation and could hasten to the rescue of the king. From another direction, the Mark Graf of Baden, having finished levies, was marching also to the river fork with ready forces, and soldiers yet unwearied. Both pushed forward, 
breaking up the smaller bands of insurgents, destroying, burning, slaying. Along the road they gathered in Swedish garrisons, took the smaller commands, and increased in power as a river increases the more it takes streams to its bosom. Tidings of the fall of Marienburg, of the army of Steinbock, and the march of the Markgraf of Baden came very quickly to the fork of the river, and grieved Polish hearts. Steinbock was still far away, but the Markgraf, advancing by forced marches, might soon come up and change the whole position at saint Domierge. The Polish leaders then held a council in which Czarniecki, Sapieha, Michał Radziwiłł, Witowski and Lubomirski, who had grown tired of being on the Vistula, took part. At this council it was decided that Sapieha, with the Lithuanian army, was to remain to watch Karl and prevent his escape. Czarniecki was to move against the Markgraf of Baden and meet him as quickly as possible. If God gave him victory, he would return to besiege Karl Gustav. Corresponding orders were given at once. Next morning the trumpets sounded to horse so quietly that they were barely heard. Czarniecki wished to depart unknown to the Swedes. At his recent campground, a number of unoccupied parties of nobles and peasants took position at once. They kindled fires and made an uproar so that the enemy might think that no one had left the place. But Czarniecki's squadrons moved out one after another. First marched the louder squadron, which by right should have remained with Sapieha, but since Czarniecki had fallen greatly in love with this squadron, the hetman was loath to take it from him. After the louder went the von Sovich squadron, chosen men led by an old soldier half of whose life had been passed in shedding blood. Then followed the squadron of Prince Dmitri Vishnyovetsky, under the same Shandorovsky who at Rudnik had covered himself with immeasurable glory. Then two regiments of Vitovsky's dragoons, two regiments of the Starosta of Yavorov, the famed Stapkovsky led one, then Charnetsky's own regiment, the King's regiment under Polonovsky and Lubomirsky's whole force. No infantry was taken because of haste, nor wagons, for the army went on horseback. All were drawn up together at Zavada in good strength and great willingness. Then Charnetsky himself went out in front, and after he had arranged them for the march, he withdrew his horse somewhat and let them pass so as to review well the whole force. The horse under him sniffed, threw up his head, and nodded as if wishing to greet the passing regiments, and the heart swelled in the castellan himself. A beautiful view is before him. As far as the eye reached, a river of horses, a river of stern faces of soldiers, welling up and down with the movement of the horses. Above them, still a third river of sabres and lances, glittering and gleaming in the morning sun. A tremendous power went forth from them, and Charnetsky felt the power in himself. For that was not some kind of collection of volunteers, but men forged on the anvil of battle, trained, exercised, and in conflict so venomous that no cavalry on earth of equal numbers could withstand them. Therefore, Charnetsky felt with certainty, without doubt, that he would bear asunder with sabres and hoofs the army of the Mark Ruff of Baden, and that victory, felt in advance, made his face so radiant that it gleamed on the regiments. "'With God to victory!' cried he at last. "'With God we will conquer!' answered mighty voices. And that shout flew through all the squadrons like deep thunder through clouds. Charnetsky spurred his horse to come up with the louder squadron, marching in the van. The army moved forward. They advanced not like men, but like a flock of ravening birds, which, having wind of a battle from afar, fly to outstrip the tempest. Never, even among Tartars in the steppes, had any man heard of such a march. The soldiers slept in the saddles. They ate and drank without dismounting. They fed the horses from their hands. Rivers, 
forests, villages were left behind them. Scarcely had peasants hurried out from their cottages to look at the army when the army had vanished behind clouds of dust in the distance. They marched day and night, resting only just enough to escape killing the horses. At Kozienica they came upon eight Swedish squadrons under Torneskjold. The louder men, marching in the van, first saw the enemy, and without even drawing breath, sprang at them straightway and into the fire. Next advanced Shandarovsky, then von Sovich, and then Stapkovsky. The Swedes, thinking that they had to deal with some mere common parties, met them in the open field, and two hours later there was not a living man left to go to the Mark Graf and tell him that Czarniecki was coming. Those eight squadrons were simply swept asunder on sabres without leaving a witness of defeat. Then the Poles moved straight on to Magnushev, for spies informed them that the Markgraf was at Varka with his whole army. Vorodyovsky was sent in the night with a party to learn how the army was disposed and what its power was. Zagwoba complained greatly of that expedition, for even the famed Vishnyovitsky had never made such marches as this. Therefore the old man complained, but he chose to go with Pan Mihal rather than remain with the army. It was a golden time at saint Domier, said he, stretching himself in the saddle. A man ate, drank, and looked at the besieged Swedes in the distance. But now there is not time even to put a canteen into your mouth. I know the military arts of the ancients, of the great Pompey and Caesar, but Charnitsky has invented a new style. It is contrary to every rule to shake the stomach so many days and nights. The imagination begins to rebel in me from hunger, and it seems to me continually that the stars are buckwheat pudding and the moon cheese. To the dogs with such warfare! As God is dear to me, I want to gnaw my own horse's ears off from hunger. Tomorrow, God grant, we shall rest after finishing the Swedes. I would rather have the Swedes than this tediousness. O oh Lord, O oh Lord, when wilt thou give peace to this commonwealth, and to Zagwoba a warm place at the stove and heated beer, even without cream? Batter along, old man, on your nag, batter along till you batter your body to death. Has any one there snuff? Maybe I could sneeze out this sleepiness through my nostrils. The moon is shining through my mouth, looking into my stomach, but I cannot tell what the moon is looking for there. It will find nothing. I repeat, to the dogs with such warfare. If uncle thinks that the moon is cheese, then eat it, uncle, said Roch Kowalski. If I should eat you, I might say that I had eaten beef, but I am afraid that after such a roast I should lose the rest of my wit. If I am an ox, and uncle is my uncle, then what is uncle? But, you fool, do you think that Altea gave birth to a firebrand because she sat by the stove? How does that touch me? In this way, if you are an ox, then ask about your father first, not about your uncle. For a bull carried off Europa, but her brother, who was uncle to her children, was a man for all that. Do you understand? To tell the truth, I do not, but as to eating, I could eat something myself. Eat the devil and let me sleep. What is it, Pan Mihal? Why have we halted? Varka is in sight answered Vovodyovsky. See, the church tower is gleaming in the moonlight. But have we passed Magnushev? Magnushev is behind on the right. It is a wonder to me that there is no Swedish party on this side of the river. Let us go to those thickets and stop. Perhaps God may send us some informant. Pan Mihal led his detachment to the thicket and disposed it about a hundred yards from the road on each side ordering the men to remain silent and hold the bridles closely so the horses might not neigh. Wait, said he, let us hear what is being done on the other side of the river, and perhaps we may see something. They stood there waiting, but for a long time nothing was to be heard. 
the wearied soldiers began to nod in the saddles. Zagwoba dropped on the horse's neck and fell asleep. Even the horses were slumbering. An hour passed. The accurate ear of Vordyovsky heard something like the tread of a horse on a firm road. Hold! Silence! said he to the soldiers. He pushed out himself to the edge of the thicket and looked along the road. The road was gleaming in the moonlight like a silver ribbon. There was nothing visible on it. Still the sound of horses came nearer. They are coming, surely, said Vordyovsky. All held their horses more closely, each one restraining his breath. Meanwhile on the road appeared a Swedish party of thirty horsemen. They rode slowly and carelessly enough, not in line, but in a straggling row. Some of the soldiers were talking, others were singing in a low voice, for the night, warm as in May, acted on the ardent souls of the soldiers. Without suspicion, they passed near Pan Mihau, who was standing so hard by the edge of the thicket that he could catch the odour of horses and the smoke of pipes which the soldiers had lighted. At last they vanished at the turn of the road. Vorodyovsky waited till the tramp had died in the distance. Then only did he go to his men and say to Pan Yan and Pan Stanislav, Let us drive them now, like geese, to the camp of the Castellan. Not a man must escape, lest he give warning. If Charnyetsky does not let us eat, then sleep, said Zagwaba, I will resign his service and return to Sapio. With Sapio, when there is a battle, there is a battle. But when there is a respite, there is a feast. If you had four lips, he would give each one of them enough to do. He is the leader for me. And in truth, tell me by what devil are we not serving with Sapio, since this regiment belongs to him by right? Father, do not blaspheme against the greatest warrior in the Commonwealth, said Pan Yan. It is not I that blaspheme, but my entrails on which hunger is playing as on a fiddle... The Swedes will dance to the music, interrupted Vordyovsky. Now, gentlemen, let us advance quickly. I should like to come up with them exactly at that inn in the forest which we passed in coming hither. And he led on the squadron quickly, but not too quickly. They rode into a dense forest in which darkness enclosed them. The inn was less than two miles distant. When Vordyovsky had drawn near, he went again at a walk, so as not to alarm the Swedes too soon. When not more than a cannon shot away, the noise of the men was heard. They are there and making an uproar, said Pan Mihau. The Swedes had, in fact, stopped at the inn, looking for some living person to give information. But the place was empty. Some of the soldiers were shaking up the main building. Others were looking in the cowhouse, in the shed, or raising the thatch on the roof. One half of the men remained on the square, holding the horses of those who were searching. Pan Mihau's division approached within a hundred yards and began to surround the inn with a tartar crescent. Those of the Swedes standing in front heard perfectly, and at last saw men and horses. Since, however, it was dark in the forest, they could not see what kind of troops were coming. But they were not alarmed in the least, not admitting that others than Swedes could come from that point. At last the movement of the Crescent astonished and disturbed them. They called at once to those who were in the buildings. Suddenly a shout of Allah was heard, and the sound of shots. In one moment dark crowds of soldiers appeared, as if they had grown out of the earth. Now came confusion, a flash of sabres, oaths, smothered shouts, but the whole affair did not last longer than the time needed to say the Lord's Prayer twice. There remained on the ground before the inn five bodies of men and horses. Vordyovsky moved on, taking with him twenty-five prisoners. They advanced at a gallop, urging the Swedish horses with the sides of their sabres, and arrived at Magnushev at daybreak. In Charnetsky's camp no one was sleeping. All were ready. The castellan himself came out, leaning on his staff, thin and pale from watching. "'How is it?' asked he of Pan Mihau. "'Have you many informants?' Twenty-five prisoners.' 
Did many escape? All are taken. Only send you, soldier, even to hell. Well done. Take them at once to the torture. I will examine them. Then the castellan turned, and when departing said, But be in readiness, for perhaps we may move on the enemy without delay. How is that? asked Zagwaba. Be quiet, said Vorovsky. The prisoners, without being burned, told in a moment what they knew of the forces of the Markgraf, how many cannons he had, what infantry and cavalry. Charnetsky grew somewhat thoughtful, for he learned that it was really a newly levied army, but formed of the oldest soldiers, who had taken part in God knows how many wars. There were also many Germans among them, and a considerable division of French, the whole force exceeded that of the Poles by several hundred. But it appeared from the statements of the prisoners that the Markgraf did not even admit that Charnetsky was near, and believed that the Poles were besieging Karl Gustav with all their forces at Sandomierge. The castellan had barely heard this when he sprang up and cried to his attendant, Vitovsky, give command to sound the trumpet to horse. Half an hour later, the army moved and marched in the fresh spring morning through forests and fields covered with dew. At last Varka, or rather its ruins, for the place had been burned almost to the ground six years before, appeared on the horizon. Charnetsky's troops were marching over an open flat. Therefore they could not be concealed from the eyes of the Swedes. In fact they were seen, but the Markgraf thought that they were various parties which had combined in a body with the intent of alarming the camp. Only when squadron after squadron, advancing at a trot, appeared from beyond the forest, did a feverish activity rise in the Swedish camp. Charnitsky's men saw smaller divisions of horsemen and single officers hurrying between the regiments. The bright-coloured Swedish infantry began to pour into the middle of the plain. The regiments formed one after another before the eyes of the Poles and were numerous, resembling a flock of many-coloured birds. Over their heads were raised toward the sun quadrangles of strong spears with which the infantry shielded themselves against attacks of cavalry. Finally were seen crowds of Swedish armoured cavalry advancing at a trot along the wings. The artillery was drawn up and brought to the front in haste, all the preparations, all the movements were as visible as something on the palm of the hand, for the sun had risen clearly, splendidly, and lighted up the whole country. The Pilitsa separated the two armies. On the Swedish bank, trumpets and kettle drums were heard, and the shouts of soldiers coming with all speed into line. Charnetsky ordered also to sound the crooked trumpets, and advance with his squadrons toward the river. Then he rushed with all the breath of his horse to the von Sovich squadron, which was nearest the Pilitsa. Old soldier, cried he to von Sovich, advance for me to the bridge. There dismount and to muskets. Let all their force be turned on you. Lead on. Von Sovich merely flushed a little from desire and waved his baton. The men shouted and shot after him like a cloud of dust driven by wind. When they came within three hundred yards of the bridge, they slackened the speed of their horses. Then two-thirds of them sprang from the saddles and advanced on a run to the bridge. But the Swedes came from the other side, and soon muskets began to play, at first slowly, then every moment more briskly, as if a thousand flails were beating irregularly on a barn floor. Smoke stretched over the river. Shouts of encouragement were thundering from one and the other command. The minds of both armies were bent to the bridge, which was wooden, narrow, difficult to take, but easy to defend. Still, over this bridge alone was it possible to cross to the Swedes. A quarter of an hour later, Charnetsky pushed forward Lubomirsky's dragoons to the aid of Vonsovich. But the Swedes now attacked the opposite front with artillery. They drew up new pieces one after another, and bombs began to fly with a howl over the heads of von Sovich's men and the dragoons, to fall in the meadow and dig into the earth, scattering mud and turf on those fighting. 
The Markgraf, standing near the forest in the rear of the army, watched the battle through a field glass. From time to time he removed the glass from his eyes, looked at his staff, shrugged his shoulders and said with astonishment, They have gone mad. They want absolutely to force the bridge. A few guns and two or three regiments might defend it against a whole army. Von Sovich advanced still more stubbornly with his men. Hence the defence grew still more resolute. The bridge became the central point of the battle, toward which the whole Swedish line was approaching and concentrating. An hour later, the entire Swedish order of battle was changed, and they stood with flank to their former position. The bridge was simply covered with a rain of fire and iron. Von Sovich's men were falling thickly. Meanwhile, orders came more and more urgent to advance absolutely. Charnyetsky is murdering those men, cried Lubomirsky on a sudden. Vitovsky, as an experienced soldier, saw that evil was happening, and his whole body quivered with impatience. At last he could endure no longer. Spurring his horse till the beast groaned piteously, he rushed to Charnyetsky, who during all this time, it was unknown why, was pushing men toward the river. "'Your grace,' cried Vitovsky, "'blood is flowing for nothing. We cannot carry that bridge.' "'I do not want to carry it,' answered Charnyetsky. "'Then what does your grace want? What must we do?' "'To the river with the squadrons, to the river, and you to your place.' Here Charnyetsky's eyes flashed such lightnings that Vitovsky withdrew without saying a word. Meanwhile, the squadrons had come within twenty paces of the bank and stood in a long line parallel with the bed of the river. None of the officers or the soldiers had the slightest suspicion of what they were doing. In a flash, Charnyetsky appeared like a thunderbolt before the front of the squadrons. There was fire in his face, lightning in his eyes. A sharp wind had raised the burka on his shoulders so that it was like strong wings. His horse sprang and reared, casting fire from his nostrils. The castellan dropped his sword on its pennant, took the wrap from his head, and with hair erect shouted to his division, Gentlemen, the enemy defends himself with this water and jeers at us. He has sailed through the sea to crush our fatherland, and he thinks that we in defence of it cannot swim through this river. Here he hurled his cap to the earth, and seizing his sabre, pointed with it to the swollen waters. Enthusiasm bore him away, for he stood in the saddle and shouted more mightily still, To whom God, faith, fatherland are all, follow me! And pressing the horse with the spurs so that the steed sprang as it were into space, he rushed into the river. The wave plashed around him. Man and horse were hidden under water, but they rose in the twinkle of an eye. After my master, cried Mihauko, the same who had covered himself with glory at Rudnik, and he sprang into the water. After me, shouted Vordiovsky with a shrill but thin voice, and he sprang in before he had finished shouting. Oh, Jesus, oh, Mary, bellowed Zagwaba, raising his horse for the leap. With that, an avalanche of men and horses dashed into the river, so that it struck both banks with wild impetus. After the louder squadron went Vishnevitsky's, then Vitovsky's, then Stapkovsky's, after that all the others. Such a frenzy seized the men that the squadrons crowded one another in emulation. The shouts of command were mingled with the roar of the soldiers. The river overflowed the banks and foamed itself into milk in a moment. The current bore the regiments down somewhat, but the horses, pricked with spurs, swam like a countless herd of dolphins, snorting and groaning. They filled the river to such a degree that the mass of heads of horses and riders formed, as it were, a bridge on which a man might have passed with dry foot to the other bank. 
Charnyetsky swam over first, but before the water had dropped from him, the louder squadron had followed him to land. Then he waved his baton and cried to Vordyovsky, On a gallop! Strike! And to the Vishnyovitsky squadron under Shandarovsky, With them! And so he sent the squadrons one after another, till he had sent all. He stood at the head of the last himself and shouting, in the name of God, with luck, followed the others. Two regiments of Swedish cavalry posted in reserve saw what was happening, but such amazement had seized the colonels that before they could move from their tracks, the louder men, urging their horses to the highest speed and sweeping with irresistible force, struck the first regiment, scattered that as a whirlwind scatters leaves, hurled it against the second, brought that to disorder. Then Shandarovsky came up, and a terrible slaughter began, but of short duration. After a while, the Swedish ranks were broken, and a disordered throng plunged forward toward the main army. Charnyetsky's squadron pursued them with a fearful outcry, slashing, thrusting, strewing the field with corpses. At last it was clear why Charnyetsky had commanded von Sovich to carry the bridge, though he had no thought of crossing it. The chief attention of the whole army had been concentrated on that point. Therefore, no one defended, or had time to defend, the river itself. Besides, nearly all the artillery and the entire front of the Swedish army was turned toward the bridge, and now when 3,000 cavalry were rushing with all impetus against the flank of that army, it was needful to change the order of battle to form a new front, to defend themselves even well or ill against the shock. Now rose a terrible haste and confusion. Infantry and cavalry regiments turned with all speed to face the enemy, straining themselves in their hurry, knocking one against another, not understanding commands in the uproar, acting independently. In vain did the officers make superhuman efforts. In vain did the Markgraf move straightway the regiments of cavalry posted at the forest, before they came to any kind of order, before the infantry could put the butt-ends of their lances in the ground to hold the points to the enemy, the louder squadron fell, like the spirit of death, into the very midst of their ranks. After it a second, a third, a fourth, a fifth, and a sixth squadron. Then began the day of judgment. The smoke of musketry fire covered, as if with a cloud, the whole scene of conflict. And in that cloud, screams, seething, unearthly voices of despair, shouts of triumph, the sharp clang of steel. As if in an infernal forge, the rattling of muskets. At times a flag shone and fell in the smoke, then the gilded point of a regimental banner, and again you saw nothing. But a roar was heard more and more terrible, as if the earth had broken on a sudden under the river, and its waters were tumbling down into fathomless abysses. Now on the flank other sounds were heard. This was von Sovich, who had crossed the bridge and was marching on the new flank of the enemy. After this, the battle did not last long. From out that cloud, large groups of men began to push and run toward the forest in disorder, wild, without caps, without helmets, without armour. Soon after them burst out a whole flood of people in the most dreadful disorder. Artillery, infantry, cavalry, mingled together, fled toward the forest at random, in alarm and terror. Some soldiers cried in sky-piercing voices, others fled in silence, covering their heads with their hands. Some, in their haste, threw away their clothing, others stopped those running ahead, fell down themselves, trampled one another, and right there behind them, on their shoulders and heads, rushed a line of Polish cavaliers. Every moment you saw whole ranks of them spurring their horses and rushing into the densest throngs of men. No one defended himself longer. All went under the sword. Body fell upon body. The poles hewed without rest, without mercy, on the whole plain, 
Along the bank of the river toward the forest, as far as the eye could reach, you saw merely pursued and pursuing. Only here and there, scattered groups of infantry offered an irregular, despairing resistance. The cannons were silent. The battle ceased to be a battle. It had turned into a slaughter. All that part of the army which fled toward the forest was cut to pieces. Only a few squadrons of Swedish troopers entered it. After them, the light squadrons of Poles sprang in among the trees. But in the forest, peasants were waiting for that unslain remnant, the peasants who at the sound of the battle had rushed together from all the surrounding villages. The most terrible pursuit, however, continued on the road to Warsaw, along which the main forces of the Swedes were fleeing. The young Mark Graf Adolf struggled twice to cover the retreat, but beaten twice, he fell into captivity himself. His auxiliary division of French infantry, composed of 400 men, threw away their arms. 3,000 chosen soldiers, musketeers and cavalry fled as far as Nishev. The musketeers were cut down in Nishev, the cavalry were pursued toward Chesk until they were scattered completely through the forest, reeds and brush. There the peasants hunted them out one by one on the morrow. Before the sun had set, the army of Friedrich, Mark Graf of Baden, had ceased to exist. On the first scene of battle there remained only the standard bearers with their standards, for all the troops had followed the enemy, and the sun was well inclined to its setting when the first bodies of cavalry began to appear from the side of the forest and Mnishev. They returned with singing and uproar, hurling their caps in the air, firing from pistols. Almost all led with them crowds of bound prisoners. These walked at the sides of the horses. They were without caps, without helmets, with heads drooping on their breasts, torn, bloody, stumbling every moment against the bodies of fallen comrades. The field of battle presented a terrible sight. In places where the struggle had been fiercest, there lay simply piles of bodies half a spear length in height. Some of the infantry still held in their stiffened hands long spears. The whole ground was covered with spears. In places they were sticking still in the earth. Here and there pieces of them formed as it were fences and pickets. But on all sides was presented mostly a dreadful and pitiful mingling of bodies, of men mashed with hoofs, broken muskets, drums, trumpets, caps, belts, tin boxes which the infantry carried, hands and feet sticking out in such disorder from the piles of bodies that it was difficult to tell to what body they belonged. In those places specially where the infantry defended itself, whole breastworks of corpses were lying. Somewhat farther on, near the river, stood the artillery, now cold, some pieces overturned by the onrush of men, others, as it were, ready to be fired. At the sides of them lay the cannoneers, now held in eternal sleep. Many bodies were hanging across the guns and embracing them with their arms, as if those soldiers wished still to defend them after death. The brass, spotted with blood and brains, glittered with ill omen in the beams of the setting sun. The golden rays were reflected in stiffened blood, which here and there formed little lakes. Its nauseating odour was mingled over the whole field with the smell of powder, the exhalation from bodies, and the sweat of horses. Before the setting of the sun, Charnyetsky returned with the king's regiment and stood in the middle of the field. The troops greeted him with a thundering shout. Whenever a detachment came up, it cheered without end. He stood in the rays of the sun, wearied beyond measure, but all radiant, with bare head, his sword hanging on his belt, and he answered to every cheer, Not to me, gentlemen, not to me, but to the name of God. At his side were Vitovsky and Lubomirsky, the latter as bright as the sun itself. 
for he was in gilded plate armour, his face splashed with blood, for he had worked terribly and laboured with his own hand as a simple soldier, but discontented and gloomy, for even his own regiments shouted, Vivat Charnetsky, Dux et Victor, Commander and Conqueror. Envy began then to dive into the soul of the marshal. Meanwhile, new divisions rolled in from every side of the field. Each time an officer came up and threw a banner captured from the enemy at Charnetsky's feet. At sight of this rose new shouts, new cheers, hurling of caps into the air and the firing of pistols. The sun was sinking lower and lower. Then, in the one church that remained after the fire in Varka, they sounded the Angelus. That moment all uncovered their heads. Father Piekarski, the company priest, began to intone, The angel of the Lord announced unto the most holy Virgin Mary, and a thousand iron breasts answered at once with deep voices, And she conceived of the Holy Ghost. All eyes were raised to the heavens, which were red with the evening twilight, and from that bloody battlefield began to rise a pious hymn to the light playing in the sky before night. Just as they had ceased to sing, the louder squadron began to come up at a trot. It had chased the enemy farthest. The soldiers threw more banners at Charnitsky's feet. He rejoiced in heart, and seeing Vordiovsky, urged his horse toward him and asked, Have many of them escaped? Pan Mihal shook his head as a sign that not many had escaped, but he was so near being breathless that he was unable to utter one word. He merely gasped with open mouth time after time, so that his breast was heaving. At last he pointed to his lips as a sign that he could not speak. Charnetsky understood him and pressed his head. He has toiled, said he. God grant us more such. Zagwoba hurried to catch his breath and said with chattering teeth and broken voice, For God's sake, the cold wind is blowing on me and I am all in a sweat. Paralysis will strike me. Pull the clothes off some fat Swede and give them to me, for everything on me is wet. Wet, and it is wet in this place. I know not what is water, what is my own sweat, and what is Swedish blood. If I have ever expected in my life to cut down so many of those scoundrels, I am not fit to be the crupper of a saddle, the greatest victory of this war. But I will not spring into water a second time, eat not, drink not, sleep not, and then a bath. I have had enough in my old years. My hand is benumbed. Paralysis has struck me already. Gorylka for the dear God. Charnetsky, hearing this, and seeing the old man really covered completely with the blood of the enemy, took pity on his age and gave him his own canteen. Zagwaba raised it to his mouth, and after a while returned it empty. Then he said, I have gulped so much water in the Pilitsa that we shall soon see how fish will hatch in my stomach, but that Gorylka is better than water. Dress in other clothes, even Swedish, said Charnetsky. I'll find a big Swede for uncle, said Roch. Why should I have bloody clothes from a corpse, said Zagoba. Take off everything to the shirt from that general whom I captured. Have you taken a general? asked Charnetsky with animation. Whom have I not taken? Whom have I not slain? answered Zagoba. Now Vorodyovsky recovered speech. We have taken the younger Mark Graf, Adolf, Count Falkenstein, General Wengier, General Potter, Benzi, not counting inferior officers. But the Mark Graf Friedrich, asked Charnetsky. If he has not fallen here, he has escaped to the forest. But if he has escaped, the peasants will kill him. Vorodyovsky was mistaken in his provisions. The Mark Graf Friedrich, with Counts Schlippenbach and Ehrenhain, wandering through the forest, made their way in the night to Chersk. 
After sitting there in the ruined castle three days and nights in hunger and cold, they wandered by night to Warsaw. That did not save them from captivity afterward. This time, however, they escaped. It was night when Czarnecki came to Varka from the field. That was perhaps the gladdest night of his life, for such a great disaster the Swedes had not suffered since the beginning of the war. All the artillery, all the flags, all the officers, except the chief, were captured. The army was cut to pieces, driven to the four winds. The remnants of it were forced to fall victims to bands of peasants. But besides, it was shown that those Swedes who held themselves invincible could not stand before regular Polish squadrons in the open field. Czarniecki understood at last what a mighty result this victory would work in the whole Commonwealth. How it would raise courage, how it would rouse enthusiasm. He saw already the whole Commonwealth, in no distant future, free from oppression, triumphant. Perhaps, too, he saw with the eyes of his mind the gilded baton of the great hetman on the sky. He was permitted to dream of this, for he had advanced toward it as a true soldier, as a defender of his country, and he was of those who grow not from salt nor from the soil, but from that which pains them. Meanwhile, he could hardly embrace with his whole soul the joy which flowed in upon him. Therefore, he turned to Lubomirsky, riding at his side, and said, Now to San Domierge, to San Domierge with all speed, since the army knows now how to swim rivers, neither the San nor the Vistula will frighten us. Lubomirsky said not a word. But Zagwoba, riding a little apart in Swedish uniform, permitted himself to say aloud, Go where you like, but without me, for I am not a weathercock to turn night and day without food or sleep. Charnyetsky was so rejoiced that he was not only not angry, but he answered in jest, You are more like the belfry than the weathercock, since, as I see, you have sparrows in your head. But as to eating and rest, it belongs to all. To which Zagwoba said, but in an undertone, Whoso has a beak on his face has a sparrow on his mind. End of chapter 35 Recording by David Granville Young Chapter 36 of The Deluge, Volume 2 This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Deluge, Volume 2, by Henrik Sienkiewicz, translated by Jeremiah Curtin, 1835-1906. Chapter 36 After that victory, Czarnecki permitted at last the army to take breath and feed the wearied horses. Then he was to return to Sandomierz by forced marches and bend the King of Sweden to his fall. Meanwhile, Harwamp came to the camp one evening with news from Sapieha. Czarniecki was at Chersk, whither he had gone to review the general militia assembled at that town. Harwamp, not finding the chief, betook himself at once to Pan Michał, so as to rest at his quarters after the long journey. His friends greeted him joyously, but he, at the very beginning, showed them a gloomy face and said, I have heard of your victory. Fortune smiled here, but bore down on us in Sandomierz. Karl Gustav is no longer in the sack, for he got out, and besides, with great confusion to the Lithuanian troops. Can that be? cried Pan Michał, seizing his head. Pan Jan, Pan Stanisław and Zagwoba were as if fixed to the earth. How was it? Tell by the living God, for I cannot stay in my skin. Breath fails me yet, said Harwamp. I have ridden day and night. I am terribly tired. Czarniecki will come, then I will tell all from the beginning. Let me now draw breath a little. Then Karl has gone out of the sack. 
I foresaw that, did I not? Do you not remember that I prophesied it? Let Kowalski testify. Uncle foretold it, said Roch. And whither has Karl gone? asked Pan Mihau. The infantry sailed down in boats, but he, with cavalry, has gone along the Vistula to Warsaw. Was there a battle? There was and there was not. In brief, give me peace, for I cannot talk. But tell me one thing, is Sapieha crushed altogether? How crushed? He is pursuing the king, but of course Sapieha will never come up with anybody. He is as good at pursuit as a German at fasting, said Zagoba. Praise be to God for even this, that the army is intact, put in Vordyovsky. The Lithuanians have got into trouble, said Zagoba. Ah, it is a bad case. Again, we must watch a hole in the Commonwealth together. Say nothing against the Lithuanian army, said Harwamp. Karl Gustav is a great warrior, and it is no wonder to lose against him. And did not you, from Poland, lose at Ushche, at Volborg, at Suleyov, and in ten other places? Czarniecki himself lost at Gowom. Why should not Sapieha lose, especially when you left him alone like an orphan? But why did we go to a dance at Varka? asked Zagwaba with indignation. I know that it was not a dance, but a battle, and God gave you the victory. But who knows, perhaps it had been better not to go. For among us they say that the troops of both nations, Lithuanian and Poland, may be beaten separately, but together the cavalry of hell itself could not manage them. That may be, said Vovodyovsky, but what the leaders have decided is not for us to discuss. This did not happen either without your fault. Sapio must have blundered. I know him, said Zagwaba. I cannot deny that, muttered Harwamp. They were silent a while, but from time to time looked at one another gloomily, for to them it seemed that the fortune of the Commonwealth was beginning to sink, and yet such a short time before they were full of hope and confidence. Charnyetsky is coming, said Vordyovsky, and he went out of the room. The castellan was really returning. Vordyovsky went to meet him and began to call from a distance. The king of Sweden has broken through the Lithuanian army and escaped from the sack. There is an officer here with letters from the voevoda of Vilno. Bring him here, cried Charnyetsky. Where is he? With me. I will present him at once. Charnyetsky took the news so much to heart that he would not wait, but sprang at once from his saddle and entered Vorodyovsky's quarters. All rose when they saw him enter. He barely nodded and said, I ask for the letter. Harwamp gave him a sealed letter. The castellan went to the window, for it was dark in the cottage, and began to read with frowning brow and anxious face. From instant to instant, anger gleamed on his countenance. The castellan has changed, whispered Zagwaba to Pan Yan. See how his beak has grown red. He will begin to lisp right away. He always does when in anger. Charnyetsky finished the letter. For a time he twisted his beard with his whole hand. At last he called out with a jingling, indistinct voice, Come this way, officer! At command of your worthiness. Tell me the truth, said Charnyetsky with emphasis, for this narrative is so artfully put together that I am unable to get at the affair. But tell me the truth, do not colour it. Is the army dispersed? Not dispersed at all, your grace. How many days are needed to assemble it? Here Zagwaba whispered to Pan Yan, he wants to come at him from the left hand, as it were. But Harwamp answered without hesitation, since the army is not dispersed, it does not need to be assembled. It is true that when I was leaving, about 500 horse of the general militia could not be found, were not among the fallen. But that is a common thing, and the army does not suffer from that. The hetman has even moved after the king in good order. You have lost no cannon? 
Yes, we lost four, which the Swedes, not being able to take with them, spiked. I see that you tell the truth. Tell me then how everything happened. In Sipiam, I will begin, said Harwamp. When we were left alone, the enemy saw that there was no army on the Vistula, nothing but parties and irregular detachments. We thought, or properly speaking, Pan Sapieha thought, that the king would attack those, and he sent reinforcements, but not considerable so as not to weaken himself. Meanwhile, there was a movement and a noise among the Swedes, as in a beehive. Toward evening, they began to come out in crowds to the sun. We were at the Voivoda's quarters. Pan Kmichitz, who is called Babinich now, a soldier of the first degree, came up and reported this. But Pan Sapieha was just sitting down to a feast to which a multitude of noble women from Krushnik and Yanov had assembled, for the Voivoda is fond of the fair sex. And he loves feasting, interrupted Charnetsky. I am not with him. There is no one to incline him to temperance, put in Zagoba. Maybe you will be with him sooner than you think. Then you can both begin to be temperate, retorted Charnetsky. Then he turned to Harwamp. Speak on. Babinich reported, and the voyevoda answered, They are only pretending to attack. They will undertake nothing. First, said he, they will try to cross the Vistula, but I have an eye on them, and I will attack myself. At present, said he, we will not spoil our pleasure, so that we may have a joyous time. We will eat and drink. The music began to tear away, and the voyevoda invited those present to the dance. I'll give him dancing, interrupted Zagwaba. Silence, if you please, said Charnetsky. Again, men rush in from the bank, saying that there is a terrible uproar. That's nothing, the voyevoda whispered to the page. Do not interrupt me. We danced till daylight, we slept till midday. At midday, we see that the entrenchments are bristling, 48-pound guns on them, and the Swedes fire from time to time. When a ball falls, it is the size of a bucket. It is nothing for such a one to fill the eyes with dust. Give no embellishments, interrupted Charnetsky. You are not with the hetman. Harwap was greatly confused and continued, At midday, the voyevoda himself went out. The Swedes, under cover of these trenches, began to build a bridge. They worked till evening, to our great astonishment, for we thought that as to building, they would build, but as to crossing, they would not be able to do that. Next day, they built on. The voyevoda put the troops in order, for he expected a battle. All this time the bridge was a pretext, and they crossed lower down over another bridge and turned your flank, interrupted Charnetsky. Harwamp stared and opened his mouth. He was silent in amazement, but at last said, Then your worthiness has had an account already. No need of that, said Zagwaba. Our grandfather guesses everything concerning war on the wing, as if he had seen it, in fact. Speak on, said Charnetsky. Evening came. The troops were in readiness, but with the first star there was a feast again. This time the Swedes passed over the second bridge lower down and attacked us at once. The squadron of Pan Koshitz, a good soldier, was at the edge. He rushed on them. The general militia, which was next to him, sprang to his aid. But when the Swedes spat at them from the guns, they took to their heels. Pan Koshitz was killed and his men terribly cut up. Now the general militia, rushing back in a crowd on the camp, put everything in disorder. All the squadrons that were ready advanced, but we effected nothing, lost cannon besides. If the king had had more cannon and infantry, our defeat would have been severe. But fortunately, the greater number of the infantry regiments with the cannon had sailed away in boats during the night. Of this, no one of us knew. Sapio has blundered. I knew it beforehand, cried Zagwaba. We got the correspondence of the king, added Harwam, which the Swedes dropped. The soldiers read in it that the king is to go to Prussia to return with the elector's forces, for, he writes, that with Swedish troops alone he cannot succeed. 
I know of that, said Charnyetsky. Pan Sapir has sent me that letter. Then he muttered quietly as if speaking to himself. We must follow him to Prussia. That is what I have been saying this long time, put in Zagwaba. Charnyetsky looked at him for a while in thoughtfulness. It is unfortunate, said he aloud, for if I had returned to Sandomierge, the hetman and I should not have let a foot of them out alive. Well, it has passed and will not return. The war will be longer, but death is fated to this invasion and to these invaders. It cannot be otherwise, cried the knights in chorus, and great consolation entered their hearts, though a short time before they had doubted. Meanwhile, Zagwaba whispered something in Zhenjian's ear. He vanished through the door and soon returned with a decanter. Seeing this, Vodiovsky inclined to the knee of the castellan. It would be an uncommon favour for a simple soldier, he began. I will drink with you willingly, said Charnyetsky. And do you know why? Because we must part. How is that? cried the astonished Pan Mihal. Sapieha writes that the Lauda squadron belongs to the Lithuanian army, and that he sent it only to assist the forces of the kingdom, that now he will need it himself, especially the officers, of whom he has a great lack. My Vodiovsky, you know how much I love you. It is hard for me to part with you, but here is the order. It is true, Pan Sapieha, as a courteous man, leaves the order in my power and discretion. I might not show it to you. Well, it is as pleasant to me as if the hetman had broken my best sabre. I give you the order precisely because it is left to my discretion. And do your duty. To your health, my dear soldier. Vordiovsky bowed again to the castellan's knees, but he was so distressed that he could not utter a word. And when Charnitsky embraced him, tears ran in a stream over his yellow moustaches. I would rather die, cried he pitifully. I have grown accustomed to toil under you, revered leader, and there I know not how it will be. Pan Mihal, do not mind the order, cried Zagwaba with emotion. I will write to Sapu myself and rub his ears for him fittingly. But Pan Mihal first of all was a soldier, therefore he flew into a passion. But the old volunteer is ever sitting in you. You would better be silent when you know not the question. Service! That is it, said Charnyetsky. End of chapter 36 Recording by David Granville Young